Welcome to the mop up for April 14th, 2022. I'm David Feldman coming to you from an air shaft overlooking a parking garage somewhere in Manhattan where the temperature is 82 degrees and sunny. The White House is now denying that during a speech in Iowa earlier this week, President Biden was hit on the shoulder by bird poop. It only looked like bird poop, but it was in fact Joe Biden's latest approval ratings. It was bird poop. It looked like bird poop. Uh, or maybe his brain is starting to leak. I have a f- feeling that's what it looks like when his brain oozes. Just anyway, looked like bird poop to me. And he kept going. He had no idea he was getting shit on, kind of like all the Democrats who voted for him in 2020. The Republican National Committee voted unanimously Thursday to withdraw from the Commission on Presidential Debates, which means in 2024, the presidential debate stage will be completely empty. And by that, I mean Joe Biden will be standing there all alone. The Republicans are a cancer. Joe Biden is supposed to be the surgeon who removes the cancer. But instead, his hands are too shaky to handle the instruments. And people say I should feel sorry for him. Really, I'm supposed to feel sorry for the most powerful man in the world because he's not up to the job? How about next time the Democrats nominate someone who feels sorry for me? Isn't that the way this is supposed to work? I'm supposed to take it easy on the most powerful man in the world because he's weak? The man who allegedly shot at subway riders on a train in Brooklyn is being held without bail. Prosecutors told the judge that the suspect, Frank James, 62, terrified all of New York City. And by terrifying all of New York City, that means it costs three times as much to get an Uber that day. It was terrifying. Nobody wanted to ride the subways, so I was trying to get to Jersey, and it cost me three times as much, and that was terrifying. The Russian military is admitting today that Ukrainian soldiers badly damaged the Moskva, one of Russia's biggest ships sailing in the Black Sea. Crew members had to be abandoned. Crew members had to abandon the ship when the ship caught fire after getting hit with a missile. By the way, that's supposed to make us happy. That's the good news for today, that our weapons are working. The American people aren't, but our weapons are. Stephen Miller, President Donald Trump's immigration advisor, appeared Thursday before the Congressional Committee investigating the January 6th insurrection. Democrats said they wanted Stephen Miller to come up to the Capitol just to remind everyone what it smelled like when the insurgents stormed the Capitol and rubbed their own shit all over the place. 
Stephen Miller, if the word Nazi never existed, it would have to be invented just to define Stephen Miller's face. The head of the International Monetary Fund said today that war in Ukraine was a clear and present danger to the global economy and warned if war continues, inflation will skyrocket. The International Monetary Fund says inflation is hitting third world countries especially hard, noting that the IMF has gone from spending $5 million to $10 million bribing Latin American finance ministers. It's doubled the cost of a Latin American finance minister is now twice as much. That's what the IMF is spending these days on Latin American finance ministers. Eric Garcetti delivered his final State of the City speech, wrapping up two terms as mayor of Los Angeles. Garcetti, he's not sure where he's going to work or live. How about on the streets, like the rest of your constituents, you empty-headed poster child for blind ambition and greed? Garcetti asked President Joe Biden to make him UN ambassador to India because after eight years in Los Angeles, Garcetti wanted to live in a place with fewer people dying on the streets. That nomination is being held up in the Senate after the Senate realized that it was that Eric Garcetti Biden was talking about nominating. Marine Le Pen, the leader of France's national rally, formerly known as the National Front. Wait, the National Front changed its name to the National Rally? When did the National, national Front change their name? That sounds kind of Jewy to me, Marine Le Pen. You changed your name? Hmm. Marine Le Pen despises Jews, immigrants, Muslims. And so it being France, that means she will face French President Macron in a runoff election on April 24th. I just butchered Macron, kind of like Klaus Barbie, the butcher of Lyon, another French collaborationist. Anyway, current polling shows Marine Le Pen is behind Macron by only five percentage points. She could win because the French invented anti-Semitism and uh, they also invented the guillotine to chop off the heads of the ruling elite. Unfortunately, only one of those two is making a comeback and it's not <laughs> the guillotine chopping off the heads of the ruling elite. I miss that. In an interview today, Le Pen said she would quit NATO and seek some sort of detente with Vladimir Putin. Uh, Le Pen was also the recipient of a multi-million dollar loan from Putin in the lead up to her presidential campaign eight years ago. That will that will bring about detente with Russia when when Putin's giving you uh, couple million dollars. Many say the rise of Marine Le Pen in France is part of Putin's effort to secretly fund right-wing authoritarians in Europe who will break with NATO and challenge America's influence. It is believed that Putin was behind Brexit, as well as the election of both Orban in Hungary and Trump in America. Well, speaking of Trump, his social media account, Truth Social, that's run by former congressional lapdog Devin Nunes. Uh, Truth Social has been accused of falsifying the accounts of leading no news organizations, including Fox News. Truth Social is boasting a verified Fox News account on its platform. The only problem is Fox News insists it never signed up for Truth Social. This is so confusing. Liars telling lies about liars. Which liar are we supposed to believe? Fox News or Truth Social? Well, who would have ever guessed that a social media company run by Donald Trump, Devin Nunes, and Donald Trump Jr. would commit fraud? Elon Musk is no longer the largest shareholder of Twitter. It is now the mutual fund giant Vanguard, but that hasn't stopped Elon Musk from offering to purchase the social media giant for $54.20 a share. Musk reportedly picked $54.20 a share because it would have the number 420 in it, which is code for marijuana. 
I'm glad Musk is getting high because that's as high as Twitter is ever going to go. According to Carnegie Mellon, half of all tweets concerning COVID are bots. They are not real. They are not real. Twitter is not real. It's an illusion. Most of the followers, celebrities and news organizations are either paid for or bots. The celebrities and personalities you think have a huge following have either bought those followers or figured out how to create bots. Twitter is valuable when it comes to getting news headlines from reliable news sources, but it's also a dangerous cesspool of Russian misinformation that amplifies rumor and lies around the world in seconds, not to mention that steady stream of nonstop rape and death threats and those are just the rape and death threats coming from actor James Woods account. Speaking of Twitter and rape, I have a quick correction to make on Monday's show. I said Juanita Broderick, who accused Bill Clinton of rape, had her Twitter account permanently deleted because of her incessant attacks against the former president. I was wrong. She had her Twitter account deleted because she was spreading misinformation about COVID and the vaccine. So I was wrong. I made a mistake. My information was incorrect. I'm not sure Twitter should be deleting Juanita Broderick's account just because she's an anti-vaxxer. If you got raped by Bill Clinton, you wouldn't be too keen on strangers sticking things into you either. In a perfect world, people wouldn't care what Juanita Broderick had to say about vaccines. But one would think that when it comes to advice uh, on vaccines, uh, one would think that most people on Twitter would know enough to get their information from reliable sources like Joe Rogan or Jimmy Dore. Obviously, the idea of a reliable source is now up for grabs. That's because nobody trusts the experts. And why is that? Well, Big Pharma and the health insurance companies bought them all up. All the experts are now owned by Big Pharma and the health insurance companies. So experts in public policy and medicine can't really be trusted even when they're spreading the truth about vaccines. Vaccines do work. You can get COVID now and if you're vaccinated and boosted, it's not so bad. I mean, it's bad, but it's not gonna kill you most likely. So Twitter censoring misinformation, not a good idea. But what do you do about misinformation? What do you do about the Joe Rogans and the Jimmy Dores of this world who don't care about the truth and spread lies about ivermectin or Nazis taking over Ukraine? What do you do with them other than try to monetize them and make as much as you can? I understand the impulse to censor. I'm all for boycotting hate speech and misinformation. But in the end, the problem is in someone's Twitter account or Twitter or Facebook or Google. The problem is Americans don't get their news from reliable sources, so they look elsewhere. Nobody trusts CNN or MSNBC. They shouldn't. If you watch Jake Tapper or Joy Reid, they're trying to get us into World War III. They want us to initiate a no-fly no zone over Ukraine. You can't trust Fox for obvious reasons. You can't trust your local radio stations or your local news if you have any, because the viewers are customers. That's all we are now. And we're being told whatever it takes to keep our eyes glued to the screens. And that means telling us what we want to hear and only what we want to hear, what we want to see, what we want to read, because we are customers. We're being told what we want as opposed to what we need. So we're told what is familiar. Russia is bad. That's familiar. That's as old as the end of World War II. That's easy to convince us Russia is bad and war is good, crime is up, it, it's dangerous out there. 
That's familiar. That's a familiar song. It's dangerous out there. So stay indoors where it's safe and just keep watching the news. Just keep your face glued to the screens. Twitter, Facebook, and Google are just symptoms of a much larger problem. And that problem is Americans are being kept in the dark. We are not allowed. We are not allowed to know that Medicare for all will save billions of dollars and millions of lives. We are not allowed to know that inflation has nothing to do with Joe Biden's stimulus package. We are not allowed to know that America commits war crimes, just like Putin, and that America covers up those war crimes, just like Putin. We are not allowed to know that free tuition at all public universities is not only affordable it will increase our gross domestic product we are not allowed to know that the rich are not the job creators and most importantly we are not allowed to know that government is way more efficient than corporate america we're not allowed to know any of that so all our media is in the hands of five corporations, just like our government. And they determine what we read, what we watch, what we hear, and ultimately what we believe. But humans are naturally inquisitive. They want the truth. So when they are being denied the truth, we will seek it on our own. We will do our own research. But because this country has created generation after generation of shallow thinking illiterates, we believe the very first thing we stumble across. We are now susceptible to advertising. We believe the first thing that, sh that we see. No more critical thinking. The solution to misinformation is not Elon Musk buying Twitter. The solution to misinformation is more information. Twitter isn't the problem. Elon Musk is the problem because he's just another billionaire who doesn't pay taxes. And he'll bring about as much free speech to Twitter as he can until any of that speech challenges his neoliberal orthodoxy. The problem isn't Twitter. The problem is Elon Musk. The problem is Americans lacking critical thinking. They can't tell truth from lie anymore in America because our schools are shot and college is unaffordable. And if you can go to college, they're run, the colleges are run by servants of the oligarchs who punish critical thinking. Twitter is not the problem. Elon Musk is the problem. The problem is our news media. The problem is all our institutions have now become suspect because they are all run by bullshit artists like Elon Musk. The problem isn't that Americans don't trust the vaccine. They don't trust the people who made the vaccine. They don't trust the people who are telling them the vaccine is safe. I think most of us do trust. Well, I don't know. I don't know the numbers on this. I think most of us trust the vaccine. Uh, I don't think any of us trust Pfizer or Moderna. So censorship isn't the solution. The solution is breaking up these monopolies, taxing the billionaires out of existence like Elon Musk, just tax him out of existence and turn this country over to honest people who care more about doing good than doing well. Well, in sad news, Gilbert Gottfried was canceled this week at the age of 67. Just like Gilbert's jokes, his death was way too soon. That was given to me by Bernie Ho Baby Cat. That way too soon joke. Gilbert would have loved that. Uh, comedy clubs across America dim their lights on news of Gilbert's death while the mayor of the Japanese city of Fukushima issued a statement that read, adios, motherfucker. 
Doctors declared Gilbert dead when they noticed his eyes were suddenly wide open. Gilbert's family says they're planning to reveal his last words just as soon as he's finished saying them. In lieu of flowers, Gilbert's family asks that you dig up his grave and sodomize him. Right now, Gilbert's up in heaving, sitting next to Bob Saget and Norm MacDonald, making fun of Ryan White. Although Gilbert had been very sick, he worked tirelessly right up until the end, charging Saudi Arabian businessmen $50 an hour to use his asshole as a soup terrain. Gilbert was 67. When he died, he left behind a wife, a sister, and a trail of shit, piss, and other assorted bodily fluids on his bedsheet. The good news is Gilbert did have a life insurance policy. The bad news is it was with Affleck. Gilbert Gottfried was born on Coney Island to Dr. Joseph Mengele's sister, Sadie Mengele, who escaped to America after World War II, posing as a Jewish refugee. Gilbert's dad was a renowned conceptual artist in the tradition of Christo, but instead of wrapping buildings in cloth, Gilbert's dad would travel America holding a can of spray paint covering synagogues with swastikas. Kind of like Christo. Well, all these great comics are passing away. Louis Anderson, Norm, Saget, and now Gilbert. I'm telling you, once Gallagher 2 chokes to death on a chicken wing, my phone is going to start ringing again. I can feel it just through attrition. They're, they're running out of comics. Well, we're going to miss you, Gilbert Gottfried. Mass shootings in the subway just aren't going to be the same anymore. <laughs> anymore without Gilbert Gottfried. We had a mass shooting in the New York City subway on Tuesday, the same day Gilbert died, and it just wasn't fun without Gilbert. It just felt like a mass shooting. Earthquakes, tornadoes, and terrorist attacks will never be fun anymore without Gilbert. It's depressing. Right now, ISIS is thinking, sure, we could behead a Jewish reporter from the Wall Street Journal, but what's the point? At the end of today's podcast, we will be joined by former President Donald Trump, who will remember his time working with Gilbert on Celebrity Apprentice season 14. So you'll want to stay tuned to the end of the show when President Donald Trump remembers the life and times of comedy giant Gilbert Gottfried. I loved Gilbert Gottfried. Uh, That's a true story. Uh, I'm not making this up. One night, I went to see Gilbert live at Caroline's, and I learned where the term, he made me shit my pants, come from. This is true. Uh, Gilbert was playing to a packed audience, and it was his crowd. He was killing. But there was a table of tourists in the front who had no idea who Gilbert was. If you've never seen Gilbert live, he liked to sprinkle a, a few jokes. He would sprinkle a few jokes about child molesters into his act. Uh, because child molestation is funny. Anything that is horrible is funny. And if you honestly don't laugh at a well-crafted child molester joke, then you're a child molester. Uh, There's a time and a place for child molester jokes, and that time and place is Gilbert Gottfried performing at Caroline's or wherever. Gilbert making child molester jokes is uh, as close to heaven on earth as one can get. Uh, especially when a table of tourists is offended by those child molester jokes, especially when Gilbert sees that they're offended, but pretends that they're not offended. He (laughs) he pretended they, he thought they didn't understand what child molestation is because (laughs) they're not from New York. So he, politely try to explain what child molestation was in graphic detail to the tourists who are not, you know, savvy. And I laughed really hard, uncontrollably hard, with abandoned. 
Gilbert owned my entire body. I was laughing loud and hard and every orifice in my body opened. And I realized I came this close to shitting my pants. I went, wow, that's what it means when you just lose complete control and laugh so hard, you almost shit your pants. I have never laughed so hard. And it was that night, five years ago, watching Gilbert Gottfried at Caroline's, spending 10 minutes explaining the concept of child molestation, <laughs> child molestation to a table of angry tourists. Uh, and I realized then why they say a comet almost made you shit your pants. So, uh, you know, I wasn't close to Gilbert. Uh, whenever I saw him, I would just run up to him and play. And uh, there are so many Gilbert Gottfried stories. Everybody loved Gilbert so many. Again, I was not a close friend. I just loved Gilbert Gottfried like everybody does. Uh, I'm a Gilbert Gottfried fan and i'm not going to pretend he was something more to me than just a, a comedy hero i mean i loved him before i got to meet him he was pure he is pure comedy i believe the term in chemistry is unalloyed unalloyed I'm unalloyed that's the word no impurities just pure just no impurities he's just comedy gut punches and uh, we all love gilbert you cannot cancel funny. He was blacklisted from the Emmys for a masturbation joke he told in the early 90s. Blacklisted. They said never again. Uh, he was fired from his job as the Aflac duck for mocking the dead after the nuclear meltdown in Fukushima. He did 9-11 jokes on Comedy Central, I think, I think on September 12th. I think I think he was doing 9-11 jokes before the second tower came down. He was blacklisted, fired by Affleck, but you cannot cancel funny. You cannot cancel funny. Gilbert didn't care. And you know what? Nobody really cared if he offended anybody. Gilbert kept working because you cannot cancel funny. So uh, I'm blessed to uh, have met him a couple of times. He did the show. I think we're playing a clip uh, of him on this show. I opened for him a couple of times. And, uh, you know, that's I'm very grateful that uh, very grateful that I got to spend a little time with uh, with Gilbert. Um, so <clears throat> we're losing a lot of friends, not just the comics. I mean, we are, we're losing Louis Anderson, Norm, Saget, Gilbert. And, uh, this is rough because these guys, relatively speaking, are, are quite young and, uh, they were all great. They are great. And in the past two years, we've lost 1 million Americans to COVID. There's been a lot of excess death. And you turn on the TV and you see all the death and tragedy in Ukraine and you begin to think about all the death and destruction this country has been responsible for overseas during its 20 year war on global global terror. According to Brown University, uh, America has killed upwards of 400,000 innocent civilians in the past 20 years. I'll be a broken record about that. That's Brown University. We've uh, our global war on terror, we've killed upwards of 400,000 innocent civilians. Money for bombs, but no money, can't afford universal health care in this country, but we got money for bombs. We've grown accustomed to the 54,000 Americans killed each year by guns. And then there are the hundreds of thousands who die each year from medical malpractice, which according to CNBC, as well as several guests on this show, medical malpractice is the third leading cause of death in America. The third leading cause of death in America is 
medicine. <laughs> and you wonder why people are anti-vax. The third leading cause of death in America is medical malpractice. Uh, and don't forget the hundreds of thousands of Americans who die because they're underinsured. We're surrounded by a lot of death in America. We have one of the highest infant mortality rates in the industrialized world. One quarter of our children are underfed. Uh, this used to be a country that denied the existence of death. I kind of like that. I liked that America denied death. We fancied ourselves a young country as long as we ignored the first peoples. We're not a young country, but our government is young and stupid. Uh, and this system denied death. The first peoples didn't, but our system, the, the white European, denies death and the deaths of others here. Uh, our system trained generation after generation to deny the existence of death. Uh, you're not allowed to see it. It's nightly, you know, it's packaged, kind of like buying chicken at the supermarket. It's just, you know, wrapped in cellophane and you're, you just see the breasts. You don't see the beak or the face or the feathers or the blood. Because in America, we focus on, on life. That's what we're told. We focus on youth and ignore death and ignore the old. We don't want to see the old. We don't want to think about the old. And we certainly don't want to think about our own death. And I like that about America. I did. I liked the denial of death here in America. So I began to realize that there is a system of control in place designed to make us deny our death, to make us ignore our aging. It's designed to distract us from the inevitability of death and, if you're lucky enough, old age. There are systems of control in place that forbid you from pondering your own mortality. Because if you don't ponder your own mortality, you're less likely to demand better health care or free health care. You're less likely to demand better treatment in nursing homes. It's why people in nursing homes here in New York who, who work in nursing homes make $12 an hour. The people who do the most important work in a person's life make $12 an hour. But Elon Musk has a couple billion dollars for Twitter. But the people who wipe your grandmother's ass, $12 an hour. Well, we got to start thinking about this because we've been infantilized. We were trained never to think about our own demise. And that has made us susceptible to doctors, nursing home directors, hospital administrators, health insurance executives, politicians, big pharma, and lawyers who all want to take advantage of this naivete that's kind of been forced on us. But we're waking up. We've had one million excess deaths since COVID. And uh, we're waking up. And we're at a crossroads. Where are we going to go with our acceptance of death? Are we going to stop denying death when it's undeniable? And if we do, do we celebrate death? Do we turn this country into an apocalyptic death cult like the Republicans who celebrate death the same way Joseph Goebbels trained the Nazis to celebrate death? Or do we fight it off by taking care of each other and the elderly? Uh, it's bad in this country. Since COVID here in America, our life expectancy is heading down, while the rest of the industrialized world, their, their life expectancy is heading back up. In America, the, the richest 1%, the billionaire class, the people who don't pay taxes, they do not want us thinking about death. 
It's kind of why funeral directors can charge whatever they want. Have you ever tried to negotiate with a funeral director? I did it three years ago and it was, he was amazing. I said, why is this so expensive? He said, well, you want it done by some guy in a garage? <laughs> That's what he said to me. He said, you could pay less, but it'll probably be some guy doing it in a garage. Uh, yeah, they don't want us to think about it. So we're Americans, we're at a very dangerous crossroads right now. Uh, we can't deny death anymore. The question is, are we going to celebrate it? That's one way to go. The, that's what the Republicans offer, a celebration of death, the promise of a better life on the other side. So you don't need free health care, get some guns and just eat yourself into oblivion. Soon you'll be on the other side. That's what Joseph Goebbels trained the Nazis to think. Go fight on the Eastern Front. You're dying for a good cause. You're dying for the, the motherland. And the Republicans are training their devotees. Die, die. Jesus is waiting for you on the other side. That's one way to uh, recognize death. Another way is to uh, put it off, to make Americans eat better, get the shit out of uh, our diet, and provide free health care to everyone, and try to keep people living as long as possible with free mental health care so they don't commit suicide. Uh, other, other wealthy countries know this. They don't deny the existence of death and they provide for their elderly. They don't banish the old. In America, getting old is a crime. You're not allowed. You're not allowed to be in movies, go on television after a certain age, especially if you're a woman, nobody wants to see you. There are those rare exceptions, but for the most part, when you get to be 45, uh, they start considering you on your way out. You know, you got 15 years left if you're lucky because they tell us they need, you know, the old people need to go away and make room for the younger folk. And by the time you're 60 or 70, if you haven't saved up enough money, good luck finding a decent paying job because nobody wants to be around old people. But uh, when you banish old people, you banish their wisdom. Something uh, America is uh, sorely in need of, wisdom. But that's what the, the ruling elite wants. They don't want wisdom. They want us stupid. The last thing the people in charge want is someone who knows better. Someone who knows better knows that a job, a company billing a client for 16 hours for a job, uh, it really only takes two hours to do that job, right? If you know what you're doing, it's a two hour job, not a 16 hour job, if you know what you're doing. So why would a company hire someone who knows what they're doing? Someone who knows what they're doing is gonna bring in fewer billable hours. America chews up its workers and spits them out. You're hired for what you don't know. You're hired for your naivete. Because as David Graeber, the late David Graeber said and wrote in his book, Bullshit, most jobs are bullshit. Corporate America doesn't want someone who knows what they're doing because someone who knows what they're doing also knows what his boss and the corporation is doing. Nothing. They do nothing. Think about your job. Think about what you do. It's bullshit, at least 90% of it. It's a scam. Most jobs are bullshit. Most of what you do, even if you're a doctor, most of the tests you run are bullshit. That's our system.
we've all been alienated from the the final product and uh we've become not just easily replaceable we've gone from easily replaceable to redundant we're unnecessary most of us most of what we do most of the work we do is unnecessary that's the problem with letting us work from home we all began to realize that our jobs are bullshit that we could do our tasks in one hour instead of nine hours a day that's what COVID has taught us all our jobs our bosses and the things we produce are bullshit they're unnecessary when you do work in an office uh, there are very few people who are allowed to shine at their job because shining at your job shines a light on all the people who don't shine at their job especially the people in charge the administrators who do nothing other than extinguish everybody's light so you don't shine that's the whole system hire overpaid administrators to put out everybody's pilot light just you know put put uh the nobody home look in everybody's eyes and just have zombies working underneath the administrator don't be too good at your job it makes the rest of us look bad you know this is true you know this is true anyone who has ever worked for a corporation knows the secret to survival is keeping your head down and not getting noticed you I would have, there were many jobs that I could have kept if I didn't try to get noticed you get noticed for your good work one month the next month they will find a million things you did wrong how many times have I been praised for my work only to find out next month I'm a piece of shit I haven't changed the systems of control get into place to make me go from feeling worthy to making me feel like shit the systems of control build you up and then knock you down because in the end the people you work for want you at a two at a two not a 10 they want you at a two and if you drop to a one they'll build you up they'll build you up but only to a two I uh, if you're stupid enough to work hard and think they want you working at a 10 they will knock you back down to a one and help you find your way back up to where they want you at a two and you will stay at that job if you stay at a two and most of us because our health care is tied to this we stay at a two we give up we phone it in we do what we're told they want us at a two you got a two they want everyone working at a two because that way you're no threat to the scam that is corporate America and that's that's the truth if you're willing to play ball uh you can succeed in corporate America but only give them a two so we're, we're at a crossroads uh in America we can no longer deny the existence of death as I said we've had one million excess deaths because of COVID and what are we going to do we're at a crossroads do do we celebrate death and end up like the Republican Party and the Nazis who yearn for a sweet death or do we remain children of the Enlightenment and science and try to prolong life keep people alive with dignity uh, as long as possible I choose the latter this this country uh, needs to provide free health care to everyone the elderly and of course that means providing for the people who take care of the elderly I'm not talking about the doctors I'm not talking about the hospital administrators I'm talking about the people who get twelve dollars an hour to empty bedpans uh 
emptying your father's bedpan uh that's worth a lot more to me than twitter we have what does he have 54 billion dollars to buy twitter you know uh i can live without twitter you know i'm gonna miss uh some of my friends and relatives uh who uh, aren't being taken care of properly sometimes when they're in the wrong nursing homes uh nations in decay like america nazi germany nations in decay go from denying death to celebrating it and uh we're almost there you know the, the republican party is an apocalyptic death cult they want to die and they want us to die they just do they don't wear masks they don't believe in vaccines they want concealed carry they they are they eat like they want to die and they look like they want to die that's who the republicans are i don't celebrate death but i also believe it's time for this country to stop denying it because if we keep denying it the people who celebrate it are going to kill us all you're listening to the David Feldman show davidfeldmanshow.com we will be back with the brilliant Grace Jackson does Medicare spend hundreds of millions of dollars on television advertisements like private insurance does? No. Does Medicare spend millions of dollars on stock buybacks to shareholders? No. Does Medicare spend money on marketing? Private insurance likes to put its name on stadiums and PGA tournaments. Is there a Medicare arena? No. Does Medicare spend $23 million on executive pay like private insurance companies do? No. Research shows that Medicare spends 1.1% on administrative costs. We spend $4 trillion on healthcare every year. We could save $200 billion on administrative costs with Medicare for all. All that video of dead children and dead women in Ukraine and no time to show that clip of Katie Porter. It's Hunter Biden's laptop. If they don't want us to see something, we don't see it. Walking 13 miles on every shift with not a chair in sight. Lifting 20,000 pounds a day, that don't seem right. Saving plastic bottles to have a place to pee. Injuries in this place are the highest in the industry. Don't believe those TV ads, things ain't what they seem. Don't tell me this sweatshop has become the American. American dream, we need to stand together. Can't do it on our own, we need to stand together and make our presence known. We need to stand together. Get the union done, we need to stand together. What side are you on? One million strong, working two shifts a day. Packing all day long while the cameras are running away. 100,000 trucks tearing up and down the roads. Delivering stuff all over the world in 40 ton loads. When did this sweatshop become the American dream? Don't believe those TV ads, things ain't what they seem. We need to stand together. Can't do it on our own. We need to stand together and make our presence known. We need to stand together and get the union done. We need to stand together. What side are you on? Thank you. 
Can't call your mates, can't listen to music, gotta pack all those crates. Start to feel like a robot, but soon you understand there's more of them than you. That's always been the plan. Do not believe those TV ads, things ain't what they seem. And don't try to tell me this sweatshop will become the American dream. We got to stand together. We can't do it on our own. Stand together. We need the UAW, the AFL, CIO. We got to stand together. We can't do it on our own. We got to stand together. We need the American postal workers and the farm workers. We need the stand together. Teamsters and the RWDSU. We need everybody. Stand Call together. the phone. Get on the phone. Call your neighbors. We need to stand together. Yeah, yeah. We need to stand together. That's what I'm talking about. We need to stand together. Start of the civil rights movement, David, giving basketball to the blacks. Okay, I'm not really sure that's true. Mr. I gave Fred. them basketball and rap. You rap. Are you familiar with Sugar Hill, David? The Sugar Hill people, the gang, the Sugar Hill gang. Of course, Angle, Anglewood, New Jersey, the Sugar Hill gang invented rap. David, not even close, David. I invented rap. I gave the blacks basketball and I didn't just give them rap. I invented it, David. You invented rap. The freestyle stuff, you know. David, Wonder you Mike, Master G, Big Bank, Hank, they used to do work for my father and they saw me sitting in the office and there was a nephew on my mom's side who worked for us and he, he was slow, David. Hmm. Can you say that word now, slow? I think you can say slow. Well, yeah. let's just say he had a bad stutter and a stammer. He had a stutter and a stammer. You couldn't mm -hmm. understand what the hell he was saying. His name was Lonnie. So naturally, I called him Lilani because he had a stutter. So instead of calling him Lonnie like boring people would, I called him Lilani. It's a nickname, David. Okay, I don't understand what this has to do with you inventing I rap. I gave rap to the blacks, David. Okay, you told me that. I, I don't invented understand. rap, David, and I gave it to the blacks. I'd go, l -l 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 Lanny, and the blacks started making records. Go back and forth, one by one, two by two. I mean, scratch. Back and forth, they would go, wicka, 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 wicka. Scratching, yes. We used to scratching. call it, he's scratching. We used to call it Lillanying. Then the white man, the white man didn't like that, David. He made it his own and he changed it to scratching. But believe me, David, it was Lillanying. And it made my father smile, David. It Aww. made my father smile. My father rarely smiled. Great man, hmm. but I made him smile. I was the only one who could make my father smile by making fun of his wife's stuttering nephew, Lonnie. And that's how I invented rap, making fun of a stuttering and stammering nephew of my wife. Of your mother, a little Freudian slip there. Of my mother, sorry. A Freudian, yeah. yeah, same thing, same thing. Yeah. You know, <laughs> wife, mother, daughter, all the same. Yes, I invented rap, David. I invented rap. I gave it to the blacks. Hey, 
chairs in this Bessemer shop. Back in our day, don't ever seem to stop. The man went down cause his heart gave out. Get back to work, we heard them shout. They said the EMTs are common, that's what they're for. And life slipped away on a cement floor. I know the bookstores are all gone away Got me some books, I'll read them someday Right now I got to make my raid and all these extra shifts If I can make it to Christmas Eve The kids will have nice gifts And the big boss will have more money So he can go up into space But there still won't be no chairs In this Bessemer place Last year we had a meeting and they made us go They gave us all pins that said, vote no But maybe this year Union can give us a little more And put some chairs on this Bessemore floor I'm hoping the Union might make things right some days I just don't have the strength to fight. This plant down here can take its toll. It'll break your body. It'll crush your soul. Feels like this packing ain't never gonna stop. And there still ain't no chairs in this Bessemer shop. Welcome back. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Don't forget office hours every Friday night at 8 p.m. Join us for that. Go to my website to uh, sign up for office hours. Thank you to Professor Mike Steinel, the genius, Mike Steinel, and of course, Robert Smigel as Donald Trump. I hear that Donald Trump will be joining us a little later on to celebrate the life and times of Gilbert Gottfried, who was on Apprentice, I think it was season 14. I think it was season 14. I will take calls from the Zoom room if anybody wants to talk. Let's go over to YouTube and see what they're saying. We have a YouTube chat room that's kind of uh, vociferous. Let's see what they're saying. Uh, any questions? I will answer any questions in the YouTube chat room. Uh, okay, what are they asking here? Uh, okay, nothing. They're talking about Bill Pullman. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any questions in the Zoom chat room? Okay. Nobody wants to talk to me tonight. That's okay. That's the way this day is uh, shaping up. 
Well, here's somebody who does want to talk to me. Grace Jackson. Hello, Grace Jackson. It's good to see you. Hi, David. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Grace yeah. Jackson joins us. She is the co-host of Literary Hangover, as well as an expert on China. I know you don't like being introduced as an expert on China, but you know more about China than everybody else who watches and or listens to this show. Oh, Maybe. I don't know about that. I don't know about that, but I try. Is that Astrid? No, Astrid is downstairs. Um, she can't be trusted up here. So she's downstairs on her bed. And I've been reading about China, predictably, um, and in particular, what's going on with COVID in China. There is a lot going on with COVID in China, it turns out. The Omicron variant has been spreading, and I'm sure people are familiar with the fact that Shanghai has been in lockdown for several weeks, uh, a sort of rolling lockdown, a partial lockdown. Um, but the past couple of days, the news from Shanghai has been somewhat bleak. Um, and if, like me, you kind of uh, regularly look at Chinese social media, so I usually look at WeChat and Weibo, which are kind of like, um, WeChat is a kind of super app. It combines all the functions of Facebook and WhatsApp and to an extent Twitter in one. So it's, the, it's a very ubiquitous app in China. Uh, and Weibo is China's Twitter. Last night, there was a bit of a, um, there was a sort of big night for, for Chinese social media in that a number of hashtags and uh, kind of articles that were critical of the government's handling of the COVID pandemic in Shanghai in particular went viral. And this is remarkable because, well, uh, it's quite hard to get things past the censors on Chinese social media. But also my uh, timeline on WeChat, the people I follow, the friends um, and so on, people I've met over the years, my timeline is very depoliticized. <clears throat> you very rarely see people speaking up, uh, especially in the past few years. But this morning I woke up and there were a lot of people who had posted this article that was a kind of crowdsourced account of deaths that the government has not reported. So officially only two people have died in this most recent outbreak. Uh, there are 27,000, 28,000 cases of COVID that have been reported officially in, in Shanghai, but only two deaths so far. And this article, We're talking <coughs> about excuse me. Like almost 400 million Chinese who are being forced into lockdown right now, right? Yeah, so across the country, there are almost 400 million people in lockdown in China across 45 cities. But within Shanghai, obviously, that's a smaller percentage of that. I don't have the exact figure, but Shanghai is, is China's most populous city, so it's huge. Mm -hmm. um, but only two deaths have been reported. Anyway, this article that somebody had written and had lots of comments attached to it from people saying, oh, my grandmother died. Oh, my uncle died. Oh, my child died. Um, so it seems that there is, I, I mean, it, I think it's safe to say there's some undercounting and underreporting going on. Uh, that's not to say that everybody's dying of COVID. Some people are dying perhaps because they can't get access to medicines or treatments, regular treatments that they need um, to stay alive. So it's, it's heating up a little bit and there have also been some videos circulating of uh, protests and sort of people getting into scuffles with the police and then being taken away. Um, the quarantine policy is very strict. If you catch COVID in Shanghai, you are taken to a makeshift hospital and the conditions in some of these makeshift ho hospitals seem um, to leave something to be desired. So it's it's interesting, there's just a lot more uh, grievances being aired than usual, I would say. Yeah, 
Yeah. And people are starving in Shanghai, that food isn't being delivered. I think it's patchy. I think there's, uh, there are some parts of Shanghai that seem to be getting pretty regular deliveries of food from the government. Other parts seem to be going, going hungry. Um, and there have been, it, it seems to have basically been quite uneven. There's a lot of unofficial, uh, again, on social media, people getting together to try and order food in bulk. And obviously the prices go up and up and up for food when things start to get um, people experience shortages. And so, yeah, there's a lot of uneven distribution of resources right now. Um, that said, the government is uh, absolutely bent on not wavering with its zero COVID approach. Um, in fact, yesterday or, or a couple of days ago, Xi Jinping uh, visited Hainan Island, which is an island off the south coast of China near Vietnam, and he made a speech. And I'm just going to read a little portion of the speech uh, because it concerns the, the zero COVID approach. And this was translated by an excellent um, China analyst called Bill Bishop, who has a newsletter called Sinocism, which I recommend to everybody. And this translation, uh, yeah, it's, so Xi Jinping said, persistence is victory, adhere to people above all else, life above all else, adhere to the prevention of imported cases, a rebound of domestic cases, adhere to scientific precision, dynamic zero COVID. Uh, we need to overcome paralysis, war weariness, the get lucky mentality and complacency. So he's not wavering, he's not budging. Um, and this is sort of, this has the look of a, of a political campaign at this point. It's sort of a, a mass mobilization. And of course, China has a, a long um, history with mass politics and Xi Jinping's um, you know, predecessor Mao Zedong having a very highly personalized form of power. We know that Xi Jinping is a great student of Mao and that he, he is in many ways kind of stepping into those shoes in terms of mass mobilization at this point. But it's, it still remains to be seen how much the population are willing to accept. What is going on with the Biden administration's posture towards China? Janet Yellen, who's the Secretary of Treasury, uh, used to be Federal Reserve, is threatening China to stop helping Russia in the war in Ukraine or you'll lose standing in the world. The CIA director, I think his name is Burns, is yeah. now calling China a silent partner in Putin's aggression in Ukraine. There seems to be a concerted effort on the Biden administration's part to lump China in with Putin and uh, provocatively. It seems like we're, we're provoking China. Mm. Yeah, it does. And in fact, I believe that there is a national security strategy speech that's about to be delivered by Blinken. And I think it's overdue. It's something that happens on a regular basis um, or every couple of years. But basically, uh, at some point in the near future, Anthony Blinken is going to give a speech in which it is expected that he's going to lay out the sort of Biden approach to China. And it's probably going to be um, antagonistic, just as you said. And it's obviously going to reference China's relationship with Russia. Um, and I agree. I think that the US is not giving China much of an out in this relationship. And I think the fact that there is such a deep and entrenched bipartisan anti-China consensus right now is leaving China with very few options in terms of what it can do to maneuver between Russia and the US. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, today, uh, a delegation of lawmakers from um, the Senate and Congress have landed in Taiwan. 
Taiwan is the lucky recipient of a visit from Lindsey Graham and Bob Menendez. So it's a bipartisan group, uh, pretty high profile, I would say. And they're going to Taiwan to meet with the president, Tsai Ing-wen, in a couple of days. And there's been some photos of them on the tarmac in Taipei. And so I think that that, again, that provides a kind of context for this. China's obviously already issued a a statement expressing its displeasure at this visit. Um, Luckily, Nancy Pelosi didn't go to Taiwan. I think she got COVID instead, but she was threatening to go to Taiwan. There were some noises about that. And I think if she had gone, we would have seen an even stronger statement um, from China. But yeah, I think there's a lot of antagonism happening right now. And I I, I, I think that the US on that side, they are... They're aware that the longer this war goes on and the worse Russia looks, the weaker China gets rhetorically in this position. The fact is this war is not, it doesn't seem to be going well for Russia. And China is probably squirming because I don't think China expected this to be a protracted conflict. I think they thought it would be short, sharp, and then back to normal, some kind of status quo. It doesn't look like anyone is going to kind of emerge from this conflict looking good, especially China. China. It's forming because it means that NATO and America look better. Yeah, that. And it also makes their, if you can say it's their side in this, it makes their side look weak. Um, And... Yeah, exactly. In relation to that, NATO and the US are going to come out more unified, uh, much more popular than before. I think. So I, I don't. I, we talked about this last week. Why does there have to be a side? I don't understand it. Could we, you know, could we just try to get into the head of the people who are in charge? Uh, why do they think there has to be a side? They're the obvious reasons the military industrial complex needs a war. I mean, I don't want to poo poo that. That is, you know, <laughs> significant that they need an enemy. I mean, I, I need an enemy. I wake up every morning feeling lousy. I go to the internet. Who do I hate today? Who, you know, I, I understand needing an enemy. I don't want to deal with my own imperfections. I rather lash out at the world. So I understand that. But what else, what, other than the war profiteers, why do we, why can't we all be on the same side? Well, I, I think for that, you have to look at history and start to think about what great power politics really kind of mean um I think you know I've heard people reference the fact that for example early on in the 2000s Vladimir Putin actually wanted to join NATO and he was rebuffed um and NATO has continued to expand despite the fact that in fact the head of the CIA Mr Burns I think he released there was a cable in the WikiLeaks that Uh, somebody dug out and it turns out that way back during the Obama administration, he was acutely aware of how inflammatory and incendiary it would be for NATO to expand onto Russia's border. So there's, there's a lot of, of kind of precedent for this. Um, And, you know, China, Russia, the U S have historically been in competition Um, not only, you know, in terms of their political systems clashing, this whole autocracy versus democracy axis that we're being, we're being talked uh, to about all the time now, but also in terms of resources um, and the sort of strategic concerns. So I think it has, it has a long history that we could get into. Yeah. We're fighting the wrong battle there's climate change that has to be addressed it feels like we're fighting a 20th century war over oil once again right this seems to be 
whose oil are you going to buy, ours or Putin's? Yeah, there is there is definitely a sense in which this feels like this this conflict feels like a throwback. You know, it has um, it has echoes of like nineteenth century great game type politics. It doesn't feel like a you know a quote unquote smart war or the kind of like modern sophisticated warfare that we've come to expect, whatever that looks like either. Um, yeah what do you what do you see i have such moral certitude about the biden administration trying to gin up a war in ukraine to distract from his failures domestically and the need to feather the nests of all the war profiteers who put him in office i have no doubt about that i know it's hackneyed it's shop worn to blame the military industrial complex but i i can't see anything other than a need for america to flex its muscle and so people buy our weapons am i missing something do, you know you're in great britain what, what do you see america doing well, I'm not sure about what I see America doing, but I can tell you that our political scene, um, it in many ways mirrors the US's. And what happened the past week was very interesting because so for several months now, Boris Johnson, our prime minister, has been under investigation for having parties during the COVID lockdowns. Um, he had more than one party and his cabinet members all came along, Rishi Sunak being one, he's the treasurer or um, in, charge of, in charge of the money and also has a lot of money. Uh, I think he's the most wealthy man that's ever sat in parliament, uh, Rishi Sunak. Anyway, they had lots of parties during lockdown and, and this week they were all issued with fines by the police for these parties. But last week, Boris Johnson made a surprise unannounced visit to Kiev and got some great pictures with Zelensky. No flap jacket? <laughs> no, just his, just his standard ill-fitting suit right? Um, with a scowl on his face. And Zelensky looks really, you know, super cool next to him. I mean, Boris couldn't look worse. There's a great picture of Zelensky pointing at something in the middle distance and Boris stood next to him gazing um and this and you know this is just another way in which this war is being weaponized and boris johnson can basically come back from kiev and say well um there's nothing to see here in fact there's a war on don't you know so we've got better things to talk about than the silly parties i had during lockdown and actually you know he should really resign he should have resigned long a long time ago but if this war weren't going on, maybe he would have had to resign. I don't know. But there's been the same thing in the UK government and the UK parliament. You know, there's complete consensus on the need to arm the Ukrainians. Uh, there was a debate in parliament uh, about five weeks ago towards the beginning of the war where every single party, ev the leader of every single party in the parliament stood up and said, Slava Ukraini, I'm Ukrainian. And um, there was just no, there was no scrutiny. There was no critical kind of analysis. There was no questions asked at all about this. And it, I find it very, very disturbing. There's a, there's a complete consensus. And it reminds me, I mean, actually in the late lead up to the Iraq war, I think there was a lot more uh, opposition and a lot more vocal opposition but then this is this is a very complicated situation. I, I don't want to sound like I have moral certainty about this either. Right. What what is the complication? Is Putin Hitler? I don't think so. I don't think Putin is Hitler. I'm not seeing I'm seeing him attacking hospitals and I'm seeing civilians being destroyed the same way I saw them being destroyed in Syria. Uh, that seems to be how war goes these days. I'm not discounting 
what's going on. But war is now the killing of innocent women and children. America's killed close to 400,000 civilians since we began our global war on terror. That's what war is. So it seems to me you do everything to prevent it. If, if Putin's Hitler, then we're Hitler. I, I just don't see how we're, we're feigning indignation and clutching our pearls. This is what war is. It's no longer soldiers standing opposite one another in a field and obeying the Marquis de Queensbury rules of whatever they did back then and boxed. I mean, I, I think it's killing lots of people and destroying a lot of real estate. Why are we pretending that this is uh, some kind of new warfare? Mm. Well, I think because it is war is all of those things. But today, war is also about information. And I suppose it always has been. But this is the way in which we, you and I are experiencing this war is as an information war. And we are being completely bombarded and saturated with um, pro-Ukrainian information. And I'm not, again, I'm not, I, I hate this war. Um, I'm against this war. But I think the fact that there is just compl- uh, just a complete wall of <laughs> information with not even a crack of, of opposition or just critical thinking or questions being asked is really disturbing. Um, I was given a note. I got an email from one of the platforms that distributes this little podcast saying that you are not allowed to say that war crimes are not being committed in Ukraine. That you cannot not allowed to cannot say challenge that. the idea that there have been atrocities committed in Ukraine. I don't want to. I want to keep my I don't want to get shut down. I know that's somewhat cowardly, but uh, and I happen to believe that there are war crimes being committed in yeah. Ukraine. I also happen to believe that America commits war crimes. But it seems to me chilling speech is a lot easier and more dangerous than providing spending the money on more reporters, more media, more truth. Uh, so it's, it's an information war. You're absolutely right. Christopher Hedges, the brilliant Pulitzer Prize winning journalist from the New York Times, had his videos taken down by YouTube. They had nothing to do with Russia mm. he, on RT. YouTube uses it as an excuse to just shut down all his documentaries about war and yeah the same thing happened to uh Abby Martin who's been doing this for years all of her content was removed by YouTube overnight one a few weeks ago it's shocking shocking and scary because yeah it's really scary and you know what it comes it does come full circle to what i began this conversation talking about which was chinese social media and i'm not here to say that you know it's the same the same censorship in america as it is in china it's on a completely different scale um but it is happening i mean people are being censored and people are being shut down and it sucks yeah I completely agree. And I wish there was more room just to, you know, not even to kind of um, bash people over the head with how they've got this wrong, but just to have these sort of gentle, nuanced discussions about what's happening um, and who Vladimir Putin is and who he isn't, because that is important. Yeah, they want to demonize not just... Putin, but they want to demonize the Russian people so that if our weapons are dropped on them, we will be okay with it. They, they, had, they were very good at demonizing the, uh, the Iraqi leadership and to some degree the Iraqi people so that we were okay because of racism. Mo- you know, too many Americans are okay with saying people of color. Uh, 
Well, it's the same strategy that Putin's using, you know, when he talks about denazifying Ukraine, that somehow we're supposed to believe that Ukraine is absolutely full of Nazis that, and they need to be cleansed. Uh, you know, he's going to go in and cleanse them. Um, it's the same rhetorical strategy of dehumanization, and it's really dangerous. I agree. The dehumanization. All right, this was this was <laughs> interesting. Thank you, Thanks, uh, Jackson. Thank you. Uh, I I don't mean to embarrass you, but somebody misspelled your name. I just oh. noticed. Uh oh, that would be me. Oh, why does it always come up without an S? That wow. happened to me last week as well. My name. <laughs> I, I can't spell my own name. You don't apparently. want to say. Uh, you you have to tune in to YouTube to see how poorly it was misspelled. Uh, uh, I blame. Yeah. I what blame are you reading for pleasure? What are you reading before you go? You're you're the host of Literary Hangover. What are you reading for pleasure? That's a good question. Um, well, I recently read a book of essays by uh, Pankaj Mishra, who is, uh, I think, a British Indian academic who's written for New York Review of Books and London Review of Books. And he's sort of on the left and he's a great critic of neoliberalism and kind of liberal internationalism. So he wrote a book of essays. They've all appeared in newspapers before, but it's called Bland Fanatics. And it's well worth a read. He has a great essay about Woodrow Wilson and the birth of liberal internationalism, um, the 14 points. And he also has some interesting insights into Jordan Peterson, which <laughs> made me laugh. He talks right. about Jordan Peterson and uh, mystic, mystical fascism or something, or fascist mysticism. <laughs> it's fun. To be continued. Grace Jackson, co-host of The Literary Hangover, and follow her on Twitter at Grace Jackson with an S, which I believe that's the name of her Broadway play, Jackson with an S, I believe. I'm going to rename you. myself now. Thank you so much, Grace. Thank you. I'm back Bye. soon. You're listening to The David Feldman Show. David Feldman Show, they're teasing her now in the zoom room about her name uh that be nice oh it, it just got uh i think somebody just said okay uh you're listening to the david feldman show david feldman show.com office hours is friday night at 8 p.m which i also believe is passover and easter and several pagan rituals as well so join us friday night for office hours Go to my website to sign up. When we come back, Professor Ben Burgess will be joining us. And then later on, President Donald Trump will remember the life and career of comedy giant Gilbert Gottfried, who passed away this week. We, we miss him. <laughs> I'm a porcine gourmand of the art of romance. I'm a maestro of the boudoir when I take off my pants. All of this is true, all of the above. I wouldn't lie to you, cause I'm a pig for love. My appetite's rapacious, but my capacity is dim. I seem so audacious, some call me Gentleman Jim. When all is said and done, and the push comes to shove, I'm second to none, cause I'm a pig for love. He's a pig for love. Hi, David. Hi, David. 
Some ladies claim that my lips are delicious Others won't come close cause they think I'm suspicious Please pardon me if I'm somewhat repetitious Like a hand in a glove I'm a pig for love Yeah, I'm a pig for love He's a pig for I'm a pig for love, and I love Professor Ben Burgess. He is a columnist for Jacobin, as well as a professor. I think he's at, where are you? You're, are you teaching at Morehouse these days? Yeah. Wow. And brilliant, brilliant writer. Let's talk and host of the, the uh, podcast, Give Them an Argument. We're a little sad today about Gilbert Gottfried. So you heard about Gilbert. Professor Burgess, can you hear me? Okay, I can hear you now. Yep. You you heard about Gilbert getting canceled while the world burns. Gilbert Godfrey? Yeah, he passed away yeah. this week. You're also the author of Canceling Comedians While the World Burns. You have a piece coming out Friday in Jacobin about taxes our taxes are due april 15th which should also be the day we vote we should get our day off we should get a day off on april 15th to file our taxes and vote that sounds good to me that sounds good to me do you do your own taxes uh this year i actually did break down and use hr block just because like there are like you know 200 different income streams and uh and I just couldn't like it's too much. Uh up until this year I I always did my own taxes. But what's um you know You know the dirty dark secret about turbo tax that they won't let you know. What's that? Turbo tax is free to anybody who wants to file their own taxes. Absolutely free. The deal they made with the IRS is not everybody should know about it. So the IRS agreed not to advertise the fact that TurboTax is completely free to all Americans. You can file online with TurboTax. The deal they made, though, is don't advertise it. Well, I think that uh, I think possibly, you know, of course, since they do, you know, there is the free version, but then, um, you know, that's like super stripped down and basic. And then, you know, of course, they make all their actual money off of uh, off of people who are, are paid, you know, for their services. Um, and what seems like an even dirtier secret to me <laughs> is that uh, Intuit, which is the company that owns TurboTax and H&R Block, which I just mentioned, uh, other tax preparation companies have actually lobbied against uh, proposed laws that would allow for uh, return free filing. In other words, um, that, you know, if you have relatively simple taxes uh, and, you know, it's all on, you know, you're not, um, you know, you don't like own your own business where you're like reporting things in a complicated way or whatever, you know, like, like uh, you're just doing what most people do, which is transfer mm -hmm. numbers from one form the government sends them to essentially a form the government sends them to fill out. Right. Uh, it, instead of that, that since the government already has all this information, uh, they could just like calculate, you know, the remaining numbers for you. 
And uh, tell me what they do in Sweden. What do the Nordic countries get right about? Tech? Yeah, so so in in Sweden uh, and uh, several other Nordic countries, and also in uh, Estonia, uh, they're uh, they they have this in place, right? So, uh, in other words, uh, the government essentially does your taxes, and all you have to do is review what they said to you and say yes, that's correct. That's it. So if you um, so this came up in 2016, I think, because uh, uh, Jeb Bush did, you know, said in um, Estonia, you know, you could do your taxes in five minutes. PolitiFact fact checked it, and they said actually he was overestimating the time it takes most people. Like there were uh, various quotes from Estonians saying, like, really, maybe a minute or two. Hmm. Uh, in Sweden, you know, some, uh, if you like, if you have like pretty, like, you know, you basically just like have one job and like there's a W, you know, the Swedish version of a W-2 or whatever that you'd have there. Um, a lot of people actually uh, get their tax return like they, you know, I mean, there's no actual return, but the, what they get is their tax information in, in a text message for the revenue service. And you respond to the text message with yes that you know you confirm that like what they calculated is correct and that's it it's 10 seconds and what what are the things uh, that you would put out you would put all the accountants out of work there must be a million two million accountants who are lobbying the government not to make it easy for Americans to do their taxes yeah um the uh so that is, you know, again, H&R Block and Intuit have lobbied against efforts to do this. Obama actually said in 2008 that he was going to implement some option like this, uh, return free filing option, um, and that he, you know, never actually did anything, which is a story that plays out for a lot of things, you know, during the uh, during the Obama years. But um, but yeah, that so that is that is true. That is one aspect of this is the corruption aspect. The, you know, like pretty straightforward, like you know, companies that profit from uh, the current tax system uh, don't want to be made redundant. You know, so they lobby against things that would make them redundant. That is a big part of the story. What I also find interesting, though, is that there are a lot of like anti-tax conservatives, like uh, your Grover Norquist types. Uh, who also seem to be against uh, doing this, and I and the reason, that, and they're pretty explicit about this, right? The reason they're opposed to this is that ideologically they don't like the idea of taxes being completely painless for most people, because you know that makes people <laughs> resent taxes less uh, and be less sympathetic, right. you know, to to efforts to uh, you know to cut taxes. Right, right. He wants to make government small enough so you can drown it in a bathtub problem is without government there's no water that runs into the bathtub for you right. to drown the government grover exactly. Norquist, one of the most hideous human beings on the planet who had no problem lobbying the government with jack abramoff he's a lobbyist basically yeah and it, yeah absolutely and it would harvard, point out harvard harvard yeah and i would point out also like in terms of how painful or painless it is for various people right now, that uh, one, I think, in the era of the gig of the gig economy, you could be like a pretty poor person and still have various income streams. Uh, so that's one point that's worth making out. Or making like I think we're, I think in our current neoliberal hellscape, uh, you know, more complicated taxes only only being for better off people. I think maybe a thing of the past. But two, even if even if all you've got is like one job, right? You have one job um, where you know they withhold for you. There's a there's you know there's W two all of that. It is still the case that if you're doing your own taxes, it is a little bit of you know it's a little bit of a tedious, time consuming thing, right? And you know it doesn't take that much time, but you know it does take some. Uh, and it's a completely pointless thing, right? That, you know, that you're, because so much of it is just moving numbers right off of the form the government sent you 
to the right. form that you have to send back to them. That's like, okay, what does it say in, in 2B? Okay, well, what it writes, what it says in 2B, retype this. Even if you're using free term, the free version of TurboTax, right? Retype this over here. Uh, and it's, it's a completely pointless thing, but what it is, is it's a hassle. And it's a hassle that's made a little bit more stressful by the fact that you're legally required to do this thing that's kind of a tedious hassle. And so you have always in the sort of back of your head, right, you know, that's like, well, I could actually potentially face some sort of legal penalties, right, if I don't right. carve out a little bit of time to do this thing that's a hassle. And I guess the thing that sort of interests me about this on a more ideological level is that to me, it kind of ties into this bigger debate about redistribution of wealth and who has a right to what, where conservatives, libertarians sort of take the position that, well, everybody has a right to whatever they already have. And that if you redistribute things at all, that's that's like stealing. And, you know, or like at, at the very least, there should be a, you know, maybe you can steal to, you know, feed your first starving family. But like, at the very least, the presumption is that's kind of bad. And what I get into in the articles, I think, look, if you actually like start to think hard about that argument, I don't think it makes sense for many reasons. But I do think that it feels to many people like it makes sense, like like emotionally it feels right. And the reason it feels right is not actually because there's any more force or coercion or violence involved in taxation than just the day-to-day -day maintenance of wealth and private property. There is absolutely not. Um, you know, letter from an IRS is no more and no less a threat of coercion than a no trespass inside or the, you know, the guard post with the expensive private security guards, you know, outside of somebody's right. mansion. The, uh, the, the thing that makes it feel different, though, is that it is this stressful, tedious hassle that there's this thing that you're doing that you have to do by a certain time and you sort of have that looming thing in the back of your head. And like it's sort of called attention to in this way, right? Whereas if all you were doing is answering a text message with yes, right, that really cuts down on it, which I think is, again, I think the Grover Norquist types are pretty open about it. That's why they don't like it. And it's underfunded. The IRS is chronically malnourished so that when you try to contact somebody, it's a nightmare to get them on the phone. So you begin to say, what am I paying all these taxes if I can't even get the government to, to collect them? I can't even get them on the phone. And you're saying it's all by design so that you hate the government. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that, I think there is definitely an element of that, right? I mean, I think, again, I think a lot of conservatives are like pretty open about uh, thinking that taxes should be painful. And of course, they don't want to fund the IRS better, which which also is good for, you know, I mean, whatever, it's good for rich people because an IRS that's underfunded uh, will tend to go after the smaller fish who it's easier to catch. Uh, right. you they, know, so. they only audit, they only audit poor people on the earned income tax credit. That's it. They don't go after Jeff Bezos. They don't go after rich people because rich people have tax lawyers who go to work. We've discovered they go to work for the irs they do time in country as they say in the shit working for the irs changing the laws and then they go back to their old uh tax firm and they are made partners and given raises we literally have tax code written by tax dodgers yeah no i think that's i think that's exactly right uh, and, and again, I don't think it's a coincidence that, you know, most of the countries that I just named, I mean, you know, Estonia is kind of an outlier, but other than that, right, that like the countries that I just mentioned where they have uh, a more sane system where, you know, the, uh, you know, like um, where one, you know, more money is spent on the revenue service so they can do your taxes for you. And two, where, you know, it's, it's, it's made like, you know, fairly painless for ordinary people. You know, I don't think it's a coincidence that these are countries with organized working classes that have, you know, certainly not achieved anything like what I think of as a fully socialist society, but have, you know, managed to negotiate a better social contract, certainly for working people than what we have here. Right. It's incredible that the American people are told we're the wealthiest country in the history of civilization 
and yet we can't afford it. <laughs> How are we going to pay for this? And then it's, we're the wealthiest, we can't allow Ukraine not to have weapons. We're the wealthiest country. We have to give them weapons. We're the wealthiest country. But how about free tuition at all public? Where's the, where's it going to come from? Where's the money going to come from? How are Americans able to hold those two thoughts in their heads without exploding? Well, I guess we are exploding. I guess. Well, I, I mean, like we could even make the Ukraine part sharper because we have money to flood the country with weapons, but we don't quite have enough money to forgive their debt. Right. Well, that's interesting. That's 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 very interesting. Your thoughts on Biden's handling of Ukraine? Uh, yeah. I mean, look. I, so I I think it's a little bit. Um, I guess what I would say is this. I think that let's start with the low bar that uh, he hasn't ended the world. And uh, I'm glad about that. And I don't think that's a given, right? I don't think that that's just like, a, you know, no matter who was, who was president and what they were doing, that like they uh, who definitely would not have escalated this to potentially world. But he's levels. ending the world by focusing on this instead of climate change. This is a distraction. Yeah, but much more slowly. <laughs> right. Like, uh, no. How about some no. youth in Asia? Let's just get it over with. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I think that there is, I mean, I think there's a lot of pressure to, uh, you know, to be more directly involved uh, there. You know, I mean, there are congressmen, senators, you know, a majority of the American public in some polls, a large majority that would like to like actually really start World War Three here with a no fly zone. And, and I do think it's, and, you know, God, much of the media, right? I mean, we've seen the press conferences, you know, where like journalists like pretty much ask, like, you know, hey, are you are you being a little too quick to rule out this whole World War Three thing? You know, right. like like right. you know, we we can still end this all in a blaze of glory right now. You know, why is that off the table? Right. Um, so so Curtis I do, LeMay <laughs> is winning. No, I think I think Curtis LeMay has has posthumously won the battle of public opinion. Um, so. Yeah, no, unfortunately, yeah. So I, I, I do think that like Biden uh has um uh, you know has shrugged a lot of that off. I mean it's occurred to me more than once that like you know, I remember when Biden tweeted out, you know, guys, I'm not gonna start World War Three basically, and the replies were full of people, including some like, you know, blue check people with many thousands of followers, you know, basically saying, Well, why not, pussy? You know, it's you can still do it, right? And it did occur to me that if that were Trump operating that presidential Twitter account, um, you know, that would really infuriate him, right? You know, to see people right. to see people who thought that he was weak, and I don't know where that would have led. Um, and neither does anybody else, uh, you know. So, so in that sense, I think it could be a lot worse. Now, that said, um, I do think that what Biden has done has been very, very focused on inflicting sort of, you know, maximum pain on the Russians with both sanctions and arms shipments to Ukraine. And the case for that you'll get from people who who think that that's the right thing to do is that like that provides more incentives for the Russians to get serious about negotiations or whatever. But then like the other side is I don't really see a lot of evidence for the Biden administration that like we're really pushing for negotiations and a, a peaceful settlement to this, like really at all. So um, that just seems like, I mean, I don't know, I'm a simple man, but I mean, I think if you want to help out Ukrainians, I think like having fewer of them die because we have a negotiated settlement to the war would be a for good first step. Um, and, you know, also, you know, letting all the ones who want to come over, come over, you know, would, would, be, uh, would be another good one. Oh, and, that's by the way, one of the big scams of the Biden administration is claiming that he's going to bring in all these Ukrainian refugees. What he didn't say is that you have to land in America first. Like that, that big promise that he was going to accept all these Ukrainian refugees. Yeah. They can't get here. So that we're not accepting any. <laughs> yeah. Well, and again, you know, you, you can spend, um, you know, you can spend all of this money, on sending over, you know, tanks and guns and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
uh, but uh, but you know you can't maybe spare a few planes to like go over and, and scoop up some refugees. Um, I I think that says you know I think that says a lot too. I mean like I I think that I, you know right now I mean I have an article out in Jacobin today where I talk about this a little bit. You know say so like right you know what we've got right now is great for arms manufacturers, right? I mean they're they're making a killing off of this. Uh, it's not clear to me that it's very good for anybody else. Yeah. How is it possible that they don't even come up with brand new lies? They, the, the, the march to war, it's the same playbook. He's Hitler. Yeah. He's Hitler. We have to stop him. I, I've had people who I think I sure. respect who say, you know, first it's Moldova, then it's Estonia. The next thing you know, it's Liechtenstein. You know, where does it end? Yeah, it's like the uh, the scene in Casablanca, right? You know, are you one of those, Rick, who could never have imagined us marching through your beloved Paris? You know, perhaps one day we'll march through New York. Uh, and then the you know the line they give him to be a badass is there are certain parts of New York you wouldn't want to conquer. But uh, but yeah, no, that's 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 like it's absurd, right? I mean, think about the history of American wars over the last few decades, right? I mean, the, the United States has fought lots of them, but also it's not the case, you know, that invading Iran, Iraq in 2003 meant that it was Iran in 2004 uh, and, you know, whatever, you know, that it was like straight down the line, you know, for the next several years, right? I mean, the, the United States uh, couldn't even really handle Iraq. We certainly weren't going to take on Iran, which had much more of a real army and a functioning economy than, than you know, just you know, despite everything that, that Iraq had at the time that we knocked over Saddam Hussein. And that's the United States, right? I mean, that is the wealthiest, most powerful, best armed history in you know, country that's ever existed in history. Um, Russia is a country with an economy pre-sanctions economy that was like the size of Italy. And um as we have seen not a very good army um and i don't know this idea that if if you know putin successfully conquered all of ukraine which at this point might not even really be the war goal they might not have kind of they might have kind of given up on that mm -hmm. um and you know it's it's a little unclear like what the end game ever was but i mean like that i think at this point might not even be the war goal but like look if if they did like if like the, the fortunes of war completely turned around right now today and they just swept into Kiev, you know, killed Zelensky, overthrew the government, established a puppet government. This idea that then there would be, you know, Russian boots on the ground and, you know, whatever, that the Dove, Estonia, Germany, France, you know, it's like, no, this would just be like, they would be uh, presumably much more bogged down and hurt and hurt by dealing with the long-term insurgency they would have to deal with in Ukraine than the United States was even in Iraq. Right, right. Are you getting any reliable information that Ukraine is overrun by Nazis? I don't think Ukraine is overrun by Nazis. Where is this coming the, from, Putin? Yeah, I mean, I think that the thing my understanding is that what makes this a little bit complicated is that there is a germ of truth here but it's also like, you know, Putin and his friends and apologists will also sort of inflate it in a way that, that's kind of absurd and, you know, and, and doesn't really make sense, right? So the germ of truth is that there are like far right militias, including people that you could call Nazis, I think reasonably, right? People who will yeah. like openly glorify like World War II, you know, 1940s Ukrainian Nazis and, you know, and are far right nationalists who are people who like get like volunteers and support from Western European, you know, Nazis, you know, like that there are right. people like that who were, uh, you know, formed like all these kind of ad hoc militias that started up in 2014, most famously the Azov uh, regiment. And that since, um, you know, and since they've been incorporated into the Ukrainian military, but it's also like, you know, I mean, it's a little weird to like, sometimes like Zelensky will say that and make it sound like that means there's nothing to see here. It's like, well, okay, right. Hold on a second. Right. They have a, uh, if, if I, if you told me that the United States had incorporated some Nazi militia into the U S army, and that was like the, 
82nd Air Board was going to be the Nazi Air Board or something like that, right? Like that would set off some alarm bells. Uh, so, so there are definitely Nazis there. So the flip side is that but they're casual Nazis. They're <laughs> they, they are. From what I've been reading, is they call themselves That's just a great phrase, but okay. They're this casual Nazism. They're like you know Civil War reenactors. They're not. Are, are yeah. we seeing reports? I mean, the the chief rabbi of Kiev. Yeah. Says, There's no problem with Nazis here in Ukraine. Yeah, I mean, I think that you know, I mean, consider like I would imagine that his priority list right now is is much more about the you know the death and destruction being wrought by the invaded army, right? You know, and and that if if people thinking the Nazi thing is a big deal, then like you know is is going to make them less likely to support his country, that he's going to you know he's going to play it down. I mean, like that would just seem like common sense. I I do think. Look, so I think that, so I think the flip side, so I think the first part is just to say there is a real German truth there. And I think that since the war started, there's this kind of weird thing that's happened where the mainstream media, like you have to just say that there's nothing there at all. And like, uh, and so even though some of these very same media outlets actually did report on this in a way that made it seem like there was a little bit more there a couple of years ago now. They report on it as if the whole thing is just Putin propaganda and lies, which I think is just not accurate. Now that said, those casual Nazis uh, that are in uh, that are in Ukraine, um, they don't have very much popular support, like at all. They do abysmally in elections. Like I mean, it's like Green Party level. Uh, it's it's like they're like a nothing in terms of electoral politics in Ukraine, um, and. The, and certainly the idea that this is like a society that's dominated by Nazis is just obviously silly on its face. I mean, right, it's a country that has a Jewish president, a Jewish prime minister, you know, they have a, like, um, there are many reasons to think that the idea, and it's also, I think, ridiculous to think that it has anything to do with Putin's war aims because, you know, he himself has been more than willing to support an ally with far right movements and parties in different countries when he thinks it serves Russian geopolitical interests like the uh, Signer group is filled with some pretty questions I, yeah i mean there, there's and i mean i think he's been very friendly to you know like semi neo-fascist parties in certain places in western europe and you know whatever and trump they, and trump know, trump sure uh yeah i mean trump i think early on i think that was their preference i think that i think the way he actually governed uh was probably not like um if anything, I think oftentimes he was trying to prove something and like he didn't he didn't really do uh right. if any if anything, he probably escalated tensions much more than Obama did. But uh but yeah, look, whatever. So I I, I think it's like the short answer is I don't think there's nothing there. I think there's something there, but also I think that the Russian narrative about it wildly exaggerates what's there. And also I think it's kind of an insult to everybody's intelligence to think it has anything to do with Russian war aims. Yeah. Ben Burgess is a columnist for Jacobin. Read him over Jacobin April 15th. What's the name of the piece? Uh, I actually haven't seen the headline they put on it, but yeah, I mean, it's tax. It's the tax day article, so it should be out tomorrow. Okay. Or, you know, so by the time people are listening, this is a podcast today. Listen to his podcast, give them an argument. And I thank you, sir, for stopping by once again. I'll see you next week, I hope. Right. Unless Dr. Yes. Hirschenfeld wants to say something. No, I just want to wave. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Hirschenfeld. I have several. Well, then. I need to go over with, with Professor Burgess before he goes. Okay. Um, uh, actually, no, I have none. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That, that, you drew me in. I was like, hang on. That Thank was you. acting. Act. Nice. 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 Thank you, Professor Ben Burgess. We'll see you next week, I hope. All Joining right. us is Dr. Philip Hershenfeld. He is a Freudian psychoanalyst. And Ethan Hershenfeld, who is a brilliant comedian, a truly brilliant comedian, who you can see on YouTube, Thug Thug Jew, go stream that. Have you hit a million views yet? I'm a pro as I tell people, um, I am approaching a million views. Okay. And which is simply a mathematical fact because everything is approaching a million. You know, so. Okay. Yeah. I have uh, 
A couple of questions. I want to talk about Gilbert Gottfried and laughter and whether or not we're allowed to laugh at Gilbert Gottfried. But we had a guest on the show earlier this week who said some things about uh, medication, psych meds. One of the things said was that there's not a shred of evidence that uh, these psych meds like Zoloft, Prozac work. Uh, I ch quickly changed the subject because I didn't want to get into it. Yeah. That was very wise. I was watching. I saw it. it was you with fraud. I saw some right. of that. Yeah. I don't know if you know this. I'm not a doctor. Did you know that, that I'm not a doctor? No, we, we, have, we have three, three permutations here. We have a doctor who knows he's a doctor. That's my dad. We have you who isn't a doctor and knows it. And I, who am not a doctor, but think I am. So we have all of the bases covered. What do you, what, what is your, well, let me ask Ethan first. Well, all we need is a doctor who thinks he's not. Well, that's what we're missing. <laughs> do you know any of those? Anyone? What are your, Ethan, what are oh, your. Oh, Mehmet Oz. There's one. Right. No, he, I guess he thinks he's a doctor. What Psych do I, Psych meds. Well, let me just say this from personal experience. No joke. They work. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Hershenfeld. The real Dr. Hershenfeld. They absolutely work. <clears throat> they absolutely work in situations in which they work. They don't work in every situation. There are situations where something else works better, like talk, like uh, joining a communal effort of some sort, like exercise. There are all sorts of different things, but they work, they save lives. There is, um, and there's documentary evidence of a lowering of suicide attempts right. due to these medications. Brain chemistry. Is there a tendency now to think that we need to treat the chemistry of the brain and talk less? Is that where we're heading in the United States? Yeah, because it's cheaper even though they charge ungodly amounts <clears throat> for these medications. And um, it seems simpler. So, and it sounds scientific. Right. Which sometimes it is. But there's a brain and there's a mind. And even though they're intimately connected, they're not the same thing. What do you mean by that? You've what got a physical. Mind? You've got. Hey, you, you you just got muted. That was just in your mind, David. Wow. It was, it was P Putin who did that. Right. Um, I didn't want to say that, but that's true. It's true. Um, you've got a physical brain, and if you can affect it in certain ways, it produces certain consequences. If you drink a quart of gin, your physical brain will be affected and will, you know, not act in its usual way. But then you've also got a mind that resides in the brain, but is not the exact same thing. It's, right. it's, it's something of psychology, of emotions, Right. So that's what I mean. Okay. Let's turn to one of the great minds of comedy, Gilbert Gottfried, who we lost on Tuesday. Earlier, I said that Gilbert told jokes about child molestation on stage that made me laugh harder than anything. Harder than the actual thing. Right. <laughs> I mean, I laughed at him with abandon, especially when there were tourists who were offended by his jokes about child molestation. Uh, 
Well, uh, Ethan. Yes. Watching Gilbert, did, mm -hmm. did that bring you joy? The more offensive he got, did it bring you? Know, I know him primarily from, first of all, that voice, that thing, that, that, yeah. which is, that was incredible just on its own. But I knew him, my favorite thing about him was when he would go on the Howard Stern show and he would do that fake prayer thing. He would do the fake, like, chazanut, the fake, uh, very religious orthodox. He would just do this fake Hebrew thing. And I, that would, I was just rolling on the floor. I, right. I, I thought it was just absolutely brilliant. Um, I feel like, yes, also Louis C.K. did an incredible joke about, about uh, pedophilia uh, in his SNL monologue, where he kept interjecting, saying, I'm not saying I support it. I'm just saying, can you imagine? Anyway, I won't ruin the bit, but I, uh, I think a lot of comedians, uh, that's, that's one of the great things about comedy. You can talk about these subjects that are taboo, and you can do them in a way that's actually constructive. Why is it constructive? Because people can address these things that are taboo. They can look them, they can look at them instead of looking away. And looking away is the problem. Look at it. Even if in looking at it, you're laughing. That's fine. The worst thing is to deny that it exists. Because it exists. The impulse exists. The problem is the people who act on it. Right. So the, the problem isn't people who laugh at it or make jokes about it. They're not the problem. So are they? That, are that they? guy's bringing light into the world by making jokes about that. And frankly, so is anyone, any comedian making jokes about a thing if they're good jokes and they make people laugh. You know, even if that, that Chris Rock joke was sort of anodyne, it, he's making a joke about a, a condition. He's, he's bringing light to a thing. It's not a, he's not, he's not causing a problem unless it's one person suffering greatly from hearing the joke. But in general, I think the guy's doing a, a big mitzvah by doing jokes about that stuff. Dr. Hershenfeld. Yeah, I, it, it's a common <clears throat> human tendency that most of us do. We can say outrageous things and then say, just kidding. Now, is it true that we were just kidding? Not completely, but it's it's said in a way that uh, that makes it slightly more acceptable, but not I, I, always. I have Some to point out there's a there's a very bold and broad d barrier between those two lanes of kidding and being a professional comedian. He's not a guy who said something nasty about in the, on that theme and then said, oh, I'm just kidding. No, he constructed, delivered, and got a big laugh for a joke on a certain subject. Just wanted to point that out. Yeah. But my point was that it's, it, it's, it's built into all of us to right. be able to try to say things that are hard to say, that are um, not acceptable. It's actually my my reflex. Like the other day, you, you delivered news of of someone's death, right? And so my response to that is always, "How's he doing? Right. <laughs> is it permanent? What's the prognosis? All I can't help, but uh, yeah. So, but that is it is offensive for the. It's on some a, level, it's offensive. It, it, it's offensive to a degree, but it's also, I think it ameliorates something within you when you say that. No, it doesn't. I'm fine. Yeah. It's not. No, no, no. no that's true. It, it is. It's a way of sidestepping the actual experience of the horror of, uh, of, right. of death, which, as we know, not a lot of people know this. And many people who know this are unwilling to accept it. But death actually is permanent. Many people take solace in the fantasy that their, their child is now, an, they're an angel. Right. It, it, they're not an angel. They're, it's just a horrible, horrible thing. <laughs> of the, they weren't an angel when they're alive and they're not an angel now. There, were, there are no angels. Wow. Your kid was a kid, it's terrible. It's wow. absolutely horrible. But wow. but how many, what percentage of humanity needs that little fantasy? A lot. Right? <laughs> That's right. That, like, that is offensive. Like what you just said would be hysterical on stage. That, to say that is so shocking to say that. 
but they're and, not an angel. There's no such right. thing as an angel. I know a lot of people think there is, but I can't, I can never, from the time I was conscious, I, I could never wrap my head around how anyone can believe that bobomysis. But they do, and it's offensive to call it bobomysis. I understand that. And also, I, I think it's great that people can believe that. But it's also, I, I just, I, I don't get it. Death is, is, I have a story that encompasses both of these principles. Is it as uplifting as what Ethan just said? Also, when your dog dies, there's no rainbow bridge. There's a <laughs> hole in the backyard. There is no rainbow bridge. I can show you the hole in the backyard. Suddenly, a few years ago, everything's a rainbow bridge. And also, it's every dog. Every dog goes over the rainbow bridge. There's no selection. There's no, you go left, you go right. There's no, somebody, there's no dog purgatory, puppetory. There's no, every dog, every cat, rainbow bridge. I'd like to see this bridge. I mean, this has like, more traffic than the Tappan Z. It's, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. There's no rainbow bridge. There's dead animals. It's tragic. It's the worst thing in the world. They all die, and they die young. We outlive them. It's terrible. You have to believe in the bridge in order to see it. Don't you get that? But there's, I, that's that's what it. What is love? What is that deep, un ambivalent love for that animal if you, if then there's also a bridge and he's now playing fetch in the sky then what it then it's all it makes to me that whole fantasy makes a mockery of what we have in the here and now i seriously it makes a mockery of the whole thing wow so what i'm saying is screw your bridge screw your angel just get down to business here we are we have a few weeks or years or in some cases i mean days um I'm not going to, I mean, name names, but time is short. So, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Hershenfeld, you had a... Uh... So when I was in high school, I lived in a dormitory. In high know. school? Yeah. yeah. In Washington Heights. Can you believe that his parents sent him from rural Pennsylvania to Washington Heights to a dorm at the age of 12? It's like Dickens. It's like Dickens, but with a ch, because it was Yiddish Dickens. Chickens. Chickens. Okay, so little Pip. Pip. He wasn't Pip, he was Pippic. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was, yeah. it was great, I loved it. But at any rate, I went home for a weekend, I came back with a football. I bought a new football probably with money I had stolen out of my father's pocket, but that's <laughs> another story. And so Friday, at the end of that week, Friday, we were playing football out in the street, a bunch of us. And um, I wanted to go to the movies. There was probably some Bridget Bardot movie at the Heights, at the Washington Heights Art Theater. And this was, by the way, this was the 50s when it was legal to whack off at the cinema. Yes. <laughs> so the kids say, can I, can we keep the football and play with it? I said, sure. I go to the movie. I come back. One of the kids is dead. Um, he was going out for a pass. Some bicycle comes around a corner, hits him in the back of the knee. He flips over backwards on his head dead so an angel and i yeah so here's here's two aspects of it so we were having a memorial service for him wait was this a classmate of yours who was this guy okay he was a year younger jesus but a really nice kid and his name was jay and um so we we're having a memorial service that weekend and i see my roommate come in he didn't know what was going on so he comes he sits next to me and we were both real cut-ups so i whisper to him what's going on and and then i say to him try not to laugh <laughs> <laughs> how old were you i was probably 15 by this time wow so that that 
demonstrates one side of what we're talking about, you know, trying to deal with these things through laughter. Wait, but, but did you, were you then both cracking up for the rest of the service or no? I don't remember that, okay. but maybe. Um, I then hear about the funeral service down in Miami Beach, where the rabbi actually said, this happened on a Friday afternoon. The rabbi actually said, God wanted a flower for his Sabbath table. What? I mean, even at 15, this sounded like such horseshit to me. It's, it's like the Rainbow Bridge. Yeah. But yeah. it's comforting. If it's comforting. If, exactly. If it's comforting, that's that's good. The, it's a the bomb. What, what is it called? The opiate of the masses or the. Uh... Well, let, let, let's untangle this for a second. My first question is what happened to the football? Yeah, I got it back. Do I feel do I feel guilty about it to this day? Yeah, I, yeah, I do. Okay. Actually, it's interesting if you feel so guilty that you never mentioned it to me in many decades. This is the first year bringing it up. I wonder why that is. But he never he only played basketball with you, but not football. Occasionally we would play football. And I remember your line. Do you remember your your mantra? Down and out. OK, there was that. But uh that that's all yeah no um the the mantra was if we would complain that you didn't you weren't throwing it exactly how we wanted you would say quote i'm not joe namath <laughs> that was your line i'm not joe namath which and take uh, off the fur coat that's, yeah yeah and so a big sunglasses you, so you say to your friend don't laugh and that's what makes him laugh so the jokes that are taboo make us laugh harder because we've been told not to laugh at them. Yeah, sure. Yeah. We laugh at the forbidden, at the taboo. Yeah. There's also the, the, that zone of, that zone of san the sanctimonious, those places where, those moments where you're just not allowed to laugh mm -hmm. and then at those moments it's like a hair trigger anything it's just you're just ready that's my experience as, as kids at the passover seder that was a big one whenever there was the reading and it was getting serious about the slaves and egypt and just any little thing was just just ready to erupt and right get a, a withering glance from a grandparent is they say i'm being serious here like laughter is healing but does it make the world better laughing at tragedy? In other words, if there's something like laughing at child molestation, who are we helping? Well, if, if, you do, if you're laughing while it's happening, you're not helping anyone. <laughs> Is that what you, did I misunderstand? I, I'm so, you were justifying tasteless jokes by saying it shines a light. Right. Um, do you worry that it's a light that is shined shown briefly and then people think okay we dealt with it move yeah, on you're right as i was saying it i was thinking you know i don't know if what i'm saying is true but that goes for most of what i say right um, yeah. but that, um, most of what everybody says we just say it um so I, some recently somebody said that the only way to deal with the holocaust through art is through comedy and they were talking about that comedic movie where the little kids in a concentration camp and his father you, you remember that movie it's a wonderful yeah. life or whatever life is beautiful life is beautiful, beautiful. Life, life is beautiful yeah. i hated hated that movie right. i for this very reason i just thought no you hated that movie. You're a real anti-Semite. Exactly. <laughs> I, you know who uh, also hated that movie? Uh, uh, your 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 former brother-in-law. Oh, really? Okay. He was, he was livid about that because he. I remember his thesis was in that movie. The father made up the rules of the game for the kid, and he was just angered by the idea that, of course, in that in that world, the the guards, the people with the guns, made up the rules. 
He just found that premise offensive. It wasn't it an Italian concert, as I remember it. It was an Italian yeah. concentration. No, no, no. It was a it was Germans, but then it was an Italian prisoner with his son. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was a famous. It was a famous uh, Italian comedian who did. Yeah, Roberto it. Benigni. Benigni. Yeah. Roberto Benigni. Yeah. yeah. But um. I okay. I, I've, I've lost my thought. I think people may joke. Anyway, yeah, the Holocaust is uh, gallows humor, is what Freud called it. Oh, now he's an expert on Freud already. Jesus. So it's been <laughs> two years. How long is it supposed to take? It's not like. I had a neighbor uh, who was a psychiatrist, and he always asked me for jokes loved jackie the joke man martling loved perfectly constructed jokes that had a beginning a middle and an end mm -hmm. uh a, a, like a really good street joke comes from nowhere there i think they're miracles nobody writes a street joke they just come out of thin air what is a street joke? What do you mean by that? As a, uh, no, I don't need an example. You mean one that that what that what people are just passing around? It's something that gets spread around that's right. not coming from a comedy writer or a comedian. Right. I think just right. yeah, it's appears. true. Yeah. They just yeah. appear, and nobody can. They, Jackie the joke man is a student of these jokes. He can tell you the first time a joke was told. But they can't tell you who wrote it or the, the truly great street jokes. Well, you have a feeling uh, with, I guess, some of those that they even arose spontaneously in different places at the same time, like for some news. You think event. it could happen like uh, uh, the same idea occurs in a few places at once. I don't know. Years ago in The Times, there was an article about somebody tried to trace oh, the yeah. origins of a particular very good joke. And I think he, he went from this city to that city to another. I think he, he found the origin of the joke. It was St. Louis. Could have been. Yeah. What was Freud's obsession, or not obsession, but what, what, what was his interest in jokes? What did he think? They were related to dreams, right? His actual, his, his, this, you can back me up on this, Dad, but his actual focus um, in his writing about jokes, his initial area of research was the knock-knock joke, or as, <laughs> as they called it in Vienna, the knock-knock. <laughs> knock-knock? <laughs> wer ist da? <laughs> wer ist da wer? <laughs> wer ist da banana? <laughs> ah! that, that was the very first knock-knock joke. It was, a, uh, it, was a, it was a big, a huge hit. Right. What Trump did with jokes was interesting. It's what fascists do. They they say they're joking. They test the waters. They say it's just a joke. It's just okay. is it? Is it? It's just a joke. But I'm joking. Am I? Am I? Uh, and yet, I, and yet, they have no sense of humor whatsoever. They've never sincerely laughed once in their lives. Right. Right. You know, I, I was just reminded of doing a joke on stage in Michigan, and it was a joke that was. It was about uh, veganism and whether you're going to proselytize about it. But then the analogy part of the joke was about uh, human trafficking. And the analogy I thought was funny and it worked in, in New York a little bit, but I had that was my experience of when you're talking about Gilbert Godfrey doing something that's very touchy and a very sensitive subject. I had that experience there in that show where I had a, I was having a great show. And then on this one joke, I just lost the room completely. <laughs> you could feel that they're like, you animal, <laughs> how you can't joke about that when in fact, if I could have come out of character, I would have said, I'm not joking about that. I'm joking about this. That's just a right. joke. That's just an analogy. I'm making a, but you can't, people are, people have those triggers. So that, that actually thinking about that, it gives me even greater respect and uh, uh, admiration for comedians who can really do that, who can do that tightrope 
and are willing, also willing to do that repeatedly, willing to offend the room repeatedly. That's, I mean, because it is, it's a feeling of, of uh, you know, you hear about ban banishment, and you know, I guess in ancient texts in the Bible, when you get banished, that feeling of suddenly all the other humans are just pointing at the door. That feeling is like, it feels like existential. Zone. It's my comfort zone. It feels existential, though. It feels like, like, like death, in a way. Yeah. Like, it is. That's why the people say, I'm dying up here. Yeah, that's the feeling. Right. Yeah. Passover is Friday night. Really? Oh, my God. Is it? Isn't it Friday? Night? An interesting thing about Passover that people don't necessarily know. I, I'm going to say it. Maybe you do already know this. Maybe you don't know this. If you don't know it, then, uh, then this will be a, a gift. If you do know it, it's a moment for you to catch <laughs> a little sleep. So the people say, why, why? Does it last for eight nights? Why does it last for the oil? Oh wait, that's a different. Well, that's one. Hanukkah. Oh right, right, right. So people, see, you knew. See, I was just testing you. No, I don't. I have nothing to say about Passover except this. I will. I'm offering my services again. No one takes me up on these offers, but this is a free offer. I will deliver the four questions in Yiddish via Zoom. To your Seder, if you have that. Via I'm, I'm Zoom, on that already it. sounds Yiddish. <laughs> Via Zoom. Via Zoom. <laughs> you, will, you will ask the four questions? Yeah. In Yiddish. Yiddish. There won't be those four questions. I have four other questions, which I'll ask you. Like, <laughs> why won't you leave me alone? Question one, why are you still calling me? Question three, I asked you to lose my number. Why haven't you lost? No. No, the actual four questions, yeah. They're, they're very funny in Yiddish. They sound great. And I, my, my uncle, this guy's nice. brother, gave me a recording of them, and I'm studying them. They're, they're very they're nice in Yiddish. We get one question in Yiddish? No, I... I, I, I Tata, will you ask the four questions? Ask the question. Dot, dot, dot. There, it's a cliffhanger. Did, uh, there was a Haggadah like, in, in, East, in Eastern Europe. How far does this, the, the Passover, it feels like it's a thing that they, feels like Hanukkah. It doesn't feel it's like. like Manischewitz invented it. It's like Hallmark. Yeah. Is that what Is you're saying? Is Passover real, Dr. Hershen? How, how about 2,500 years? Is that old enough for you? The, the say oh that's right the last supper was a seder yeah and, and that was an old concept even then i wish it was the last I, the, the seder is so boring just... <laughs> 2500 one was enough and then you have to have twice a year I, the whole thing Oy. who asked the four questions at, at the last supper and where'd they hide the afikoman Anyway. These are good questions. These are my four questions. Dr. Monday, oh, Mo happy Monday, Thursday. Monday, Thursday. Today is Monday, Thursday in the Catholic Church. Happy Monday, Thursday to, to those who celebrate, as people like to say. What is Monday, Thursday? Sounds Monday. like uh, Apollonia trying to learn English in The Godfather. Yeah, yeah Monday, Thursday, Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Maundy Thursday is the day before Good Friday, and it comes from, I looked it up, it comes from, uh, in, I think it was John who says, mandamus, we, like we, we order a new commandment, and the word in Latin, mandamus, got uh, bastardized to Maundy, Maundy Thursday. Hmm, interesting. Where are you performing, and what are you doing? Okay, for the 22nd, that's the one, I, wanted, I couldn't remember the date, but okay. that's City Winery, look this up, there's a very f fantastic comedian named Jen Fullweiler, Jen Fullweiler, she has a show on Sirius XM, and she, I'm opening for her at City Winery on the 22nd. Uh, it's in New York. Send me, send me a, uh, send me a message, and I will. Uh, I'll, uh, there it is. Yeah, City how Winery. People, and then, how, how, how do people contact you? Through my website, EthanHershenfeld.com, or um, you can just email me, E H Base. E-H-B-A-S-S -S at gmail.com. I took 20 years after getting that email address, I realized it's E-H Bass or E-H Bass. But if you also, if it's just E-H-B, then it's E-H-B Ass at gmail.com, which is not in, 
<laughs> took me 20 years to realize. It looks like some sort of porn email. It's, it, it, yeah, but it's ehbass at gmail.com. Oh, I want to tell you one other thing. I, yes, I, booked an, I booked another acting job. I just found out. <clears throat> Very exciting. <laughs> wow, that's a big applause. Listen to who's in this goddamn film. Okay, me. I have a, a little thing in it, but it stars Uma Thurman and Samuel Jackson. Really? Pulp Fiction too? <laughs> no, no, there's no pulp in this one, and it's and it's nonfiction. No, no, it's it's just a it's a movie. But that's what I found out, and uh, and then I found out Samuel L. Jackson. This is amazing. He is the highest grossing actor in the history of of humanity, in the history of cinema, in the history of the world. This wow. guy's movies altogether have earned you know, like a trillion dollars or something. It's insane. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, anyway. Fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Philip Hershenfeld. Always Five. a pleasure, David Feldman. Thank you. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Peace. And Happy remember, holidays. burn your hummets. Right. Start burning it now. Burn your hummets, but do it outside. What is that? What is that? Oh, that's your leavened bread. Oh, okay. Yeah, burn all your leavened bread. And when I burned it, when I was 11 years old, I almost burned down our garage. Wow. It's a dangerous holiday. Why do all these holidays have fire in them? You got the menorah, you got this. That's for next week. What is going on with these people? It's pyromaniac religion. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Hershenfeld. You're listening to the David Feld. He's a genius. Uh, he is. Um, you're listening to the. Oh, David. go on, go on. Oh, I, I is that God? David, have you prepared your Passover table, the covenant which I have brought forth <laughs> unto you and your people? You have been bad, David. <laughs> your Passover table shall be filled with nothing but bitter herbs. <laughs> How do you know bitter herb? Bitter <laughs> herb uh, in apartment 9D. <laughs> he does not pay rent or maintenance, and yet they let him stay. So great is his bitterness. He haunts the stairway, afraid of elevators. <laughs> All right. Anyway, God bless. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you, David. You bless. I bless you. A blessing unto you. And you bless. You bless. Who sneezed? Uh, <laughs> joining us, we'll be back with uh, Ian, uh, Emil Guillermo. You're listening to The David Feldman Show. Follow me on Twitter and Facebook and sub subscribe to the show wherever you get podcasts. We have the President of the United States coming up a little later on to honor the life and career of Gilbert Gottfried, who we lost this week. We'll be right back. Hey, old chairs in this Bessemer shop. Back and outdated and don't ever seem to stop. The man went down cause his heart gave out. Get back to work, we heard them shout. They said the EMTs are coming, that's what they're for. And life slipped away on the cement floor. I know the bookstores are all gone away Got me some books, I'll read them someday Right now I got to make my rate in all these extra shifts If I can make it to Christmas Eve The kids will have nice gifts And the big boss will have more money So he can go up into space But there still won't be no chairs In this Bessemer place
dreams were bold Now every day my life's controlled Last year we had a meeting and they made us go They gave us all pins It said, vote no But maybe this year Union can give us a little more And put some chairs on this Bessemore floor I'm hoping the union might make things right Some days I just don't have the strength to fight This plant down here can take its toll It'll break your body, it'll crush your soul Feels like this packing ain't never gonna stop And there still ain't no chairs in this Bessemer shop Okay, let's turn to that big rally this Saturday. So oh, and- much love at the rally, David. So much love. Great people, great people in Florence, South Carolina. So smart, so discerning. And it was sold out, David. They were packed in tighter than Chris Christie sitting in a coach seat. Get it, David, because of the weight. Can you get it, David? Are you following me? It, I get it. Can't fit into a coach seat, David. Do you get it? I get it. I get you it. can have that one, David. That's another freebie. I know you people like freebies. I know. I know you love the freebies. What people? Your people, David. The free brews. <laughs> oh boy. I can't help it, David. You know they say that Zelensky's a comedian, but I'm so much. I'm so much funnier than that Zelensky guy. I just don't get him, David. I don't get him. I don't get that Nanette Fabre. I don't get them. Anyway, the people of South Carolina love me, David. I do great there because their elections aren't rigged. You get an honest count in South Carolina, unlike Georgia or Arizona or Vermont, where I won in a landslide, David. But they rigged it. They rigged it. Well, President Trump will be joining us later this evening to pay tribute to the life and career of comedy giant Gilbert Gottfried, who I believe was on season seven of The Apprentice. Let's go to California, where my old friend Emil Guillermo is standing by. He is host of the PETA podcast, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, and he's a columnist for ALDEF, the Asian American Legal defense and education fund i hear it's raining in california yeah some drops of rain it, it's weird it's winter time again almost you know it, it's been it was real nice a couple of weeks ago a few days ago and like in the 90s high 80s and now it's it's cold all up and down the coast in the valley uh, do you have the foliage to absorb the rain or are we looking at mudslides no i think there there are I mean, we always can use some rain, though. Remember, we're we're in drought, so it's kind of a mixed blessing, you know. You, you, you but I think there is some foliage to absorb some of that, so that you're not going to get the erosion. We we do need the rain, and sometimes, you know, when you don't get enough of it, you say, "God, we should rain a little more." Um, because Talk about you know, breaking barriers. It's April fifteenth. April fifteenth is Jackie Robinson Day. Yeah, he broke barriers. Baseball is back. You broke a barrier. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about that. I, I, January 6th at the Capitol, right? You just. That was, that it was glass. And I just thought, now nah, I got to break that glass. No, you know, this is the thing about Jackie Robinson. A lot of people would say, oh, Jackie Robinson, he's a he's a, a Republican. They like to call him. 
they, they like to point that out within the last 10 years. And there was a kind of it's almost like they're a kind of a whitewashing of Jackie Robinson. Uh, the, the Republicans wanted to like lay claim. He's our guy. But, you know, he's no Clarence Thomas. He's no he was a real he was Martin kind of Luther King was a re, Martin Luther King was a Republican up until. Yeah, I Kennedy mean, got him out of jail. See, here's the thing about uh, Robinson. He was just a capitalist. He was a in a free enterprise. He was an entrepreneur, a businessman. And but he, you know, he was for racial equality. He was for the equality of uh, African-Americans. And he, uh, you know, from what I've read in some of the black press, he really uh, kind of bit his tongue and had to play nice in order to be that person to break down the door in major league baseball. And it, you know, it's something about his equanimity that you got to hand it to him that he was able to, to be that for everyone, not just, you know, people who are cheering him on because they, they wanted to see baseball integrated, but there are people in the stands who are like throwing epithets and slurs. He had to be uh, strong. And I think right now, you, you hear people try to not, not really pick at him and saying, oh, you know, he liked Nixon. But, you know, actually, some of the stories are that he denounced Nixon, even though he was a Republican, uh, Robinson, because of Nixon's ties with Strom Thurmond and others segregationists. So, uh, you know, there's some things deep in, you know, the archives that show just what a strong civil rights warrior Jackie Robinson really was. And the reason why I bring up this idea of breaking barriers is because he is an icon, not just for African-Americans, but for everyone who's a person of color in this country who finds himself, you know, in, you know, confronting the institutions that are historically all white. You know, uh, I mean, you know, when we were at uh, Cron uh, together at that NBC affiliate in San Francisco, that actually was one of the more more diverse stations, but that was really pretty much diversity as progressive as diversity got in the eighties compared to some other stations in the media. And when I left there and I went to NPR, I was the first Asian American to host a national news show. And I mean, first Asian American at, at NPR to host a national news show. The first Asian American was actually Connie Chung when right. she heard the CBS Evening News. So not, and not treated well, not treated well, because I mean, I remember in the 80s when I was a crime going to NBC for on a story and I met Connie Chung and she was really very timid and quiet. She was not. As I mean, I, I was really kind of surprised because this was Connie Chung, but I, I saw I met her like around 84, 85. And then she came and she came on stronger, you know, like, um, you know, she was not treated well at CBS, not treated well at any of her anchor jobs. And she's a symbol to Asian American journalists just for being there first. But it was always an Asian American woman like her. And and even at the local levels, Asian American women, very few Asian American men. Why is that? Uh, you know, I don't know. I think there's a, a kind of sexism against Asian American men. Maybe it could be that the people in power were the World War II uh, uh, era folks who remembered Emperor Hirohito and they could not see an Asian American person reading the news. I mean, just as a straight on news reader. Now, some people in some countries may may be surprised by that. But the the news anchors in America were seen as more than readers. They were seen as really as the most trusted people in that locale right. region. And that that's why and when I do my show and I talk about being the uh, first Asian American at, at NPR, I, thought, I, I joke about I was the most trusted Filipino in America for a couple of years, which is hard to believe. But, you know, th this so is talk to me about the shooting of the massage parlors. I think it was a year ago. Was it in Georgia where uh, somebody shot up? Yeah, 20, 2021. There was there were six, um, six murders. And, you eight murders on, all. and they were prime. It was an Asian hate crime committed against Asian women. 
And you had talked about how this country views Asian women as opposed to Asian men. Does that have any relationship to why you're more likely to see Asian women on the news and not Asian men? Well, I think, look, there's an obvious sex thing there, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, you can have this appeal to an audience. Uh, it's a it's a different sort of thing when you're talking about the massage parlor uh, women in Atlanta who were murdered. There were six out of uh, eight murders and all that were claimed when that um, uh, shooter went into the, the two or three different spas in the Atlanta area. And um, you know, I, I just think that there's a different kind of relationship when people see Asians. And look, you could see this in terms of the mixed marriages that occur. Many more white males with Asian women than there are Asian males with white or non-Asian. Because we've sexualized the Asian woman to be somewhat subservient I, I think there's that there. There's also look, you see these uh, there, you know, I, I call them massage workers. I guess the proper term is sex workers. And that leads into this whole, you know, uh, stereotype about subservient women, you know, throughout, you know, you've seen them in pop culture, you know, stereotyped. And uh, these are in, but in the in 2020, these are immigrant women trying to make a living and trying doing what 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 they're allowed to do in our society, they find that, you know, here's Asian massage. It's not, you know, anything illicit, but uh, people, you know, have their, make their assumptions. And I think this is part of the sexism that the Asian American community has to deal with still to this day. So when you have an Asian American woman breaking bar barriers in politics, in, in industry, in in the media, you know, imagine what she has to break through uh, and, and then and then consider what Asian American men have to go through. So when I think of Jackie Robinson breaking a barrier, yes, baseball, African-Americans, he broke the barrier. He, uh, you know, he integrated the game, but it was just the beginning for all sorts of barriers to be broken throughout society. And uh, just think. Just the other week, Katanji Brown Jackson, the first you know, African-American woman in 223 years. You, you consider the institutions in America. We, we aren't done breaking barriers. That's really the, the message, I think. And so how many times a day are you acutely aware that you're Asian? Uh, the more I stay in my closet, fewer times than, than not. When you go out, when you're out among the people yeah. how many times are you thinking i'm now an asian american walking around the city more often than i like to think uh where especially where i am in an area that is uh, i mean i'm mostly in areas that are like suburban areas mostly white but i you know i notice this in some in cities that are more diverse like when i go into san francisco and i go you know amongst uh you know uh, say you know, where the you know, near the bus stops or, you know, in, in public places, you see how diverse it is there when I'm riding a muni bus or look at the subway uh, shooting in New York, in, in Brooklyn, the Q, the the N train, the Q train, the Sunset Park in Brooklyn is one of the has one of the biggest Chinatowns in the New York area. And so as I was looking, I'm in California, looking at the, the videos of the people coming out of the subway trains and I'm thinking, God, there's so many Asians. There. And then you know, I, I dawns on me. Oh yeah, of course, Sunset Park. That's, but was that a hate crime against Asians? What the 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 subway shooting? I don't think they can. I don't know if they have made that determination. I I don't think. I'm I'm not sure what it is. I think they're still trying to piece it together. We you know we got a guy on the internet who was uh, talking. Uh, about mental health things and talking against uh, Mayor Adams. And he's on the he's on the Q train, I believe, or, you know, one of the trains. And, it, you know, I just think it's interesting that how how diverse that train was with also that's New York, right? That or the end train. I, I forgive me, the end train. I don't. So 
a- anyway, I you asked me how how I feel, how much I feel Asian. I feel Asian American all the time, really. And how many times do you think when you're interacting, say, at a store, hmm. is he talking to me or is he talking to an Asian person? Uh, I think, you, you know, it just depends. I mean, because, look, I'm also in the part of California where there's a lot of, um, you know, Latinx people, you know, Hispanics. And so uh, they can look at me. And I guess people who live in this area, they can tell the difference generally between a Filipino Asian American and someone who is Hispanic. But look, I've got Spanish blood in me. You know, I got uh, because of the co- the colonization of the Philippines on my last name. I don't pronounce I pronounce it the Filipino way, Gil- Guillermo and not Guillermo. But uh, Catholicism is a leftover from, you know, the Spanish times. So we're all just one bone melange, as they say. And uh, I try to be uh I, I try and I, I, I try to have a, a good attitude, like, you know, um, you know, I, I don't think about race too much, but I, I write about race. So I'm always thinking about race and invariably it comes up. So you have to talk about it and there are transgressions. There are transgressions. I mean, they've done that su- survey, uh, you know, the stop a API hate they've done their, uh, uh their their survey and like eleven thousand instances of hate in the last two years, ever since the uh, the twice impeached former president started using the phrase "kung flu virus" and "China virus" and that sort of thing. Right, right. Let's talk about Bong Bong. Yeah. Oh, who is Bong Bong? Bong Bong Marcos, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. Uh, when you name first, Bong Bong, or is that a that everyone has? If you're Filipino, you have a a nickname. Even I have a nickname. Dum Dum. Dum Dum. No, no, <laughs> no. If you're a junior, if you're a junior, you're you're John. Oh, come here, John. You're you're. I don't, you know, Everybody I don't, has a nickname. It's like a nation of Trumps. Yeah, everyone has it. So Ferdinand Marcos was Bong Bong. And uh, so tell you know, us who Ferdinand Marcos was. Yeah. Who is, and this is his son. Bon this bon. is his son. So Ferdinand Marcos is a notorious dictator who was propped up by the United States, right? Reagan and Bush. Uh, at one point, uh, there's a notorious uh, 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 comment by President Bush, the father, who thanks uh, Pre- President Marcos for his adherence to democratic values. This is a, he's talking about a dictator, right? This is why you have to be talking about keep- American democratic values in <laughs> Bush's defense. Well, well look, adherent uh, to our democratic values. Well, see, here's, here's the, here's the ironic thing. The Philippines is America's only, col- well, first colony. This, the Philippines was a country that we that the United States bought because of the Spanish American War for like twenty million dollars, and then the Filipinos got upset and said, "No, you're not taking us." And they fought. They fought the United States, and they were engaged in a war from 1898 to 1902 or thereabouts. Although it kept lingering on because the Filipinos were tough bastards, and they had American Buffalo soldiers who went from, you know going after Native Americans here, they went to the Philippines and they realized that they were on the wrong side and they had Buffalo soldiers desert the American forces and join the Philippines. So there were fighting, there was fighting after the official end to that war. So look, the Filipino history is, is rich with all this American stuff, Teddy Roosevelt and, and uh, Taft and all the presidents, but they made Philippine democracy in the image of America. I mean, you got an institution, the Philippines got an, has an institution, the Supreme Court, Supreme Court, Congress, got, you know, it's, it's like mirror image. And this is the thing about Bong Bong Marcos being the son of a dictator, a dictator who ruled from, um, You know, for many years, Amnesty International said he imprisoned 70,000 people during martial law. Is he worse than Duterte? Oh, Duterte's minor league. 
uh, you know, the traditional gangs. Uh, all right. What? 12,000 people killed. Uh, okay. You know, Mar Marcos, uh, he imprisoned 70,000. He tortured 34,000. He killed about 3,200 plus. This is what this is, according to Amnesty International. Um, the Turtis numbers, he fudges them and he looks like he's going to get the extrajudicial murders that he has caused because he's fighting a drug war. Uh, it looks like he's going to skirt that. Uh, he's got his daughter running as vice president now with Bong Bong Marcos and the two, you know, the Marcos Duterte name. That is what people are going to be voting for. Th this is the thing that's really sad about Bong Bong Marcos, um, his emergence. This has been a slow developing thing ever since the Marcoses were kicked out in 86 when the people's revolt, right, people power came out came on the marcuses went to the went to hawaii they took 10 billion dollars with them they lose 10 billion this was a kleptocracy david yeah you know when i for, when i first met you and started covering the marcos martial law uh story in 1983 82 83 that's when the looting began 10 billion dollars is what the marcuses have stolen and they're they're in court over 2.4 billion right now that's in litigation there's about maybe 4 billion that's been recovered so uh you know there's a the idea of kleptocracy the idea of cronyism i first heard it in regards to the philippines and now we're seeing it like i said it's 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 uh evolved and marcus has come back he they they the the uh, family went back to the Philippines in 89 and Bong Bong started getting into local and regional politics, became a governor of uh, Ilocos Norte, which is to the north, uh, northern Luzon. That's their home province, which actually is my my father's home province. And right now, uh, the, the big thing was when Duterte, six years ago, said, he was going to take Marcos's body, which was lying in some kind of refrigerated mausoleum up in the north of the, of the Philippines. He took the body and he said, I'm going to bury him as a hero. And just that act in 1986. And remember, this is the time when there were things that were downright inconceivable and they were happening. They were happening all over the world. We couldn't believe it. They were happening here in America. They were happening in the Philippines and it wasn't fake news. It was real. And when Marcos was buried as a hero, it was because of Duterte. This is going to be Duterte's legacy. He rehabilitated the Marcoses by first burying Ferdinand Marcos, the murderous dictator, as a hero. And that has been the slow build from 89 when they came back to 2016 when that you know burial took place to six years later today bong bong is running for president he doesn't show up at debates because he doesn't have to because he has social media he has the name and guess what this is like a dress rehearsal for the really the demise of democracy america's colony do they have the kind of voter suppression we have here in America? Uh, well, yes and no. I You don't have to try very hard to suppress the vote. I mean, because the people right now, it's estimated that 56% of the voters don't even remember how bad Ferdinand Marcos was. Uh, you know, 56% of like voters 18 to 41 is uh, the stat that I saw. No idea the atrocities willing to give bong bong a fair break and guess what bong bong is doing he's just doing everything that the russians do that trump does he's on social media doing all the good things hey i'm a good guy look at my name does he debate no does he do anything substantive no but he's a popular name and he looks like he's going to win in may when the the election is is held and people are allowed to vote but here in america they're already voting because if you are a dual citizen, 
you can vote. I'm not a dual citizen, but they are voting all throughout the Philippine economic diaspora. People have, you know, had left, leave the Philippines and they reside elsewhere. They get to vote. There's like 1.7 million Filipinos overseas. And it, it sounds small compared to 65.7 million Filipinos who get to vote in the Philippines. But get this, 1.7 million Filipinos overseas give billions of dollars, billions of dollars in remittances back to the Philippines. And so it's a big deal. And when, you know, there's a group here out of Virginia called the Good Governance Group, you know, for Filipinos, they're complaining about absentee ballots being uh, lost, at, you know, and there's like 50,000 being lost. It, it's a small number, like I said, but it's democracy. And they've already lodged complaints because the voting began last Sunday. So this is, you know, it's Americans here who are dual citizens take it seriously because they look back at their their home, their ancestral home, and they wish it were better than it was. But it looks like Bong Bong Marcus is going to going to win on May 9th when the, the election is actually held. We're going to wrap it up very quickly. Your thoughts on Gilbert Gottfried, because we're celebrating his life. Yeah. Oh, man, what a shock. Uh, I didn't know him. Um, I, I've only seen him, but we're kind of like the same, about the same age. And I just remember him all throughout his career, right? All throughout his rise. And to see where he was and where he is and then, God, I when I heard he died, I had, I just had to pull out the aristocrats and, and like listen to that over and over again. And it was so damn funny. And it made me realize the and you've mentioned this on your show and a couple of opening monologues you did, like when Saget died, the just how profound the profane can be. <laughs> and that was that was Gilbert. I mean, I I. And I just, I was just sad uh, that uh, he's no longer with us. He was a miracle. He really was. There's a great documentary out about him, and I recommend you uh, go see it. Or it's wherever you get the documentary. I think it's called Gilbert. We had the director on the show. Gilbert's a miracle. I remember one of your shows with Gilbert. Just absolutely you remember a couple of years ago? We're going to play a clip from it at the end of the show. It was, I mean, you were you were going through your morose time. You needed a laugh. It yeah. was it was it was it was great, and uh, that uh, it was just sad to see that uh, that uh, he's he's gone. So anyway, yeah. and we're sad to see you gone, but you'll be back next week. Emil Guillermo is the host of. The PETA podcast, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. He is also a columnist for the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Read him over there and follow him in on Twitter at Emil Amuk. Yeah. And and go to amok.com and, and get the recordings. But yeah, happy holy days to everyone there and happy non holy days to the atheists. Don't want to leave them out. I am optimistic about everything bad that's happening because you know you gotta have you have to believe in the good outcome the 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 theory of the good outcome is going to be whether or not or how long it takes is dependent on humans who get in the way right i believe in the good well outcome. Said, sir thank you very much dave thank you i'll see you next week happy holidays yeah, love you Love you, too. Thank you. Let's go to Washington, D.C., where the Reverend Barry W. Lynn is standing by. And I wanted to apologize for screwing up your schedule. I apologize. We'll do this next week. Yeah. D night talk about his travels farther and farther to the left. Right. I screwed up. That's we, okay. Well, uh, I am. I take full responsibility and uh, I screwed up. Uh, we had, we lost Gilbert. And I thought we could move yeah. the schedule around. And uh, anyway, uh, the Reverend Barry W. Lynn, uh, talk to me, if you don't mind, about Donald Trump's health. 
reported. Yeah, Donald Trump's health is much in the news because he gave a few interviews in which he was asked, if he, is he going to run in 2024? And he, he several times has said, well, of course it depends on the health. And then he goes on about how a doctor might call him up and say, uh, there's something wrong. He has said it. this? He has said it. He said it several times. And most recently, at the very end of an interview with a, one publication, he, he mentioned it again, which has, of course, led to endless speculation about how sick he is. Is he sick? Does he know he might be sick? You know, he's going to be in his late 70s if he runs again. And with all the discussion about health of Joe Biden, all perpetrated, mainly perpetrated by people on the right, I think he has to be a little sensitive to that. But it, to me, it, it it's kind of a piece of news that comes out today along with the clear declining health of Dianne Feinstein. I mean, she is she is not functioning very well. And again, one member of Congress who didn't identify himself, but told several newspapers about a recent conversation where he used to, he said, go in, talk to Diane, and uh, she'd be parlaying her thoughts and parsing his sentences. And now she couldn't bear, she could not remember who he was. And he had, he had to keep repeating that. And it does raise questions about what do you do when leaders are seriously impaired. You make them I, part of the Democratic leadership. That's exactly what you could do. <laughs> or the Republican. I, I will never forget going to hearings when Strom Thurmond was the head, head of uh, the Armed Services Committee. And he literally had to have a staff person sitting next to him who would tell him who was raising their hand to be recognized. And it was terrible. I think Strom Thurmond was probably 90 at the time. And, but it is the dysfunction. And I think it's up to the people in the institution to say to their colleagues, um, it's time you think about leaving. There was a lot of controversy. And I, I'm sorry now that I didn't join in urging Ruth Bader Ginsburg to leave. I think none of us really believed. I mean, there were very, very powerful voices who told her, please leave, people she knew for a long time, very personally. And then, of course, she doesn't. And I, I must say, you know, after seeing the latest documentary on her, and I was watching it with a woman who also went to Harvard Law School. I mean, this is an iconic person. She could not be replaced, unlike Stephen Breyer, you know, who for all of the good votes he cast in the court was not a person who was a real leader. He was trying to kind of find middle ground on the slightly to the left portions of decisions. But he should have left, and, and now he did leave, and we have a wonderful new Supreme Court justice in the wings. But with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, as it turned out, as most people remember, she dies within a day. Mitch McConnell is getting ready to find a replacement. And that replacement was Amy Coney Barrett, you know, only barely qualified to do anything, and somebody who has literally rushed through the nomination process as quickly as anybody in modern history, probably faster. So I think if um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg had seen the future, she probably would have retired six months earlier. Right, right. But, but the thing that, what, what this leads to that I think I'm troubled by is this idea that if you're a politician, what you should do is release all your medical records. And I've always opposed this idea. I mean, I'm all for transparency about your investments, transparency about many things, but not your health. Because if you release all the records, it becomes impossible for anyone to understand it. I mean, even health professionals, when they look at a chart, 
there are nuances, there are close calls, serious people come up with different answers to what's wrong, what should we do about it. And if you just spread it out in the public, then you have everybody from Dr. Oz to Dr. Oz's, uh, you know, grand nephew saying, well, I've looked at all the records and this is what I think is wrong with candidate X. On the other hand, if you allow the doctors who are closest to these candidates to say, well, let me tell you what this means, then you're going to get the same kinds of lies that many of the people, all of the physicians that work with Donald Trump told about his stellar health from the guy with the strange hair uh, to Ron Jackson, who's now in Congress. Bornstein. Was his name Bornstein? Dr. Bornstein? Yeah. I, it, frankly, since I knew I never wanted to go to see him, I've forgotten his name. And then it was Dr. Ronnie Jackson. Yeah. Who's now a congressperson. That's right. He went yeah. from being a physician for Donald Trump to being a truly horrible member of the United States House of Representatives. So I just think we we got to be if people can't self-control and if their closest colleagues can't honestly say to them you really need to find a way out of this. But in, in, with uh, Dianne Feinstein, um, the attorney general out there, the governor, uh, Padilla, the guy who uh, is now you know, serving in the Senate, it, these, these people just say, what, what problem, a health problem? I, I don't see any of that. That's just not a morally acceptable way to deal with people who are clearly in decline. And the people and I, she surrounds herself with, I would assume are happy that she's in decline because she does what she's told now. You finally have a boss <laughs> who you can treat as a puppet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not, I was never a fan of hers to begin with, but I mean, the truth is she'd probably uh, in her younger days in her previous incarnations as senator you know did some good things particularly on women's rights but that's in the past and if you only live in the past you're missing out on an opportunity to see what needs to be done for the future she's not up for re-election again until 2024 and um, it's it's time there there are, are some feminist critiques i've read in over the last 12 hours or so that say, well, you know, why pick on her? I mean, there are a lot of, of members of the Senate who are barely functional, and that's all true. But many of them are uh, Republicans. They can't function. Chuck Grassley in Iowa certainly can't function. He has the lowest approval rating in his entire life. I think it's down in the low 30s now. And he, he could barely function. I remember when I used to have him on my radio shows and he would have a staff member and I'd ask a question and I would hear this. I hope you can hear. Somebody would be passing him papers and he would just read right. the answers. You know? So then right. that was at least 20 years ago. So th this was, this is a man in decline. But I think the Democratic Party, I expect more from it. Obviously, you and I and many other people don't think much of them, but I expect that they're at least going to say for the good of the country, we could at least have a serious conversation with a member, one of our colleagues who is in some kind of serious decline. While the country is in decline, the, the hubris, the, the narcissism that Diane Feinstein's uh, feelings have to be protected or joe biden's feelings have to be protected but not the 140 million americans living at or below the poverty line don't hurt her i mean she doesn't care about anyone diane feinstein nor does biden they're, they're in it to just have something to do because they need action well, that's, that's not my problem. They're, they're, right. They don't like being retired. Go play bingo. You're, you're, they're not <laughs> my problem. Joe Biden is no. not my problem. Right. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that I'd go that quite that far with Biden because I don't think, 
I don't think he's in the, well, he's certainly not in the kind of decline that Fox News pictures him as and depicts him as. But he does, along with his stuttering problem, which he's talked about forever and has had for a long time, I think they are looking at every single thing that they can attribute to bad health or, or mental failure to criticize him. And it reminds me very much of what they used to do with Bernie. Remember, and Democrats did that too, when he had that heart problem running during the primary. But, but Bernie was fine after. Yeah, he was. He was but fine. Biden, Biden went in decline after that. I'm well, sorry, the, the office okay. of president is not occupational therapy. And that's, and that's what it, it feels like that's what it is with Joe Biden. And I love old people. I do. Yep. And we need them and, and we put them out to po pasture too soon. <laughs> but we have uh, a war shaping up in Ukraine. We have uh, children who are starving, homeless. More Americans are getting evicted. I, I can't worry about Joe Biden and his feelings. Yeah, no, I don't. He's not worrying about mine. <laughs> no, he isn't. You might be worried a little more about yours than about a lot of the other groups you just mentioned. But he's. Um, but then you, you know, see, then you have the trouble. Do you believe? And I can tell you, I do not believe that Kamala Harris is ready to be the president of the United States. I don't think that she has demonstrated any capabilities that would convince me that if Biden were to leave, if he were to say, wake up in the morning, look at himself in the mirror and say, you know, I am in decline. I think I'm leaving. Is Kamala Harris ready to change the policies or would she be more likely to say, mm, let's keep going this way or perhaps even become more conservative on areas like crime? In well, we words, asked it, the American people that question in 2020. Both of them yeah. ran for president, and they were among the least popular. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris were the least popular. Amy Klobuchar was more popular. Elizabeth yeah. Warren was more popular. Pete Buttigieg was more popular. The American people, the Democrats, God bless them, <laughs> picked the two least popular candidates to put the thumb on the scale and move into the White House. Yeah. And, they, and they wonder why we lose. Um, one, true. Two, oh, three. hang on. I'm getting a, hang on for one. Let me mute somebody here. There we go. Uh, go ahead. What were you going to? No, I mean, I. this is an issue, including uh, a couple of weeks ago when you were suggesting that if people really are fed up with the health care system, they should stop paying their medical bills. And there right. will be people who do that. And there are plenty of people who do that de facto because they can't afford to pay them. Right. But, but there are things, and I want to talk about one of them, that where I think this kind of direct citizen action is very important. Over the last 24 hours, we've learned that Elon Musk plans to uh, tried to buy, not just be on the board of, but buy Twitter and to pay uh, $83 billion for it. And he said in a speech in Canada today that the reason he wants to do this is not to make money, but it is, he said, to provide a platform so that democracy can flourish around the world. He believes he has bought into the far right view that it is censorship if a private company makes a decision like, um, we don't want Donald Trump on this platform. Right. And it's not. It is not censorship. It is just a decision being made by one entity, one powerful entity, not to gain not to give access to everybody and his or her aunt and uncle. Brent Bozell, who's a guy I used to debate a lot, he, he I think is the nephew, one of the nephews of William F. Buckley Jr. And he's been a media critic for most of his career here in Washington. And I saw him on a show today where he announced that the, the most important thing since the last election was this decision by 
Elon Musk to buy Twitter. His argument goes like this. He said, look, uh, clearly Donald Trump won the 2016 election. He won it because he had such facilities with social media, including Twitter. And then in 2020, they were starting to censor him. Now, they didn't uh, get him off of Twitter until after the election, when he became clear that he was always going to talk about all of the great problems that kept him from the presidency. But for Bozell to say this, it's just like, you know, I love this show. I don't think you have a right, though, to go to the Fox News Channel or MSNBC or some radio network and say, hey, I've got a show and I have a lot of people on it and it goes for hours at a time and I would like airtime so that the David Feldman show will show up. And that's literally what it is when you insist that you can get on, you must be allowed on Twitter, you must be allowed on Facebook. It's quite possible and reasonable for private companies to set limits. That it may be bad judgment or good judgment, but it ain't censorship. And for Brent Bozell, of all people, to after he studies the media to actually come up with this today and say that this is the most important thing that's happening because Musk must get to run Twitter because he will bring Trump back is disgraceful. The problem is that Twitter is too big and that Facebook is too big. You get to a certain point and Twitter must be broken up so that when they decide they don't want you on their platform, you have alternatives. There should not be one Twitter. There should be five or six. Break it up. I certainly agree with that. There there are big companies, you know, the, the famous phrase from the 80s too big to fail that's what we've decided and we've designated twitter facebook most of the banks where that phrase arose they should be not only allowed to fail they should be required to be broken up because you're right there are no alternative even donald trump has learned that he starts this crazy platform and then the thing is financially not viable and then he's waits a couple more months and it's still not viable and Twitter was not twitter just became financially viable the business model now is you have these angel investors who pump billions and billions of dollars into these companies that lose money year after year with the hopes that eventually they become profitable and when they become profitable the angel investors want a monopoly they want they want it all of course we invented this space. Well, no, you're right. It's a, um, and that's exactly what Musk has done. He looked at it. I, I mean, the only thing I think he said honestly in Canada is he doesn't care whether it makes money for him because he's so fabulously wealthy to begin with. But the, what Zuckerberg does with Facebook, whether you believe, as, as I certainly do, that he really did steal it in the first place, turned it into this monstrosity, and now has, you know, um, is making vast, vast wealth uh, out, out of this thing, which he didn't, probably didn't really create himself. Of course not. But, but I mean, we, but here's what I think we can do. I people on social media all day if um if elon musk uh, takes over twitter and starts to charge for it will you stay on twitter and to everybody that i saw with a comment even if i didn't know anything about them i said of course but the most important thing is that if he keeps it the way it is it's imperative that progressives do in fact stop using twitter that people can do it's it costs nothing except you know you don't get to you know share jokes with your friends but you can always find another place to do that i i really think that that's what the great progressive challenge will be if musk takes over twitter how can we get enough people to simply say we're done with twitter goodbye and mean it and stay away right right Let's talk about Matthew. Blessed are the peacemakers. Yes. <laughs> what does what does Jesus say about the peacemakers? 
Well, the, he, he says they are blessed people. And um, uh, either the other day or somehow I saw you qu quoting Matthew and suggested that that's not really going to help you form the Church of Feldman, but that you're right on about that. There are no peace voices, even on supposedly lefty, slightly left MSNBC. They never have anyone who says we should we should do everything possible and that includes Biden. He should in fact be calling for peace conversations not between Germany and Putin but by he and Putin and this should be a constant thread. Uh, as you pointed out I think last week at the end of the our segment here when you look at how gloriously people including Jen Psaki depict what's happening to Russians. You know, she she literally does, I don't know if you use this word, but she seems giddy about the fact that, you know, eight tanks have been destroyed today, or there's a major, major uh, vessel that's been destroyed today. There are people on the vessel. There are real people. There are boys and maybe some girls who have parents who might or might not love Russia, but they sure as hell do not expect and do not want to see their own children killed. So, but so those voices, are, I mean, because the religious community, unfortunately, has, this is what happened back in the 70s. There were people who would, by normal accounts, be leaders of religious denominations, the head of the National Council of Churches, Union of American Hebrew, uh, of uh, Jewish rabbis, these major figures, but they didn't understand in most cases much about mass media, and nobody taught them, and they were afraid to ask. When I first started working for the United Church of Christ, it was unheard of for people in these offices that dealt with public policy to ever be on television. And I thought, well, this is crazy. This is what you're supposed to do. How else are you going to influence anyone? And so I'd go on Martin Agronsky's show and on CNN, and people go, oh, he saw you on TV. And it's like, yeah, you should be on TV too. Well, we, we don't know. We're backing off from that. And then what happens? Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson, who know a lot about media and who work at it, who struggle with it, who hire people to help them improve their appearance on television, they take over the landscape. And then nobody says, oh, the National Council of Churches, who is that guy? Because they don't even want to hear him. I may have mentioned this on a show before. There was a woman who was a, and still is, a, a remarkably effective sex educator. I mean, she, this is what she did professionally. Used to be on TV all the time. She decides to become a Unitarian minister. They don't call anymore. She says to some booker, well, why don't, you know, why don't you ever call? Well, you're a minister now. <laughs> you're a minister now. Yeah, she's a lefty minister who wants to talk about things in a way different than the speech of oh. Pat Robertson. And so they don't, they don't get invited. I mean, it's, I remember some host on, uh, the irony of it, when Bill O'Reilly, before his fall from grace, or, I mean, he never was in grace, probably. That was her fell. name. Her name yeah, was, that, I think, that was, he was, he was thinking of her with the loofah on the yeah. back. But no, but I mean, he used to, when our communications people at Americans United would actually would call him to book me, he'd only have me on if I was a minister. You know, I'm also a lawyer, and I, you know, pretty smart one I thought at the time, maybe still. And they would say, no, no, we don't. We we have to preserve Barry. He's our he's the minister we want to have on. And O'Reilly, he was he was never particularly uh well he he wasn't a huge dick to me he really wasn't other people on fox were but i mean he would just he was he was really dumb bill o'reilly is really stupid i mean he once attempted to explain to me that 
in regard to evolution, if you, he said, if there's not a divine purpose behind evolution, then we just have random things happen. And I said, Bill, do you think randomness is evil? Yeah, it, good is a God who designs things so they work. Right. Randomness is evil. So he, it, was, it wasn't just in science. It was on science and the law and anything else that came up. But he, he just wanted me on to be a minister. And, but the others, you know, did not. I mean, Laura Ingram, Tucker Carlson. I mean, right. these people, Sean Hannity, are, um, are genuinely evil people. Yeah. I reiterate what I said last week. If people want to know how it is that individual Russian soldiers can commit atrocities that have no empathy and no feeling for what they're doing, just watch a couple minutes of Tucker Carlson or Laura Ingram and listen to the way they talk about people that are not just like themselves. It's hideous and it's the same mentality. Put a gun or if you're a man, just see a woman on the battlefield and you know exactly why they do that because they have no empathy for anyone. Well said. Unfortunately, well said. <laughs> Evil exists. Yes, it certainly does. And it certainly does. Ever you're, you're looking at the face of it right now. <laughs> The Reverend, uh, first of all, I, I love you. I am very appreciative that you do this show, and I apologize immensely for screwing up. No, we will we will have a wonderful time next week with D. We will talk about how he and I and Hillary Clinton started out as supporters of Barry Goldwater, and how we, well, at least two of us, moved considerably to the left. Very good. Worry, not so much. The, the Reverend Barry W. Lynn is a lawyer, a member of the Supreme Court Bar. He's devoted his life to separation of church and state. He ran Americans United for separation of church and state for about a quarter of a century. And he is also an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ. Follow him on Twitter for the time being. At Barry W. Lynn and go to barrywlynn.com for a treasure trove of his writing, sermons, and appearances on countless television shows. Thank, thank you, Reverend. Stay out of trouble. Thank you. Only good trouble. Thank you, Reverend. See you next well, week. There's actually, we, we screwed up uh, the Reverend's schedule, but actually, I didn't screw it up. Gilbert Gottfried actually screwed up the schedule of today's show. Here to talk about Gilbert Gottfried is Mark Breslin. He is the founder and president of Yuck Yucks, the largest comedy club in North America. Welcome, sir. Hi, David. How you doing? Uh, well, so when was the last time you saw Gilbert? Good question. Um, I think I saw him uh, just for laughs maybe three four years ago right yeah. um maybe the first time i saw him is an even more in, a better question so in 1979 um i was booking some american acts because we didn't have enough canadians to really headline and i would go to new york from time to time but my assistant at the time a woman named Leatris, who has very very good taste in comedy went to new york on her own and came back and said, Mark, I saw the most amazing act. You've got to book him. And I said, well, you know, Leatris, I don't book anybody unless I've seen them personally. And she said, Mark, I know your taste, but I will say this. If you bring him in and you don't think he's great and the audiences don't, aren't amazed, I will quit. You can fire me. So people never say that unless they're really sure. So right. I'm like, okay. And I think it's the only time ever in the history of the whole company that I ever booked anybody sight unseen. And he was magnificent. Even when he was, he must have been like what, 19, 20 years old. Right. And it was the first time, not only it was the first time he had ever been booked outside of New York. It was the first time he'd ever been on an airplane and the first time he'd ever stayed in a hotel room. Really? And he was so terrified of this experience of being away from his New York reality that he made me send somebody over to pick him up at the hotel. It was six blocks away 
in a really nice neighborhood. But and walk him to the club and then walk him back. And he never left the hotel room during the day. And it was beautiful. I think it was in May. Uh, he never left the hotel room for the entire week. Wow. He was living with his mother at the time. Probably. Who wasn't? <laughs> with her. Yeah. No, I was living with his mother, too. She was lovely. <laughs> um, and then here's something else. We um, At a certain point, I guess it was about 1982, we didn't have a club in Ottawa yet, but we booked a club in Ottawa and we booked Gilbert to play it. So uh, after the show, everybody went to a speakeasy and there was a bar set up at the speakeasy, just like a regular bar with bar stools. And somebody had brought their dog, big chocolate lab, was just sitting beside one of the bar stools ever so nicely. So Gilbert gets on the bar stool next to the dog and starts a conversation with the dog as if the dog were a human and didn't break character, sat on that bar stool talking to the dog for over two hours. Wow. And what do you like to do? <laughs> what do you do for fun? Two hours. I kept going back. I kept going back to that spot to see if he had broken. <laughs> nope. He kept going. He kept going. Right. Right. Too soon was his nickname. Yeah, too soon was his nickname. Is there he, did, he did he did nine eleven material three weeks after the fact. Right. What were the as as the years went on and you booked him? What was he always too soon, or was it was that something he fell into later on? I don't know. I mean, he was always he would always do whatever he found funny. Um, if the audience found it funny, that was great. If they didn't, well, that was okay too. He loved to push the audience's limits to see if the audience were hip enough to really appreciate what he was doing. And you know, um, you know about the rule of threes in comedy. Yes. Yeah. And there's a rule of nine, which I didn't know about, supposedly. But Gilbert, um, Gilbert may have invented the rule of infinity. And <laughs> is where you say something over and over and over and over and over again until it just becomes funny. The repetition becomes funny. Now, it's interesting because I've been watching this documentary on Netflix on Andy Warhol. And um, one I've of the- I've been watching a little of it too. It's very good. Um, and one of the things that it, it, it kind of uh, says is that one of the hallmarks of modernism is the notion of repetition in art. And I don't know if I'm making going too far when I'm making a comparison between Gilbert Gottfried and Andy Warhol, but they both really believed in repetition. You know his bit on na maple syrup. This is the famous one, right? Uh, which he did in um, at Montreal at Just for Laughs, one of the appearances where he doesn't stop saying maple syrup, maple syrup, and he goes, oh, it doesn't get a laugh at first. It doesn't get a laugh." second doesn't get a laugh the third time doesn't get a laugh the fourth by the time he said he said it i don't know a dozen times people are killing themselves laughing right because he didn't care what the or at least he gave the illusion i guess that he didn't care what the audience thought and it's a very andy kaufman approach right you know, to, um to put on to sing along with um to, to read the gate the great gatsby until people right. find laugh even if he has to go into a second chapter, it doesn't matter. He's going to just keep at it. Could he have done anything other than what he did? I'm sorry? He couldn't have done anything other than be a comedian. There's certain people. Yeah, yeah he seems like a, a guy who, you know, just was this sort of weird Brooklyn kid and would live with his mother and maybe if he hadn't found comedy, might have just lived with his mother all his life, like so many other of these people. Is he was he on the spectrum? Probably, but who needs to diagnose a genius? Right. What did people do if Bobby Slayton or Gilbert Gottfried were born two hundred years ago and there was no such thing as stand up comedy? They were what? Uh, institutionalized. What? They were or they were pawns or they were the the weird people in the village 
Woody Allen said exactly this. He said, I have to be thankful that I was born in a, at a time where my uh, talents are valued because 200 years ago, and he said exactly 200 years ago was what he said. Uh, he said, because 200 years ago, um, there would have been nothing for me to do. Well, I think he could have found out, he would have discovered something that he could do and probably not get arrested for back then. Up on the pitch. <laughs> okay. it's a strike. I'm rereading his autobiography. He is, he's amazing. He's yeah. amazing. Uh, Here's a question for you, David. Here's something. Look, all the people who have gone this year, there's been four of them, four really unique voices. And, you know, there are a lot of voices in comedy, but many of them are derivative. They may be funny, but they're derivative. But Norm McDonald and Bob Saget and Louis Anderson and Gilbert Godfrey, none of them were derivative. They were all unique voices. Who is there to replace them? Right. The answer is, from what I can see, no one. And I'll tell you why, I think. Because what we want out of comedy now is some kind of confessional. And everybody who gets on stage has to tell you about their lives. Oh, we know so much about their lives by the time they finish their set. When Gilbert was finished his set, you knew nothing about his life. <laughs> and you didn't want to. Right, and maybe that's a good thing. Right. These surrealists, I mean, we're down to emo. And um, Steve, is Steve Wright still touring? I don't even know. Well, but that's a... This is, an, this is a trope of middle age where people say, where are the good comics coming from? I've said this about music, uh, popular music. No, there are times in every kind of pop culture, in every kind of culture, that's a, um, a high point. Nobody's writing great symphonies now, are they? But probably peaked in the late 1800s. Right. Many. Um, and people can't write symphonies anymore. Well. The same thing is true for, for pop music. And I'm not saying that there isn't any good comedy. What I'm saying is there's not a lot of good comedy of this particular hue of the rainbow. Right, right. I don't know who's replacing these people doing this kind of stuff. You know, there's Dimitri Martin, but I haven't, we really haven't heard much from Dimitri Martin lately either. Have right. we? No, no. People... Maybe people don't want a certain type of comedy because it hurts. We talked about this at the Academy Awards. One of the reasons I think Will Smith felt empowered to slap Chris Rock is there is a sense in the Hollywood community of why do we have to be made fun of? These award shows are brutal. We, we show up and then we get crapped on by the hosts. And I've noticed that Ricky Gervais, notwithstanding, most of these award shows have been pretty anodyne and hostless sometimes and uh, not vicious. They, they, people don't want the cruelty in the comedy. Uh, they don't want the savagery. Well, that's certainly true in comedy clubs. Used to, people used to always say to me, oh, put me up front if the comics making fun of people. I want to be, I want to be the butt of the joke. Nobody really wants that anymore. And that's kind of passed uh, since Lisa Lampanelli, that's kind of passed from being in vogue, but you know, everything is a style and styles come back. And I'm hoping that this style will come back as well. What's going on, at least in America, I guess, in Canada, that we've gone from, ah, to, ooh, what, what is going on? I don't find that, but what I do find is we've gone from laughter to applause. If they're applauding you, they're not laughing. All they're doing is agreeing with you. Who wants that? That's not why you go to a comedy club, is it? That's not why you go see a com go see comics, is it? I was told by my agent because I I would step on applause lines, and he'd say, "Just think of a dollar sign. Just look out into the distance." and see a dollar sign because you find that humiliating getting applause and waiting for the applause but everybody around you thinks you're killing i'm going they're not laughs it's just think of dollar signs well you know spoken like a true agent but yeah, um, yeah. I, I think the applause is fine if, if there's if there's laughter that the companies it but 
all too often people are just applauding because they like what they hear. They agree. Yes, I agree is what applause really means now. Not, yeah, you are so funny. Thank you for making me just laugh. It's right. not If a comedian isn't getting laughs, but nobody's walking out, is that killing? Can that be considered doing well if people don't walk out, they don't demand their money back, and they saw something interesting? That's a Thursday night. (laughs) Friday and Saturday is different because they're paying a full cover so uh, and a high cover charge, so they expect to laugh. Um, But but there's just too much of... um, people telling you how, how they really feel. And you know what? I don't really care. I don't really care how comedians feel. I want them to tell me great jokes. I want them to, here's something to think about. Um, just to go back a little bit when you said about the Oscars and how um, defanged it's all become. It's really sad when you have to look back and think of Bob Hope as, you know, sort of the high point of obscuring the industry. Bob Hope. Right, right. Is it a cultural thing where you and I are cut from the same cloth, where we value gallows humor, hate, hostility, violence, we laugh at tragedy? That doesn't necessarily mean that's what everybody should be laughing at, right? Everybody thinks their life as being tragic. Um, you know, I, I always thought my, my life was tragic, even as a little boy, when I, when I was, I remember watching like Miss America contests with my parents on, they were on TV and I would be maybe five or six years old and I would start to cry. And my parents would say, why are you crying? I said, because this is the best moments of their life and it's never going to be any as good as <laughs> And I realized then, even then, that the world was full of nothing but Velschmerz. <laughs> and but it never really changed. And whether it's my own personal experiences that make me feel that way, or whether I just have to pick up a newspaper or look at what's going on in the world that makes me feel that way, I feel that life is a tragedy, and that's why comedy is so important. But right. so people well, don't feel that way. They think life is really funny, and... Uh, they think it's great that there's somebody up there talking about how funny it is. Right. The Andy Warhol documentary on Netflix, he says something that I can't get out of my head. The problem with life is fantasy. We have an, 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 we imagine something that should be, and because it never is, it creates all our unhappiness. Or maybe that was the Jimmy Seville documentary on yeah, also the, i've been watching them back and forth um i've been doing a mashup which is uh, really different um my son is in town yeah and he, he we were supposed to watch the jimmy's <laughs> seville <laughs> documentary right. together that was going to be our bonding experience yeah. and, how, to, how to be with your son i think that's fantastic that's we we had agreed he's in town for for spring break and we agreed a a perfect father son bonding exercise would be watching the jimmy civil how could that how could they not know did you see did you Uh, watch uh, and i knew the case um i don't know i guess fame blinds people that's all i can figure out i mean it just blinds people did Canada have a Miss Canada pageant? I, obviously, for Miss Universe, there was a Miss Canada. Oh, I think we still do. I don't know who watches it. I don't know what mall it takes place in, but it's certainly not. It's, I don't think it's culturally very relevant anymore. But I think yes, I still, I still think we have a Miss Canada pageant. Yeah. Tell me how COVID is up there. Is it feeling better, or is it? It's great. That's one thing that nobody ever really talks about COVID is how great it tastes. <laughs> you know, I find I use a little bit, well, I, I'm a diabetic, but I still use a bit of sugar on it. I, <laughs> I have it in the morning, breakfast, you know, with my breakfast, and it's pretty good. I have to say, it's something- It's they good know. for your gut biome. It, it, it's- I think so, yeah, I think so. 
how are the clubs? Are they beginning to open up? And the clubs have been open. And the the question everybody asks, you're asking the same question that people ask: How are the clubs open? Yeah, that's not the right question. The question is how many shows are they doing, and how many people are coming to each show. That's what's really what really matters. So I can tell you that we do about we're doing about twenty five hundred people a week, coast to coast. That sounds pretty good, except you know before COVID, it was closer to six thousand sixty five hundred. And right. since you're, you know, the club business is a um, is a business where you make your dollar, your money on your last dollar, uh, because you have fixed costs. Um, there's a huge difference between twenty five hundred and six thousand. Right, right. We're waiting. You know, so far weekends are pretty good, um, but weekdays are slow. Weekdays are very slow. Right, but there's still an appetite for live comedy. People want to be around it. Somebody said that. Even though there may be a few, there may be fewer people coming to the clubs. The people who are coming are the people who you really want to be there, because mm-hmm. they really, really wanted badly, and right. such an excitement in the clubs now when you go to them, um, because people are just they're just happy to be out. They don't even care where they are in some level, uh, and then happy to be out and being able to to laugh. Um, yeah, that's that's a great thing. And are you seeing anything different about the club audiences in terms of what they think is funny? Or? Well, there's an awful lot of material about what we've all been through in the last couple of years. That's for sure. But you can't just do that. Most comics open with that. They, they'll do five minutes about their take on it and what they went through. And then they'll go off into, you know, more conventional topics. Because the last thing you would want to do is sit there for a two hour show and hear nothing but COVID jokes. Right. Unless it's Gilbert telling. In which case, you'd want to hear anything he was saying. Right. Did you know he was sick? I didn't know he was sick. He was always frail. Uh, yeah, he was robust, but. Right. I didn't know he was sick. No. He performed in Toronto. He did two concerts in a theater two weeks before he died. And I didn't get to see him because I was on vacation. I would have gone otherwise. That's why I couldn't believe it when I heard it because, no, no, impossible. How could he have a long-term illness when he was just in Toronto performing twice in a theater for, you know, 500 people at a time? Right. He, he had muscular dystrophy. Yeah, it was an adult onset muscular dystrophy, which is supposedly quite rare. You have to be sodomized by Jerry Lewis, I believe, to get that. No, no, no. It's uh, Jimmy Savile. Um, <laughs> but the original strain came from from yeah. Jerry. Yeah, it's a very exclusive strain. The the joy of being around Gilbert and him making you laugh, or you laughing with him, it was the it, it was exhilarating. There, you'd come home hoarse whenever. I was around him. I'd come home hoarse from laughing that hard. You, you just made, I made sounds that I didn't know were humanly possible. He made me laugh so hard. I think the way that so much of this comedy worked was that he had the voice and presence and attitudes of an old cranky Jewish man in a young person's body. Mm-hmm. And that's, and that juxtaposition was hysterical also you know uh, about his voice which you know off stage he did not use that voice he just no. you as if he, he, you know, it was a normal conversation but that voice is also a small man's voice and i know that because i am a small man when you are a small man you compensate by speaking more clearly and louder than yeah. most people and he just took that and amped it all the way up to the point where it became funny right right He's screaming like he's hard of hearing. Right, right. Yeah. He was a miracle, and he was a miracle. He was a miracle. And and his life, the, the his wife and kids, they were the most beautiful. He had the most beautiful family you can imagine, and they loved him unconditionally. But little I saw, and I wish I had seen more. He just floated through life. Uh, his feet didn't touch the ground. His kids loved him. His wife loved him. Did you see the uh, doc? I'm sorry? Did you see the doc? The documentary? Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it's amazing because you watch him do the most offensive possible things um, on stage. And then it cuts to him at home uh, with this kid on his lap and talking to him like it's the most, he's the most normal dad in the world. Right. That's right. That he um, had an obsession with taking uh, all those little bars of soap and toiletries from every hotel room and putting them under his bed. And I, and supposedly there was like a thousand, there's thousands of them. So if I were running the um, comedy museum in Jamestown, New York, you know, right. my Gilbert Gottfried exhibit would be those. That's those a great idea. Cause that says everything about him. Right. While there's a, while there's a, a, a one of his routines playing. That's right. a, I would do if I ran that that museum. There are somewhere in this world, there are text messages between Bob Saget and Gilbert Gottfried. I know they had, Bob had told me they thought maybe they would publish them. I think Gilbert's wife said, no, I don't think this would be good for either one of your careers. But somewhere there exists a collection of late night texts between Bob Saget and Gilbert Gottfried that uh, I, I don't even think Leopold and Loeb could have topped them in, in the depravity. David, have you seen the picture? Of I'm sorry? Have you seen the picture of uh, Gilbert, Bob Saget, and Louis Anderson about a year ago? They were at some function and somebody took a picture of them. Have you seen this? No. Oh, eerie and scary and sad and so many things. Mm. Well, before we go, I just want to let you know tomorrow is Passover. Yes. I have a very good Passover. I spent the day, we spent the day driving up to the sort of Jewish area uh, to, to get our, our supplies for Passover. And I saw the worst sign for a store, the worst name for a store ever Adolf's Judaica. <laughs> Did you take a picture of that? But in the spirit of Gilbert Gottfried, there's there's my line. And you walked in, it was just hair, shoes, and gold teeth. Yes, that's right. Exactly. Mark Breslin is the founder and president of Yuck Yucks, the largest comedy chain in North America. Go see live comedy. If you're vaccinated, go see live comedy. And I'll see you next week, I hope. Uh, who do you think will who do you think will be dead next week? Who do you think the com There's a couple of Canadian comics who are extremely good who are extremely sick right now, and I'm only wishing them the best. Well, uh, if this keeps going, I think my phone's gonna start ringing again. <laughs> I hear Gallagher too isn't looking well. So I'll see you as Gallagher three. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Happy pay, uh, Passover and uh, take it easy on the well poisoning. Make sure, uh, you know, don't throw your back out poisoning all those wells. No problem. No problem. Thank you. I love you, buddy. Thank you. Be well. You. Stay healthy. Bye. Well, coming up, it's time for the professors and Mary Ann, but we have to go to Norway to be tortured. You know what? This is torture, Joe. This is effing torture joe in norway uh, what are you cooking for us tonight good evening uh tonight in honor of ramadan and all of the pre-diabetics in our community they've overwhelmingly chosen that i i make baklava that's a filo dough with um, ground walnuts and pistachios with some spices like cardamom, cinnamon, and rose water, and a little citron or a lemon, and in between layers of, of phyllo flour, and then drenched in a, a simple syrup of rose, with rose water as well. This is so, the torture. And, and this, you do it in an hour. Now, Professor Adnan Hussein, where's Professor Marianne? Is she here? Uh, Professor Hussein, did you eat yet? I, I have. Otherwise, it would be even worse torture to watch uh, Joe <laughs> making his delicious dishes. 
But I have, yeah. Well, it's after sunset. It is time. So I'll, go I'll ahead. Try to do this in an hour, but it may go longer. So I'm going. What I'm going to do is, when it comes out of the oven, I'm going to have to probably interrupt uh, Professor Harvey, J.K., and Alan, so that I you can uh, see you can watch me pour the sugar over the still hot pastry. It's it's fabulous. There she is. Professor Marianne is just joining us right on time. Okay, Joe. And how is office hours? Do we have yeah, any? We're, full, we're fully booked. We've got uh, Dave and PA. He's doing a talk on uh, creativity, the creative process. Oh, good. And he's going to show, show some uh, woodworking projects from the past and have a discussion about workmanship and creativity. And then we've got Professor John with the Twilight Zone, and uh, followed up by Walter talking about Denmark, whether it's uh, provoking the limits of tolerance, followed by Zem discussing uh, whether nuclear power is green. Great. And, 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 and I uh, talked about Orban last week. That was brilliant. Mm -hmm. So, and, and then the following day, I'll be... Uh, over the fjord and through the woods to grandmother's house for a hike up in the mountains. So you get a view of the the uh, Norwegian Alps. And mm. then uh, Professor John has Star Trek, followed by Professor Adnan with his course on Jewish and Muslim parables and philosophical fictions. Everybody should sign up for office hours. All you need is a Zoom account. Go to my website. Office hours starts at 8 join the community you can lurk you don't have to turn your microphone or your video on sometimes i just listen or watch and you will meet better people like professor marianne cummings who is a particle physicist a brilliant brilliant artist and she is a parks commissioner elected she's our only elected official although congresswoman marie newman will be on next week how he is bringing in some incumbents but you are a parks commissioner uh, uh for aurora illinois and you're out there uh knocking on doors for people like nina turner and bernie and uh rachel ventura rachel ventura and Janet ahmad right and you're an amazing See, artist by the way uh howie hasn't endorsed him yet I'm, I'm waiting, they're waiting for the blue pack endorsement or blue America pack endorsement. Okay. We gotta bring that up. And Mr. Buttar, Shahid Buttar may be joining us for office hours. Whoa, he's got a great ad up. Whoa. He's running yeah. against Nancy, he's running against Nancy Pelosi and he may join us for office hours great. and not the show because he likes to, get up close and personal with people like Professor Annie Lee and Lee, who writes over at the Daily Co's under Annie Lee, uh, Professor Jonathan Bick, who will be with us tomorrow night, and Professor Adnan Hussein from Guerrilla History and the Mudgeless podcast. I want to know what you people are talking about. I am uh, struggling with what's going on with Ukraine. I keep thinking, am I the only one who thinks this is absolute insanity? I've never seen anything like this in America where we're so broken as a people that there's no peace movement. Are, am, I, am I in my own bubble of privilege where I don't see, uh, it just seems like this country is, stumbling into World War III. Am I, before I find out what you want to talk about, what, what are you saying, Professor Ann Lee? Well, I, I was going to talk about something more local in terms of Rhode Island, but I'm happy to talk about Ukraine because uh, uh, it, it does exist at this much more weirdly symbolic level, even though every day we have the visceral reality of mass 
mass casualties and mass murder. Um, so it's, I, I think there is an anti-war sentiment. The problem is we're always being forced back to the surface. So on the one hand, it is incredibly awful to think about the sinking of a major capital ship. Uh, and particularly since it's the largest ship since the General Belgrando or of uh, the Falklands to have been sunk. Um, and we've only just had it verified that it was sunk. So uh, on the other hand, the, the Russians say they got everyone off of it, which I doubt, but I, you know, we're, we're at this really strange moment where disinformation is, is really uh, running at high, high level. The and we're initial... supposed to be giddy that the Russians, that they're, the ship sunk, right? We're supposed to be happy about this. Well, you know, the, the thing is that, that we have a lot of people who know how to manipulate media. So, for example, it was only the day after the release of the postage stamp of the Snake Island, um, the Snake Island commemorative stamp in Ukraine that commemorates the uh, 13 soldiers on Snake Island telling the, that same Russian warship to go blank itself. Really? Yes, so this is like product placement. This is brand promotion. This, I, I, th this is event planning of the greatest amount. Um, and you can see that Zelensky perhaps had a, or at least one of his people had a hand in this idea that well, what are we going to do? We're going to go attack the, the Moskva. Well, why don't we do it and release the postage stamp at the same time? And I mean, this is very immense because there's an entire arbitrage movement to buy those Snake Island commemorative FU uh, uh, Russian warship stamps. I mean, it's on eBay. There's a whole group of folks buying this stuff how about, the, how about the motto is these stamps can't be licked? <laughs> Indeed. Ah, people die <laughs> and make jokes. Bad ones. Well, no, this is this is the bizarre, this is the strangeness of it, where people on the one hand are are rooting for the Ukrainians. On the other hand, we're looking at mass, mass casualty events. And it's not going to get any better in the coming weeks because we're going to have an actual rather than having these little ambushes of armored columns, there's going to be pitched battles across the plain. It'll, it will resemble um, tank battles of Kirk, Kursk, unless the, there's some new tactical thing going on, because there's, it's a much more traditional battle coming up that is... Uh, really? Uh, and it'll look... Yeah, this is in the eastern side uh, above uh, Donetsk. There's, there's a, a kind of encirclement the Russians already have an encirclement and, and going, and it, it could, well, it's just going to get incredibly brutal. And that's why Zelensky has spent an, a, an incredible amount of time uh, asking for more supplies. Uh, 800 million today or yesterday uh, was approved by Biden. Anyway, I won't wax philosophic on these matters, but it, to me, I just to the timing of the stamp commemorative and then what essentially is a sinking, but it had incredible levels of disinformation associated with it. So the last 12 to 20 hours has been an incredibly interesting range of disinformation kind of messaging where the Russians said, oh no, we didn't get hit by anything. Uh, uh, the ammunition blew up. Uh, uh, you know, something, there's inc it's incredibly bizarrely written and, uh, most people have weighed in on the side that something happened and now the darn thing sunk. Does anybody want to weigh in on my question? Then we'll go around the horn and find out what you all want to talk about. Your question about why there's no peace movement opposing <clears throat> the war. Yeah. I think, yeah, I mean, I think that's a really important question and it is uh, distressing not to see uh, a little more organized uh, resistance to, um, well, or at least how about um, some kind of organized effort to encourage diplomacy and an end 
um, you know, to this uh, war, if it can be brokered, it just seems like there is less um, emphasis on this because while you can decry the terrible situation that the Ukrainian people are suffering because of the invasion of their country, you aren't allowed to propose any solutions other than to simply uh, insist that um, they have the right to self you know, I'm Chris Paul. And that we should be 17 years. Sorry. I learned so much. On Sorry about that. That's all right. But I mean, I think part one of the reasons why there might not be much of a movement to try and stop it and encourage the diplomacy is because I don't think most of the American public really feels the U.S. has any responsibility here. This is just moral. Uh, kind of support that we're giving. And of course, we can send weapons, we can do various things, but there isn't a sense that's widely shared of whether of how the US could contribute to a diplomatic solution, because they don't n know or understand the kind of leverage that the United States has over um, Ukraine's policies, its military policies, and so on because they don't know about the history since 2014 or you know even before that about US involvement in extending NATO uh, the arming of Ukraine that's been going on for eight years of funneling you know there's uh, the so-called NATO peacekeeping uh, base that's near Lviv I think in the western part of Ukraine is a NATO training facility and they have trained up to five battalions five or six battalions a year for the past five, six years. That's essentially a U.S. training facility for uh, Ukrainian uh, troops. And so we've been involved very much. And I think people don't quite understand that if Biden wanted to put pressure on Zelensky to uh, negotiate in good faith, um, I'm sure uh, we could end up having a, a, di a diplomatic solution agreed upon. And in fact, there are really questions about whether Zelensky is capable of negotiating. There have been some negotiations, but does he have the authority really and the power really to make an agreement that the United States may not support? There's no evidence that he does, I think, at this point. And there's no okay. evidence that the U.S. has been trying to encourage a genuine settlement. Or, or his oligarch sugar daddy. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. He That's has a right. sugar daddy who uh, has been. And also, of course, he's been threatened by some of these uh, extreme groups, uh, C-14, Azov Battalion and others that already, I mean, he was elected on a kind of peace platform where he promised that he would bring an end to the military conflict in the Donbass and and so forth. And he, you know, was elected with 70% or so of the vote on such a platform. Um, but once he was elected, he was warned by these groups that if he, you know, ceded any territory or autonomy or um, allowed Russian to be a, a language used in education, officially, and so on and so forth, that um, they would kill him. So he's got, you know, some, they, I don't know about the numbers, but they clearly are an intimidating presence when it comes to the politics of Ukraine and whether they can, you know, Zelensky is in a position to be able to make a peace deal. So actually, it would be very important if there was a movement in the United States, you know, to try and pressure our administration and to communicate more broadly you know, to the Ukrainian hierarchy that, you know, there are div splits and divisions, there is support for a settlement, and that the United States isn't just going to keep bankrolling and arming Ukraine to the bitter end or um, force them, you know, to continue to take a hard line, but that we would accept because there's political pressure. Uh, there's an appetite for a diplomatic solution. We should be showing that to not only our leadership, but to the international community. And we're not doing that. We don't do it in Israel with Gaza. We don't do it in Saudi Arabia with Yemen. We almost see it as a marketplace. We view these, Professor Bick, Professor Marianne, and then we'll go around the horn, please. Yeah, so I mean, what you're seeing from our government is a, uh, a, a complete 
you know, uh, abdication when it comes to diplomacy. Uh, everything that's being emphasized is how do we support the Ukrainians in their fight against the Russians? How do we uh, send them weapons? How do we send them uh, more support so that they can resist the Russians? Uh, where, uh, why isn't Biden sitting down with Zelensky and Putin? What's going on? Why aren't they? Ha you know, why? Obviously, the U.S. is involved as Adnan just explained. Um, so why, where is the diplomatic presence here? I, I don't think, it doesn't seem like they want that kind of a uh, solution. And in the media, uh, in the US and, and much of uh, Europe, it is, um, it, you know, it, it's the same way. It's essentially reflecting what the governments are, are saying. Right. Curtis LeMay, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, said to the Kennedys, nah, go in. We can beat the Russians. This, let's have at it. Let's go. That seems to be the voice of reason today. There seems to be you have Burns, the head of the CIA, and you have Janet Yellen today threatening China to back off, stop working with Russia, or your position in the world will take a major hit. Curtis LeMay is in charge now. Well, the U.S. Yeah, is now also what we have the muscle. The U.S. is also taking an aggressive stance with China, which seems yeah. insane. I mean. If you're doing that on both sides, you know, uh, you're going to be pushing Russia and China together. Do you really want to do that with the, uh, the energy resources that Russia has and the population and technology and everything that China has? Do you really, you really want to push them together and make them the enemy? Uh, it doesn't seem like a very good um, approach. Professor Marianne. Yeah, well, I think we've got uh, a State Department that's lousy with neocon headless nails and that have a certain philosophy that, uh, you know, America should be using its might to establish a unipolar world. And it just doesn't stop with the Middle East. They want to break up. They think they can break up Russia into several small, weak republics, and then they go after China. I think it's delusional. Uh, it's kind of funny that you bring up Burns. William Burns was the was Obama's ambassador to Russia. And back then, I mean, he was even way back then, he was clearly warning about the increasingly bellicose posturing of NATO. And, you know, of course, NATO, as we know, after after Yugoslavia, after Afghanistan, after frickin' Libya, which is still a destroyed country. NATO is not a benign defensive organization. You know, it's, it's a planet killer or a nation killer. Uh, and, you know, I uh, had run across a, an article about Burns' uh, book that came out in 2019 about his time. And he was able to put in, at the time, recently class declassified documents, which he uh, wrote Condoleezza Rice, who was Secretary of State, and uh, and uh, uh, President Bush at the time, right before it, this was in 2008, it was right before the Obama administration, that if the Bush administration pushed ahead with its plan to join NATO, or with its plan to push Ukraine and Georgia to join NATO, uh, Putin was going to respond. It was sooner or later going to be war. It's you know. It, so we have him as the head of the CIA. His book came out in 2019. So I, I don't think he's changed his position much since, although I'm just kind of hoping that he's one of the adults in the room kind of reining back what uh, some elements of the State Department really want to have happen. So. All right. I will go around the horn. Just a quick question. There's a new measurement of the W. Boston which suggests the standard model is wrong. Do, do we have a 
a smoking gun in particle physics yet? Uh, the only... I don't know what I just... <laughs> I have no idea have a, what I just have, asked you. We do have a headline. We do have a headline. It's out of Fermilab. But it was the same result. We, we had a... We transported an experiment from Brookhaven out on Long Island all the way down the Atlantic, all the way up the Mississippi, all the way up, you know, I-70 and then I-55 and all the way to Fermilab, the whole magnetic ring intact because Fermilab's machine was, was uh, much more powerful to measure the, something called the magnetic moment of the muon. And it was, uh, the measurement in Brookhaven was way off the standard model 20 years ago and it's way off the standard model now, but which much better statistics. But it's just a problem. It's a calculation problem. Nobody really thinks it's the smoking gun yet. But you know, you were telling me something about a smoking gun. I no, I was asking if there was a smoking gun. I had no idea what the question I was. Wish were, people are desperate. Look, at, you know, for the last twenty years, people have been desperate for a smoking gun that puts a bullet in the head of the standard model because it's so freaking boring, you know. And it doesn't, and it doesn't really answer some fundamental questions. It just works too damn well for anything that we might want to measure, but it doesn't explain glaring inconsistencies in the standard model and in, in uh, particle physics versus uh, astrophysics measurements. So I'll talk about it soon. I'll talk about it in an office hour so we can do that. Okay. Uh, let's go around. Let me find out what Professor Ann Lee would like to talk. We'll go around to see what the topics are and then we'll revisit them. I'll, I'm writing them down. Professor Ann Lee, what would you like to talk about? Well, I, I think to answer the question about, uh, to respond to the issue of peace movements, I think what we have are uh, a variety of, of sort of microaggression uh, in the form of insurgency. Uh, someone was, uh, uh, for example, the, the Matto show point led it in its A block with uh, a story about an artist who probably is going to get 10 years in, in jail for um, placing um, uh, parody stickers onto the shelves of uh, supermarket shelves. So you'd have a little anti-war sentiment right where the, the price sticker is on a shelf for a product. And um, it, it, it seems- Which country is this? In Russia, this oh. is, uh, I, I think it's uh, in, in uh, St. Petersburg. And um, <laughs> it was just interesting that uh, uh, the Matto show led with that in its, in, 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 on the program. The fact is that these are artists who are willing to, to do what, uh, you know, Pussy Riot has been in jail six times, I think now, uh, which is, you know, that I think it's all about uh, having good lawyers as well. There was a uh, performance piece on the weekend where uh, in Estonia, uh, in Tallinn, uh, where um, uh, female performance artists uh, uh, stripped down from the waist and uh, lined up with uh, hoods on their heads and replicated uh, bleeding rectums. Uh, to protest the the treatment of females and, and women in the in the context of the war. Now Americans are not doing this, and in some ways we we need to actually start from an art point of view step up these kinds of uh, these kinds of protests. Now where they're obviously getting amplified is on social media, but I I think that. Uh, it, it's taking this into a much more uh, open and more palpable kind of position that I think is important. I mean, the best that Americans can do is um, in, uh, was it last night or night before last, uh, some of the artists in DC are, are just projecting blue and yellow uh, uh, searchlights on the Russian embassy uh, and, and, uh, circulating that on, on social media, which is fine, but I think it, it, there should be something a little bit more assertive than, um, you know, naming the road in front of uh, uh, the embassy to, after Zelensky and stuff like that. I, I think it's, it's time to do some things a little bit more um, assertive. 
Now, on that same note, in terms of insurgency, uh, I, I found this one little story, and I know that that uh, it's a little bit marginal, but it is also in the same sense of the carnivalesque, a uh, legislator, legislator in the lower house in Rhode Island uh, put forward an anti-CRT uh, 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 measure, and she's not even on the education committee, but uh, is clearly a, a GOP nutter. And uh, uh, the legislation goes like this. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, House uh, 7, Bill 7539. And uh, uh, I, I just thought that, that, uh, that Adnan would like this. It, it objects, of course, to certain types of ideologically driven materials and CRT and all this. But it has one line in it. This is uh, subsection two. History shall be taught using the standards, customs, and traditions in use at the time of the historical event. Now, what that means is, of course, we could we start using the historical analysis aside from Herodotus and uh, you know uh, what what was the historical view and, and during the witch trials. Or, you know, what kinds of <laughs> wacky but historical, I mean, we have to teach you about science, you know, in, in its most uh, uh, arcane sort of way. So I, I think it's, uh, this is a whole new way in which we can look at, uh, you know, Galileo can make a comeback, you know, this is, oh, anyway. Well, uh, it, it, there is you know, a, Bill, a I, well, this is interesting, Professor Hussein, and then I have something to say about this. Well, I think as a medievalist, I think things are going to get really fun uh, for me. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think there is uh, clearly what they mean is that you shouldn't judge harshly people whose morality and ethics um, politically uh, and policies that were, um, you know, implemented um, you know, in the past from the standpoint of today. That's clearly what they mean is that you should not uh, condemn slavery uh, simply because um, you're judging people uh, with expectations of today uh, when these were not shared widely. I think that's their attempt at historicism. Now, I will admit that in my classes, I do work very hard to get students to understand right. that people thought different things at different times and it was acceptable at that time. However, that doesn't mean that I would endorse them or exonerate that society or those people, um, you know, just simply because it was a different time. And I think they've taken that sense of historicism and tried to turn it into an alibi. And that's the real problem that we're dealing with. But, but we might get uh, ducking stools back and, and other kinds of tests of empirical, you know, fact. This well, the standards of historical analysis in the past, I mean, or legal analysis, we could go back to the ordeal. I mean, I'm thinking there could be, you know, and in today's world, um, you know, trial by battle uh, or the hot iron, these kinds of things might actually be good on television. And I think there's a way in which, uh, you know, uh, Hollywood and our kind of um, media culture could um, uh, overlap with this anti-CRT form of historicism uh, for the entertainment benefit of, of, of you know, all of these people who seem to enjoy, you know, instead of watching all of the war footage, I mean, we could just do reenactments of, you know, kind of medieval justice. Uh, maybe that would be a safer thing. Um, so this is yeah. sort of absurd stuff these people are, are, are interested in. Well, yeah, the, the problem, of course, is that it's in the legislature. But I, I you know, I, I think we could probably pitch uh, Illuminati Raw on Monday nights or something. Anyway, this yeah, idea I, that I hear this coming from DeSantis, parents should should determine what their kids are going to be taught, what their kids need to know. Where did that come? When, when did 
parents get consulted on what the curriculum was there's a there's a great venue for parents teaching you know their children what they want them to know which is the dinner table have a conversation you have plenty of opportunity to you know impart your values uh you know to your children i mean they make it seem as if they have no option but to enforce this upon the schools um you know, whereas, uh, you know, if you want, you could homeschool also. That's the next level. And many of these people do, and they're just interested in destroying the public education, uh, frankly. Uh, that's their goal. Um, because, to what end? excuse me, to what end? Yeah. Well, to, you know, to the end of, um, you know, uh, making sure that uh, there isn't a kind of common culture, a sense of uh, community and citizenship that goes beyond the family unit, or perhaps at best, um, you know, the church congregation. That may be the furthest limit and extent of a sense of the public that they're willing to allow. I mean, this is very much an atomized kind of sense of, um, you know, a, a sense of what it means to be a citizen is is really just as a kind of consumer. Um, that's the only place where you can interact with others is in the marketplace and everything else is about private family and individual morality. Um, so I think, um, you know, they're really when these people are militating against what's happening in the public schools, it's not because they have an investment, it seems to me, in high quality public education and are concerned you know, to have the community have input and some relationship to it. It's because they don't really fundamentally believe in the value of public education as constitutive and a necessary condition for democracy. Professor John? Can, yeah, can I add to that? Uh, you're asking toward what end? I think the end is to have a population that is not well informed, that is not educated, that does not think critically, uh, that is not capable of independent uh, thought, and uh, only the ruling class gets that kind of education. So if you destroy public education, then you have uh, those who can afford it going to private elite schools and everyone else getting a very basic education just enough to be good workers for the ruling class i think that's the end they're heading toward and and they don't you know uh i don't think that 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 is what the average person who supports this type of approach towards education is thinking that's what the ruling class is thinking what the average person is thinking is well i want to have control over what my kids think because they're teaching them all sorts of terrible things in public school you know they don't want to have a another uh voice they want to be able to tell their children what they think reality is and to have them believe it completely so they, they don't want a challenge to to their beliefs even though their beliefs might be inaccurate so i think there's there's two things going on here you know on two different levels but it's not is it real or it's not grassroots it's top down right it's a way for the republican party to find a wedge issue that allows them to stand for something when in fact they stand for nothing other than the oligarchs right yeah, people are being manipulated. Right. Sure. Right. What would you like to talk about tonight? Well, I wanted to bring up the case of uh, Melissa Lucio. Or Lucio. Yes. Uh, she was convicted in the death of her two-year-old daughter in 2007. Uh, many people believe she was wrongly convicted and that the police coerced the confession from her. She's scheduled to die by lethal injection in less than two weeks on April 27th in the state of Texas. Uh, on February 17th, 2007, Lucio and her husband, Robert Alvarez, were in the process of moving homes in South Texas when their two-year-old daughter fell down a flight of stairs, according to uh, court filings. Uh, 
Lucio's attorneys have appealed for clemency, and what they say is new forensic evidence that the jury did not hear. The, uh, the appeal for clemency also detailed how seven nationally recognized experts, including scientists and forensic specialists who reviewed the case, concluded that she was convicted on unscientific and false evidence and an unreliable confession that was essentially a mere regurgitation of facts and words officers fed to her. They questioned her for five hours straight, and at the end of that uh, interrogation, you know, she confessed. And it isn't that unusual for innocent people to confess the things that they didn't do because they just wanted to stop or they're somehow manipulated into it. Uh, the clemency filing is not, is not asking for a full pardon, but rather a commutation of her death sentence to a lesser, lesser penalty, or at least a 120-day reprieve from execution as she seeks a new trial. According to her legal team, uh, her two-year-old daughter had a mild disability in which her feet were turned to one side, so she was prone to tripping and had a history of falling. While her parents didn't think she was seriously injured in the fall down the steps, uh, two days later she became unresponsive and paramedics took her to the hospital where she was declared dead. Uh, and uh, just this Tuesday, members of a Texas House committee repeatedly pressed up the prosecutor in this case to use his authority to stop the April 27th execution amid growing doubts about whether she fatally beat her two-year-old daughter. The, the medical examiner suggested that uh, the two-year-old had been hit on the head, uh, but there is no evidence for this other than the, uh, the questionable confession that was uh, taken from from uh, Mrs. Lucio. And uh, the uh, husband had no, uh, they did not implicate the husband also. Uh, it's just the mom. Yeah, apparently he was not, uh, I, I don't know exactly, but he's not on death row, that's for sure. Hmm. Uh, the, the Cameron County District Attorney, Luis Senez, initially resisted calls from lawmakers that he asked a judge to recall the death warrant, suggesting at first he didn't have the power to do so. Then later in that same hearing, this questioning by uh, Texas representatives in the state house, he said uh, there was no legal reason for him to act as various appeals court uh, courts are still considering requests in her case. Then he later said, he, he uh, thought that the execution would be stopped. He said, I believe the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals will issue a stay, and that is the way the system works. So he didn't want to do anything in his capacity as uh, district attorney to uh, intervene and, and perhaps stop this execution. Mm -hmm. Uh, Re State Representative Joe Moody said he believed that if mistakes were made in the case, it's the duty and moral responsibility of the prosecutor to right those wrongs. But the prosecutor disagreed and said, the courts call the errors, not me. Well, I mean, come on. If, if there's reason to believe there is exonerating evidence here, if there's evidence that has not been presented to the jury, uh, it is the duty of the prosecutor to make sure that that is heard. Yeah, there is a prosecutor in jail now uh, in Illinois for a very famous case almost 20 years ago, Nicario. There was a, um, there, the, a young man was accused of beating and raping a young girl and killing her, and he was part of a gang. And he, the, the long and short of it, it was a poor guy. Um, the prosecutors thought they had an easy case. They very quickly found out they had a very bad case, but they nonetheless didn't back down. And of course, the parents publicly are saying, we just want somebody to die for this. 
it was later on recovered, uh, uh, it was discovered that the prosecutors had very early on a full confession from somebody who was already in prison for a similar crime, because usually if a person does this once, they've done it before and they will probably try it again. And, uh, you know, a full confession who was able to name all the details in the case that only the police had, and yet they still wouldn't do anything. And they it finally, I think was the Innocence Project, those guys over at Northwestern University, it was just this, uh, the guys that got a, uh, a couple of other people exonerated from death row and then got the governor, the Republican governor at the time to just basically reprieve everybody on death row on his way out. So yeah, the prosecutors do bear a lot of the burden on that. So, you know, uh, he might be hiding something. I, I find, I just find this outrageous. I mean, this, yeah. this is such what? a breach of public trust. Yeah, I mean, it's another reason why the death penalty is a bad idea, right? Because once it's implemented, uh, there's no correcting it. And <laughs> yeah, and the way it's uh, used uh, disproportionately affects poor people, um, minority, and uh, uh, the most vulnerable in society. Those are the people. I don't like abortion to... in Texas. <laughs> Outlaw yeah. abortion affects the most vulnerable. Oh uh, yeah, of course, of course. I mean, you know, it's interesting how all these conservative policies all head in that direction. Isn't that interesting? That the the comfortable are comforted and the oppressed are uh, further oppressed by the yeah. You, you do not support. find uh, pro life protesters in circulating uh, uh, fertility clinics in in uh, upper middle class areas for instance. Um, so and, the innocent, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to say that the Innocence Project uh, is involved also in this case uh, with Melissa Lucio, and you can go to their uh, website at uh, innocenceproject.org and, and to learn more. And also you can go to freemelissalucio.org um, for more information about this case. Um, even even the jurors in this trial uh, are expressing their doubts about her conviction. One of the jurors, Johnny Galvin Jr., appeared before the committee. This was the in Texas, the State House Committee. In a statement that was read by his daughter, Galvin said he believed Lucio's lawyers failed to present pertinent evidence in her case, and he felt pressured by other jurors to sentence her to death. I will be haunted by Miss Lucio's execution if it goes forward galvin said earlier tuesday Luc Luc lucio's attorneys announced a fifth juror had questioned the conviction an alternate juror has also expressed doubts you know the time to express doubts is when you're in the jury room right you should not be pressured by other jurors this this is a very you know uh, a big problem because there is all of this social pressure if you're not convinced by the evidence, you should hold your ground if you're a juror. You have the absolute right uh, not to convict someone if you don't believe that they are guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, so this is a very troublesome case and, and it's less than two weeks away, uh, you know, her ex execution. Um, you can also call the Cameron County District Attorney's Office uh, I'll put the phone number in the chat. Well, do you, do you, can you read it out loud for our listeners? Yes. So the district attorney in question here is Luis Senez. I believe that's how, how it's pronounced. S-A-E-N-Z. And his phone number is 956-544-0849. 956-544-0849. And you can ask him... Uh, it, you can tell him that you believe that she's entitled to a new trial and he should do everything he can to make sure the execution is at least uh, delayed. Let's give a, a script here for our listeners. Spell the name of this woman, please. Uh, yeah, it's Melissa, which is M-E-L-I-S-S-A. -S -S Her last name is Lucio. 
L U C I O. And so call Luis uh, Senez, is that his name? Senez, yeah, S A E N Z. And he would be the district attorney? He's the district attorney in Cameron County, Texas, where this is. His phone place. number is 956 544 0849. And tell him to give Melissa Lucio another trial. Yes. And to use his influence to uh, stay this execution. Stay and, the and also, you can call the governor's office in Texas. I have that number as well, if you'd like. Yes, Greg Abbott. Yeah. 512-463-1782. And it's Melissa Lucio who they're going to kill in two weeks. Yes. Uh, 53-year-old woman. Yeah. Uh, and don't be a jerk. Don't make it about you. No, no. Just, just politely and matter-of-factly say that she deserves a new trial. There's significant uh, uh, new evidence in this case and uh, that the execution should be stayed right. or commuted. I understand the impulse to be a narcissist and get on the phone and make it about you, but you will only haste her demise. They will gird their loins. If, if you make it about you and you're a jerk, uh, you're not helping. You're expediting her death. So don't make, if, make, don't make the call if you're going to make it about yourself. Thank you. Great job, Professor Bick. Really, really great. Uh, okay. Professor Adnan Hussein, what would you like to talk about? Then we'll go to Professor Marianne and we'll, uh, how was your fast today? Oh, it was it was pretty good. Just working all day, so hardly noticed it. Um, but um, I did get around to looking at the news, and I noticed that um, there was a, a headline um, in the L.A. Times um, about gangs, so-called, but at any rate, criminal groups that have been sending out crews to follow and rob the city's wealthiest, according to the Los Angeles Police Department. And, um, you know, the beginning of the article tells us that they've been sending out crews in multiple cars to find, follow, and rob people driving high-end vehicles or wearing expensive jewelry. So I just firstly wanted, of course, to um, warn P Professor Jonathan Bick. He's going to have to tone it down. <laughs> um, when he goes out, um, I try not to wear so many gold. Try with the top down, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but um, what I thought was interesting about this is that, of course, this is going to fit nicely into the narratives about a huge crime wave. In order to make sure that we never ever defund the police in any respect whatsoever, of course. So this is certainly helpful in that effort and the fact that it is high profile wealthy and in of course in la it's happening a lot in hollywood um you know fame some you know potentially famous people uh people of celebrity who have connections that of course already have outsized influence on our you know political institutions uh, and so on that of course it's going to mean that uh, the rise of cases that are getting this kind of attention will drive the policy. And so a lot of activists, criminal justice activists in the city are very concerned that this is going to be used to undermine what few reforms have already managed to be passed over the last couple of decades and roll these back. Um, but it actually reminded me of a broader process that I've seen elsewhere. Um, in Egypt, for example. Um, in the 1990s or so, when I was studying Arabic and spending a lot of time in the region, I saw marked differences between a country like Syria um, and a country like Egypt, where there was incredible inequality in Egypt, in Cairo, just so many, you know, poor people 
Uh, whereas in a place like uh, Damascus, uh, people were working maybe a couple of jobs and hustling and so on, but you survived. You know, there weren't, of course, there were great disparities because there was a corrupt elite that was stealing a lot of the country's wealth, but there were minimal, you know, kind of social safety nets and um, price support and, you know, bread was subsidized. You know, that might be that I think that was the case in Egypt as well. But one thing that had started to happen over the course of the 80s, late 70s through the 80s and into the 90s, was the liberalizing of the economy and the use of uh, foreign debt to install a regime of austerity under the auspices of the IMF. Um, and what it led to was even greater social inequality. And so as you got rid of government industries and sold those off, government social supports and ended those, it seemed to me you were also witnessing a privatization happening on the streets. So if you were a wealthy person with a car, a fancy car, and you drove up to, you know, and wanted to park on the street, you had to pay somebody one of the many people who would be just sitting on the street because they had no job and no place to go to protect your car. So they were there and they offered their services to protect your car and you just had to pay that or have it defaced, possibly by the person who was asking you to pay them to protect your car and provide you this service because what they had done is they had started privatizing the streets and the parking spots. You know, so there was a way that you were going to have to pay a tax one way or the other. You either paid it to the government and had it redistributed, or people took things into their own hands to deal with a terrible, you know, unequal situation. And I would say, in some ways, that's what we're starting to see is this kind of uh, response to the inequality. It's terrible. It's criminal. It's dangerous. It can be violent. There's some cases where people have been beat, beaten up. You know, two people have been killed over the last year in these kinds of situations. People have been kidnapped and then released, you know, uh, you know, as they've been followed to their homes and so on. This is terrible. But the reason why I think the analysis, this article never talked about the problem of inequality. It's as if there's no context to how and why there's an upsurge of cases like this. And what we're seeing is it's people going after those with conspicuous consumption, who are wearing their wealth in a dramatic and overt way in the public space to show how incredibly wealthy they are. And so a couple of the cases, I met, one of the cases that was mentioned in this article were two UCLA students were, uh, had watches, uh, two watches stolen from one from each of them worth together $250,000. I mean, what in the world is going on? You know, I was worried about, you know, how am I going to, you know, I had to go and get ramen noodles, you know, and I had a part time job. That was my experience of being a student, not going around wearing a $125,000 watch. And you know that if you have a watch like that, you're obviously displaying it. So it's easy to see, you know, people are not being discreet. And so they, are, you know, people are parking themselves outside of clubs and bars and in these wealthy neighborhoods and looking for people who are in a, you know, uh, you know, uh, a really fancy sports car or wearing like, you know, these fifty, seventy thousand dollar watches, and and they're taking them from them, um, and it's interesting because they're apparently it's easy to fence this stuff, you know, they're able to kind of find buyers for it, and so the conclusion of this article was. You know, that a task force would continue investigating such crimes and he hopes that his work will encourage those engaged in such robberies to stop doing what they're doing. He also said, this is, uh, you know, uh, uh, police official Tippett. He also said that people who are buying the watches, handbags and other goods being stolen during such robberies should also stop what they're doing because the task force is coming after them as well as part of as well as part of multiple open investigations. They're participating in the crime too, Tippett said. When I first read that, I thought, oh my goodness, 
he is condemning people for this extravagance. And then I realized, oh no, he's just saying that when they're resold, um, you know, we'll, we're going to be cracking down on people. And I thought, what well, that's exactly what's missing in this article is why are these people, why are there so many people buying fancy watches, handbags, and goods that are, you know, worth hundreds of thousands of dollars? That's the problem that we're facing right now. But the article, the article let the cat out of the bag without actually recognizing that it let the cat out of the bag. So anyway, I was just interested in this situation. It's also good to find out that Officer Tippett is feeling better. <laughs> Remember? <laughs> I thought he had been heard from Officer Tippett in about 60 years. So I, I have a question for Adnan. Uh, Adnan, so... My watch is only worth twenty five thousand. You think it'll be all right? <laughs> Make sure you've got your cuff over it and you just use it occasionally to to see the time. That's that's my advice to you, John. And, uh, One hundred and twenty five thousand dollars. A UCLA student that could get you half a degree at UCLA. That's almost two years at UCLA. That how could you not know? that that's wrong how could the parents not know that that's wrong but I guess if you have hundred and twenty five thousand dollars to lavish upon your kids you have no sense of right and wrong that's how you make that kind of money there's no other explanation uh Professor Marianne what are your thoughts about the novels. Yeah. who's the guy that wrote um Oh, less than zero. He did American Psycho. He did. He he described that kind of see because he grew up in that scene where Red the parents. Was, was that his name? I or read Jay the book. McEnany. Either Jay McEnany or Brett Easton Ellis. Yeah, One Ellis. Of, yeah. I think the latter. <laughs> Jay McEnany. That'd be interesting. And the kids just grew up in this you know environment where they had cars and money and everything else but just no parents and you know really no guidance anywho um i wanted to just mention because we were on the subject of, of capital punishment about uh the action um that that was taken uh, against the state of, of arizona because they refurbished their recently refurbished like in 2020 their gas chamber and they want to execute that's a nightmare by the way that that yeah. caused my second divorce because it always goes in once you, you do the the gas chamber remodel you know what guys that's when you and then the and then the cyanide gas and then all the leaks and exactly what the state of illinois had a problem with but anyway um the, UC, the aclu has weighed in on this and they have uh had, had a lawsuit against arizona they said the gas known by the Nazis as Zyklon B, but I guess everything Nazi, not so bad these days, huh? Was the signature method by which the Nazis carried out their genocide against European Jews, the Roma, local populations at Auschwitz, Birkenau, Medenic, and so on, and other concentration camps. It's just like, I don't know. Are you using Zyklon B? Zyklon B. That Zyklon is the best. Because apparently they can't get the other gas that the other places had, had they used before. I thought it was all cyanide based, by the way, but I don't really know. That's not my specialty. Um, anyway, but yes, and this was uh, this was in the uh, ACLU case, and uh, it was kind of this was disclosed in an article by the Guardian last year, by the way. Uh, this uh, Martin Weiss, he responded at the time. Uh, the ambassador, the Austrian ambassador who was the Austrian ambassador to the United States who said the death penalty in and of itself is cruel and unusual punishment. I agree, it is barbarous. Getting to re ready to use Zyklon B for executions is just beyond the pale. The American Jewish community, one of the old, kind of country's oldest Jewish advocacy groups issued a statement after that, uh, the Guardian article, denouncing the action. Uh, the decision to employ Zyklon B gas as a means of execution defies belief. While there can be no doubt about its effectiveness, the Nazis used it to kill millions of people. It is, it's that very effectiveness as an instrument of genocide that makes it utterly inappropriate. Well, I agree, but you know, um, 
we've got a fetish about the the death penalty here. Hmm. I was anyway. I, I want to apologize. It's Zyklon B, not Zyklon. Well, my apologies to the manufacturer. I, no, I had <laughs> I had no idea how it was pronounced until you just. I no, I the chat room corrected my Zyklon. pronunciation. Oh, yeah. I haven't uh, looked at the last couple of minutes, but. Uh, what I wanted to talk about, and I think that um, our our colleagues, uh, Professor Kay and Alan Minsky, are going to be coming on like in minutes, right? Because uh, yes. we're wrapping up just about on time. Well, I would love to hear their their take on the fact that the Congressional Progressive Caucus decided to endorse Chantel Brown over Nina Turner in that race. What the F? I mean, really, guys? And I haven't heard anything from the members of the squad or the self-styled squad. I haven't heard anything from Rashida Tlaib or Ilan Omar or, or for that matter, Ro Khanna on how they're weighing in on this. I mean, what is going on here? I also, mean, what is the use of the... What is the whole point of the Congressional Progressive Caucus? It appears to be nothing more than a branding mechanism for, you know, people to use during campaign season and little else. And Nancy <laughs> Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi is endorsing Henry Cuellar over uh, Cisneros. Uh, yes, yeah, I Jessica Cisneros. Yeah, and they are in a runoff election. But that's not so uh, surprising. It is yeah. more concerning that Pramila Jayapal and the Progressive Caucus are not endorsing the progressive candidate. And, you know, um, what's her name again? Uh, um, Chantel. Chantel Brown. Chantel Brown. Um, he was a creation she of joined... the machine. That's right. And she joined the Progressive Caucus like just very recently in order to get their endorsement when um, it was clear that um, she was going to be facing, you know, facing a challenge. Um, so she just did this very recently for that purpose. And she's also part of whatever the new Democrats or whatever the conservative yeah, blue dog, you know, group is. So how can you be part of both of them when, you know, one How of them you stated two places at once. Yeah, because you ain't anywhere at all. Well, you're you're the physicist, so perhaps the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. You can explain how yeah, that could be possible. I don't know. Entanglement issue there. <laughs> but you know, I guess what this means is that um, you know we'll be seeing who the future number two or number three in the House Democratic Caucus will be. Um, you know, after Nancy Pelosi steps down, it'll be Pramila Jayapal, and uh, she will have endorsed uh, this uh, corporate Democrat, establishment corporate Democrat, given up on a chance to help support um, a wonderful progressive, um, all for the sake of being, you know, uh, in the hierarchy, <laughs> in the minority, because that's what's going to be happening. You know, uh, they're going to lose the next Congress, and so they're going to be in a minority. So she will have, you know, uh, sacrificed this for no real purpose and no real influence. The uh, so-called progressives excel at that. <laughs> I mean, they're they're terrible at leveraging any power whatsoever, and they think that you know by ingratiating ingratiating themselves with the leadership that, you know, that somehow power is something that the leadership awards to the good children, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy. And it's, it's, it's beyond that Brown is a corporatist Democrat. I mean, this woman is corrupt. On city council, there was a series of articles, I believe in, in the Cleveland paper, uh, I can't remember which one, that uh, documented she was voting for all kinds of city contracts that went to her boyfriend's family, like in the millions and millions of dollars, and did not disclose this. I mean, it's just obvious, but this is, this is the culture they're in. They're soaking in it. It's all about, so they don't even see it anymore that this is obviously corrupt. No, you help the people that have helped you, you know, and uh, it, 
oh, the, the, the voters, you know, your constituents. No, your constituents are the people who put you in power. That's your constituents. And uh, so this is a disappointment on so many levels. And, you know, um, I do fault, I, I do fault a little bit, Nina Turner. She was kind of trying to appease, appease the democratic leadership. And I mean, that was her strength. The strength is that she didn't, she didn't hesitate to say what she felt about the Democrats. And you know what? She should do it right now. I mean, the, the mask is off. If I'm, if I'm Nina Turner, the mask is off, even in the nominal progressive wing of the Democratic Party. I mean, you go to war with the Democratic Party. That was the whole point of Justice Democrats was that we will use, you know, we will use electoral process, we'll get into the party, and we'll take this ghost ship over. But um, I don't know, I, I'm, I kind of doubt that's going to happen. I would love to hear, hear Alan Minsky's thoughts on that when he comes on. Well, we have to wrap it up. Uh, I don't see Alan here yet. So let me ask you, there's no question that the Democrats are going to lose the house does anybody think for one second that joe biden will not be impeached do you is there any possibility that kevin mccarthy won't find reasons to put him on trial in the senate i mean I on one hand he'll be impeached on the other hand impeachment has become has come to mean less and less these days you know, it, it, impeachment is just, a, impeachment was always a political procedure, but, you know, people used to like hold back on, on doing, and we've never, we had Nixon resign because I think he knew that he, there was really the votes in the Senate to throw him out of office. So instead of going through a whole trial, he chose to resign. Right. But, you know, the Senate is, probably not going to throw him out. Um, I mean, the man is sunsetting to an alarming extent. There's all this, this issue about, uh, about Dianne Feinstein being senile and forgetting the names of people she just met, but she's only a senator, <laughs> God, uh, yeah. head of state who is- uh, But we're know, supposed to feel sorry for them. We're supposed to care about their feelings. Well, if they cared about us and the people they're supposed to be serving, I, I guess we would. Uh, but but I, I would just say, rather than, than fixate on whether or not there'll be an impeachment, you know, it'd be nice if Biden tried to do something to, to turn around his situation. Like, for example, descheduling marijuana at the federal level. Uh, like uh, getting rid of student debt. He could do that very easily and and not just ten thousand dollars but get rid of it all he could do that with a stroke of a pen yes yes why doesn't he do it why doesn't he do something to help himself it's insane right right joe and nora i'm sorry professor marianne oh alan is uh, alan minsky's just joined us we have a question for you alan before you start your segment Mm, go for it, Marianne. Yeah, I think you can guess what it is. Is it about can the- I have Pramila Jayapal on the next uh, PDA meeting? No, we won't. Um, and um, yeah, no, we're gonna, and we're, we're, we're pulling our Nina Turner endorsement. We're gonna go with Chantel Brown, so. Oh, good. <laughs> Solidarity. <laughs> Solidarity. There it is. We feel, we feel like, you know, why not, you know, a neoliberal hack who's just not gonna change anything for us. <laughs> For a city that's the poorest large city in the country and you know she um she uh came out uh, took a bold stand this week to oppose uh president barack obama's one of his signature foreign policy achievements the iran nuclear deal and chantel brown bravely took a stand against it no relationship there to the what was it about two million dollars of ie money that came into her district from democratic majority from israel yeah because you know she she's She's hell bent on supporting the Likud line, you know, on Iran. That's 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 what her political career has been about. So she's obviously a politician of great integrity, 
because she told her donors she would serve their interests and she is serving their interests. Now that's a politician of integrity. And I think it deserves the Progressive Caucus endorsement and anybody who feels differently. Um, you have integrity, what can I say? Wow. <laughs> no, it's harsh as hell, it's harsh as hell. I'm out in, I'm out in um, I was just came back from Oregon. Corvallis, Eugene. I mean, everything else being equal, we got to win our victories where we can win them. Presumably, the uh, congressional district in the country where Democratic voters rank the climate emergency higher as a top priority than any other district in the country. And Peter DeFazio, um, one of the founding members, I believe, of the Progressive Caucus, uh, obviously a, a great and heralded institution, um, uh, is stepping down after six gajillion years in office. And Look, there's a lot of stuff DeFazio does that we support. He's, uh, he's creative. It's one of the two people who introduced a windfall profit tax on oil companies. He championed high-speed rail and the Build Back Better process. He's the only person with a Robin Hood tax in Congress now. All things PDA endorses. Well, he's out the door. And this woman, Val Hoyle, is the, has been endorsed by him, Jeff Merkley, and uh, Ron Wyden. Merkley considered the like leading environmental, along with Bernie, senator in the whole U.S. Senate. They've endorsed somebody who supported the Jordan Cove oil pipeline that was defeated and that she now admits was a mistake to have endorsed it. And they're opposing uh, an environmental activist champion who fought and was one of the leading voices in defeating the Jordan Cove um, oil pipeline. So they are blocking the election of a true climate champion named Bill Canning and supporting, again, a neoliberal political hack. How much of a neoliberal political hack? Sorry, I shouldn't be so cruel. But she's endorsed by the New Democrats. They've only endorsed eight, eight full endorsements of non-incumbents. And this is who Merkley, supposedly the second or third most progressive member of the Senate, maybe fourth, um, Wyden, yeah, yeah, and the, the better side of the Senate caucus, DeFazio are endorsing so as to block an actual climate champion from having a shot at representing the district. And again, Val Hoyle, look it up, one of only eight uh, candidates endorsed by the New Democrats and went on health care, the usual mealy mouth, non-commitment, non, though nowhere is there a statement of commitment for Medicare for all, which means basically when you see that kind of language, it means I will take the insurance company money. That's enough for me today. As you can see, I'm probably not offering a counter argument in, in defense of the uh, progressive caucus at this hour. Um, but, um, yeah. I don't right. yeah. Well, before we, uh, turn to Alan and his guests, uh, we're glad to see them. Let's go to Norway where Joe has finished up his meal. I want to thank professor Marianne Cummings, professor Jonathan Bick, professor Ann Lee, read professor Ann Lee over at the daily Co's at Annie Lee. Professor Adnan Hussein hosts Guerrilla History and the Mudgeless podcast. And uh, thank you all for another wonderful, the professors and Mary Ann, another wonderful episode of the professors and Mary Ann. Joe in Norway, tell us yes, what you I, did. Yes, so the, the baklava is still baking in the oven. So that, that'll take another 20 minutes or so. But okay. while I'm waiting, I thought I'd, I'd just make a midnight snack of some cavatelli pasta with the uh, leftover cilantro pot pesto from last week before it goes off. And then I'll come back to you when I'm ready to pour the sugar. So you're gonna, are you going to boil the pasta? Yep. You're torturing me. Speaking of torture, let's go to Dave and PA. How is Chad tonight? And what are you going to be making for us tonight, Dave and PA? All right, we will come back to Dave in PA. Let's go back to Alan Minsky from the PDA, Progressive Democrats of America. Alan Minsky is executive director of the Progressive Democrats of America, and you're cheating. You put food in your mouth, and you have to you have to unmute yourself. Oh, I just unmuted you. Hang on. You have to unmute. I'm okay. Can you hear me? Now? I saw Ali Metters night and Melissa Figueroa. About how long ago was that? About nine hours ago. 
<laughs> maybe nine hours and 15 minutes to be precise. And I did not get in an airplane. I did not get in high speed rail coming through California to get down back to Los Angeles, whereas people are familiar with my home backdrop here. Um, that's because I was up in Chico in paradise and I took a road trip. Um, my offspring went on her final, actually their final camping trip um, at their junior high school. Uh, and during that time, I had took the opportunity to go do some political organizing. And also the first stop was up in Chico in paradise. That's my Georgia state coordinator. He'll have to wait here uh, for a second. Um, and um, and uh, I learned about what they do and because I'd heard about it, but I hadn't seen it firsthand. And um, it was uh, ever more impressive to witness firsthand than to have been impressed by the project from afar. It really was spectacular. And um, I'm, I'm really grateful actually, David, that you've invited Ali back along with Mel. And um, for, I, I got my volleys in on what's on my mind for my trip. I visited Doyle Canning up in Oregon's Fourth. Um, and um, I hope, uh, I do hope the listeners and viewers of the David Feldman Show will get active in supporting progressive candidates across the country, do research to find out who they are. Because look, there's a lot of discourse right now on the left. We don't have a Bernie Sanders campaign. We have frustration with the Progressive Caucus. We have frustration with the inability of the Democratic Party to move something. But we have to fight and fight hard to get into place in our political system, determining public policy, people of integrity who won't break rank and will support um, an honest, serious, left progressive, liberatory, um, anti-racist agenda. And they can't double back and, and not be people of their word once they're in office or so we'll just pull them out. But look into it. There are great candidates all across the country because the Sanders campaign sparked people jumping into the ring. Find out who those people are and support them. And lastly, before I go, I did meet with Chase Boudin in San Francisco on this trip. I went to Chico Paradise, then over to the Bay Area, then up to Oregon, and then back around and back up to Chico and Paradise and back down today. And I met personally with Chase. Look, again, if you're not involved in electoral politics, I'm sorry, actually, you don't have a lot of sympathy for me, even though it is, I'm going to swear, can I swear? It's a total. Sure, sure. It's a shit, it's a shit storm and a half. It's dominated by money. Well, Chase Boudin won. And they're now recalling him. He has become clickbait for the right wing in America, the DA in the city of San Francisco. And they're doing this to Chase Boudin because they're basically saying, yeah, you can go out in the streets, you can march around. But when you impact public policy, when you try to do something that sets out to dismantle our carceral state, the prison industrial complex, you know, the brutally racist justice system of the United States, the brutally classist justice system of the United States, you actually get someone into place who's going to do it. We're going to destroy him as fast as he got into office. We're going to pull him out of office before he can get anything done. And this is a person of real integrity and... Um, I hope people, uh, among other things, supporting progressive candidates across the primary season against neoliberal hack Democrats is super important. But one very important race is, is uh, now building up ahead of steam and not letting them, you know, basically just name call and taunt their way into removing Chase Bedeen, getting him blamed for things that were existing in San Francisco. I mean, and the, the, the petty crime rate, which is off the charts in San Francisco in some respects, was there absolutely before Chase got in. In fact, it's gone down since he's been there. So this is absolutely smoke and mirrors, complete bullshit, and people should uh, not sit on their hands and let the, the right wing win this one because they'll, they're will they sending a message to you know the Democratic Party and to activists. Yeah, there's, there's, no, there's nothing that's gonna change. Don't even try to change anything. And the way things do change is through public policy. So support Chase and Boudin. That's it for me. And support Ali Matters Knight and Melissa Figueroa and their project um, because they they also, while there's- Why don't you introduce them? Uh, great job. And why don't you introduce them? Let, let me introduce them. By the way, there's a continuity here. The, these two brilliant um, activists and advocates and organizers um, are pragmatic in relationship to public policy. They are looking at 
the actual framework of the institutional, legal, structural, contractual framework of society as it exists right now and figuring out how to make a breakthrough for the people and for the planet um, with uh, you know, indigenous people taking the lead um, in their particular project, um, aptly so. And uh, so I'm gonna introduce now, first, Ali Metters Knight, who I'm not gonna be able to give the proper introduction to. I do know that she is a certified uh, expert in um, indigenous uh, traditional ecological knowledge, often just called TEK or ITEK. And she's a member of the Machupta tribe. And, um, and then Melissa Figueroa, who's, uh, uh, I, I met when, what were you doing first? Board hopping at KPFK? No, I met you no, through you a brought, you brought me I met you through a meeting. Volunteer group. producer. Yeah, but I met you before that. I met you oh, before wait, no, that. No. I remember that you, we met in 2001. Right. Because it was your last day at Indie Media, your first day at KPFK, and it was my first day at Indie Media. So, ah, well, that would have been 2000, that would have been 2003, memory. not 2001. Oh, but 2003, yes. that's right. Yeah, yeah. and um, and Melissa is um, um, just a brilliant social organizer, activist. Uh, she was, should I say, no, yeah, I don't know what you want people to know about you. Jesus, you know, you've oh. done so many things. I've done things in my life. Yes. <laughs> and um, so Melissa Figueroa is uh, also a, a doctoral candidate in the geography department at the University of California, Berkeley. Take it away. So, um, well, I was on a, a couple of weeks ago, and so you've heard a lot from me. I'd like Allie to, you know, maybe introduce herself, say some things. And uh, we can start the conversation off. Yeah, my hey tunani. So yeah, I'm always uh, I'm sitting here in my uh, traditional territory, also known as occupied territory of unceded land of the Machupa Indian tribe. And so um, a lot of things that I like to uh, to you know, tell people is the background, how I got involved in and in basically being an activist, being involved in local politics. Um, and in how I positioned myself and why I've positioned myself. Um, I'm a single mother of five. I have a child who's disabled. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't, I live on the poor spectrum of things. But my lifetime of education and workforce has been mainly uh, in Northern California and some in Southern California, but working with uh, tribal administration uh, all the way from understanding uh, and writing procurement policies for uh, the, T the TANF program in Northern California and Lake County serving up to 32 counties. Um, I was able just to learn a lot about federal policy. And then I worked right. a lot I on- I should mention, just so we bring the audience up to speed, that you work to secure land management contracts for the indigenous tribes uh, from the federal, state, and local governments, and right, right. You're so, go so, and you're kind of restoring the land using indigenous tribes' teachings. Yeah, but it's also a political positioning. See, you know, say in all California, all your waterways are federally regulated. They're not run by the state. The state's told what to do by the feds in the most you know polite terms, but. Your, your, your local municipals, your towns, your cities, your counties, they don't run your, your creeks and your rivers. All your waterways are really federally regulated. And so that's all federal agencies, but federally recognized tribes have a trust relationship with Congress. And we are first in line, other than the state, to have a negotiating relationship on all federal lands within the state. And if you're talking about land management for federal forests, you have 33 million acres of federal forest in California. Or actually 19, 19 million, there's 33, 19, there's all, 33 million, there's 33 forests. million forest, million acres of forest altogether. 19 million of that 33 are just federal. As well as all. And uh, as so well as all your waterways. Way, so basically the our water problems, which are really privatization of water and that surging that's going on in the states, um, you know, is actually, you know, with if uh, they need to be talking to tribes because tribes are federal agencies. And, um, and the fact that they're, you know, in many, in many cases, they're circumventing that um, is, is a problem. And there's just a lack of workforce in the state of California that's really adequate. Um, it was an issue that I heard a lot in state meetings about workforce development. And what they were having a problem with is just like, 
you know, even with unions and people that are certified, by the time that people pay their permits and their fees to do a professional job, they're winding down on their per hour a job or they're jacking up the cost of a project beyond its really <laughs> that, you know, it's, it's become kind of blown out in, in, a, in, in, in a way. So be able to interject land management certification projects through federally recognized agency or tribe was able to inject a lot of, you know, workforce development with new certifications, with new job skills, which is kind of refreshing to each economy that stands within, you know, some disaster zone for, you know, wildfires. I see. And so, um, and so, yeah, like, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, we've been working on is, is, you know, especially this where, you know, there's not a lot of climate, you know, uh, I mean, we, we saw what happened in Build Back Better, all of the climate, uh, the proposed climate uh, uh, provisions in the Build Back Better bill just got whittled down and whittled down and whittled down and, or retooled to fit industry interests, right? The logging industry, the timber industry, the fossil fuel industries, and also the, I mean, and, and the energy companies in terms of like their carbon sequestration stuff. Well, um, and so that all has like its own kind of culture and structure within federal contracting. So this is all the stuff that goes on that nobody really thinks about. You know, you don't really think about who is touching federal land. Like who is touching the creek? You know, who actually gets to do that? Right? Mm -hmm. And who is I mean people assume that nobody is, but actually a lot of people are. They're just people who are they're just corporations, right? Giant corporations putting giant contracts, 2.6 billion in paradise alone. Really? Okay? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Um, to 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 remove trees, to do all this stuff, and like we, you know, Alan has seen him now himself. The results of that, a lot of that land is totally jacked up because these corporations came in from New Jersey, right? They captured all of this federal money to basically go in and mess up the landscape even worse than it was before the fire, and it was not in good condition before the fire, you know, and so. You know what this is sort of the game that we have to play to get hands on the ground to get boots on the ground to get people on the ground who know what they're doing to do what is needed and so this is sort of this this maze that we've had to like learn and push and you know break through um and you know um like by any means necessary literally is to break into this world of contracting and go no actually these contracts and these federal dollars you know for forest restoration are actually supposed to restore the forest and you need to actually give those jobs to people who know how to do that not just people who know how to you know drive a bulldozer which is what most people most of these corporations do if if you're an indigenous American, you vote in presidential elections, you vote for Congress, you vote for governor and senators. What is the political activism like? Are, are they appalled by what's going on on their land? I mean, our, yeah, so we, we're sovereign nations, so we're... <sighs> We were like independent countries within the domestic boundaries of the United States. So I have dual citizenship. I'm a citizen of the United States of America, and I'm also a citizen of my tribal nation. And we have elections and we vote in on our leadership. And then um, there's folks like me that are just appointed titles, you know, that, you know. Well, when you say like sovereign that. nation, the police, if you're running from the police and you come on your tribal land, the United States police, can they come on your, into I mean, your sovereignty? I'm in California, so there's a law called Public Law 280. And so a lot of states, um, when it's coming to criminal law, the state has the, has the authority to run you through court because we don't have a courthouse and a jail and a prison for somebody who doesn't right. use capital. So that, all that's under Public Law 280, that slides that over. But civil, no, and other things. So like, you can't build a Cobb home in Butte County, but as soon as you get on tribal trust land for Machupta, we can write a building code that says you can, and it can happen because it doesn't matter. But in fact, 
what most tried to do is we can build a casino because it's illegal in the state of California to do gambling. But on our federal land, you're in our country, you're in our little sovereign nation and it's federal law that applies, not that, and it's not criminal, it's civil. And so on that case, um, it's the civil stuff. And that, and that, and you're even talking land management. You're also talking, and but there's just bigger scopes of stuff. You know, uh, California is one of the last states to, you know, they kind of like voted themselves into the United States. You know how most states you have to have actually an election to like include them, but it looks like California found a bunch of gold and silver and they shipped it over to D.C. along with a bunch of people and said, announced, hey, we're part of the United States. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And uh, we have our own assembly. And, uh, you know, the first law that we're going to do is kill all the Indians and wipe them out of California. So you have your first genocide. You have all these laws and policies. And so you have unratified treaties. So California tribes are almost in their own different, you know, compartment in Indian country when it comes to federal Indian law. But, um, you know, it's uh, when it comes to being sovereign and being a sovereign nation. Um, that trust responsibility um, leads to a lot of laws that are that are almost unbreakable because they come straight from the trust relationship from Congress, and and sometimes that leverage has never been used in certain ways, but politically um, through the National Congress of American Indians, there was an example of the the 2018 Farm Bill. Now you want to talk about how that went? Yeah. So well for. First, the, I think a really important thing to understand about tribal sovereignty and this um, trust responsibility of the federal government to um, tribal nations is that actually it is uh, it, like if, if it, um, it is due to a tribal nation that the United States exists. So in 1778, um, because when the United when the Revolutionary War was fought, right, and they like signed all the things and whatever. Um, you know, the European nations did not recognize the United States as a country. They were like, you know, hell no, fuck you, I don't want a country, you know, like, whatever. And so, it, but the European nations recognized tribal nations as countries that were on that continent. And so it was in 1778, George Washington signs a treaty with the Lenape Nation of Delaware. And that is how the, the United States gains international recognition. So, so it is due to a, an act of a tribal nation that the United States actually exists. Wow. wow. And, this, and so the, the trust responsibility goes down to that very event that the United States recognizes that the tribal nations allowed the United States to exist. Probably not the best choice in, in retrospect. <laughs> but, um, but that because of that, the United States government has a duty to provide autonomy and provision of care for all 574 federally recognized uh, tribal nations. And so what this means is, and, and what people don't understand is that actually tribes are the landlord, not the tenants. So it's not that the, the United States government has to do these things because tribes are the landlord. And this is a thing that we have to remember. And so going back to this farm bill, right? Sovereignty, um, this great movie that Ali introduced me to called The Canary Effect. And when we talk about what the hell is sovereignty anyway, right? Like there's a formal definition, but there's also like, what does this actually mean in daily life, right? Like this is the questions that you were getting at. And in The Canary Effect, um, I, I can't remember, was it Ward Churchill or somebody said, sovereignty is the act thereof. You know, if you are sovereign, you act sovereign. So tribes are exercising their sovereignty to say, look, we're the landlord. This land is being mismanaged, right? And that tribes would like to be able to restore the land because they know what is best for the land. They've been here for thousands of years. I'm going to say 40,000 because that is where the scientific evidence is going. And that's what is known, you know, through stories and all of that. So, um, so this is, the, so the farm bill actually was great because they kind of snuck it in through, uh, you know, the Trump administration because Trump didn't read the thing. Nobody read the thing. They don't know what this means. Mm -hmm. right? People in Congress don't know what this means. Even yeah. though they're, 
supposed to enact it, right? It's a provision. Yeah. <laughs> so, and so these 63 provisions that was passed in the 2018 Farm Bill by the Native Farm Bill Coalition is basically a series of policy declarations made by these independent nations that you know assert the right to food security that ask things of the trust responsibility to the federal government you know a, you know funding and a lot of it is funding and a lot of it is rights is actually asserting the rights we're not trying to write new policies to like let tribes do things you know tribes are doing it because it is law but nobody's looked at the law, nobody honors the law, and nobody understands the law. And so that's why, you know, there's a lot of education that needs to be done, especially in non-native communities, that like, look, every, everywhere you are on this continent, there is a tribe that has jurisdiction legally over it, right? So this is Machupta territory, Allen is in Tongva territory, you know? Um, I'm not sure which part of well, uh, everywhere Southern you California are is in private but, territory. Yeah. So, but we'll get back to the provisions. Yeah. So when when the 2018 Farm Bill um, was approved, you know, when you have Trump, Donald Trump in office, and you know, not a lot of uh, political, not a lot of positive things were happening in Indian, in Indian country during Trump's term, and so. You know, I was eager to read anything that would be positive or positive, you know, looking, you know, anything that was good. And so I've been following through the National Congress of American Indians for about five to six years. I've been following this co this farm bill coalition, this tribal farm bill coalition that was going to be written into the farm bill at some point. And so I read them, you know, every one of them. And I was reading them. I was like, this one's good. This one's good. This has got juice. We can do this. This is this. You know, all these provisions look really great and wonderful, but they really don't do much unless there's some funding poured into them. So they, you know, they're just ideas, they're just theories, they're just possibilities. You know, these are just provisions, but the money can be put there now because it's written into the bill. And um, they all got approved. I only think they took three off. And I think there was three is just because they were redundant. Like, why are <laughs> this looks like this one? I was like, okay. Yeah. So there was like, pretty much almost all of them went, were approved. And so they're sitting there. So then I go back to the Farm Bill Coalition and now I'm watching like, what are you gonna do? And how are you gonna get the funding? And how is this gonna trickle down? Because the ultimate objective and payout on these Farm Bill you know, programs are these 20 year stewardship contracts, right? This is 20 years. You can, you got this group of acres of land, you got to write a 20 year plan. You're going to have, it's almost like a super fund, but with sugar on top with a cherry and a kiss, you know, right. these super funds are usually like EPAs, like, yeah. bleh, like yeah. vomit, you know what I mean? Crappy stuff that happens. You got to clean up mercury and toxic, blah, 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 forever and ever and ever. But these stewardship contracts are no, they're from the good witch. And so they're on the other side. So they're like, you get 20 years, you get funding to do this and scope. The only one thing is, is that you got to come up with a goods for service gig, like the timber industry does, right? Mm -hmm. So where are you going to get off the floor that's going to pay? Because you got to have some sustainability here. This can't be a 20 year, you know, basically super fund where yeah. at the end it's of it, there's, you're still, yeah. it's just a money pit. You're never going to get anything done. You have to stimulate done. the economy with. Yeah. So then I get really gets interesting is like, okay, so I watch what the Yurok's are doing. I'm watching what these tribes are doing. They're not just, you know, they're not just like, there's, you know, there's salmon industry, of course. And then there's, you know, right. um, and then there's this timber industry as well, but it's about replacing the ecosystem, like balancing the ecosystem where they're like, okay, these trees are not native. And so we're going to use the canopy of these for the next 15 years or 10 years to grow these oaks. And as soon as they get to this height for, or this area, we're going to knock these down in systematic ways and, you know, do it on a time measure. Cause you can't do that overnight. You can't yeah. fix an ecosystem and take right. years like that. It takes a hundred years to wreck an ecosystem. It takes a hundred years to put it back. So everywhere you are in the United States, you're in someone's tribal territory. There's not one inch, there's not one parking lot, there's not one piece of private property that obscures you from the fact you're in tribal territory. And in our case here in tribal California, we only make up less than 1% of the whole population. But if 
I'm looking just at my tribal territory alone, I'm looking at 100,000 acres of federal forest just in my territory. The, the whole complete burn scar of, of uh, most of what happened at, except for in downtown and here in Chico and down to the Sacramento River is in our Machuca tribal territory. So we have to hire a ton of non-natives. We just have to hire anybody in, that's willing to work. Right. And so when we start doing those numbers, we're talking about a game changer. Right. Green New Deal. We have to wrap it up. I hope you come back. This is fascinating. Melissa and Ali work together trying to secure land management contracts for indigenous tribes from the federal, state, and local governments. And to find out how you can help, go to techchico.org. That's T E K C H I C O.org. And uh, check out cooperativenewschool.com. I hope you come back. Thank you. Right, we'll thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And Alan Minsky is executive director of the Progressive Democrats of America. Thank you, Alan. I'll see you next week. And thank you for introducing us once again to Ali and Melissa. Thank you. Thank you, David. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Well, we're going to be talking to the president of the United States, former President Donald Trump, who worked with the great Gilbert Godfrey, I think it was season seven of The Apprentice. But first, let's go to Joe in Norway and tell us about the baklava that you have finished. Yeah, we have uh, walnut pistachio baklava with rose water syrup. Del delicious. All right, this is what we're going to do to our YouTube viewers, we're going to say good night. To our podcast listeners, we are going to continue in our tribute to Gilbert Gottfried by talking to the President of the United States, our favorite President of the United States, Donald Trump. Well, not my favorite, but his favorite, Donald Trump's favorite. So I want to thank all our YouTube listeners. When we come back, we will be talking about Gilbert Gottfried with former President of the United States, Donald J. Trump. We will be right back, but first some music from, where are we? Come on, for some. Falling <laughs> apart, David. Can you hear me, David? Yeah, yes, Mr. President, I am. I, I, wanna, I wanna sign off. Sign off you. before I say anything, David. It's a good idea. I understand, David. Go ahead. You're afraid. All right. Let me say good night. Uh, bye bye. Bye bye. All right. Uh, let me just say good night to the YouTube people. Thank you, uh, YouTube people. We will uh, see you next uh, next time.